The future of digital marketing seems to be bright and secure as the online world continues to evolve. Nearly 77% of global organizations have already used digital marketing, which is among the top 10 most in demand skills. More are expected to join the list in order to carve out a position in the digital world. Hello everyone and welcome to the session. You are currently watching an Edureka digital marketing full course video. By the end of this video, you will have a thorough understanding of digital marketing all the way from theory to practical applications. Now, if you love watching videos like these, then subscribe to Edureka's YouTube channel and click the bell button to never miss out any updates from us. Also, if you want to learn more about digital marketing after watching this session and wish to obtain Edureka's digital marketing certification course, then please see the link in the description below. Now, let's begin with our agenda where we'll have a brief overview of what we'll cover in this digital marketing full course video. We'll start by seeing what digital marketing is, what exactly it is used for, and why do we use digital marketing. So these are some of the concepts that will be covered over here. Next, we will see how to create a digital marketing plan, followed by different types of digital marketing. Now it's time to deep dive into the core concepts used in digital marketing. We'll start with search engine optimization. Here, we'll also cover off-page SEO and on-page SEO. And we will then compare off-page SEO to on-page SEO technique. After which, we will see Yoast SEO. Now, once this is done, we will then understand paid marketing with Google Ads tool, followed by content marketing and social media marketing. We can then see some more concepts in digital marketing like affiliate marketing, email marketing and integrated digital marketing campaign. Now, after all these, we will head over to data-driven marketing. We truly hope that this session assists you in getting jobs in the industry. In order to accomplish so, we will look at how a career in digital marketing works and how to become a digital marketer, followed by some essential digital marketing interview questions with answers. So stick till the end. Now let's get started with our first topic, that is what is digital marketing? In this world where we have more than 100 million people who use social media on a regular basis are expected to be at least familiar with the core topics of digital marketing. In simple terms, I would say digital marketing is the promoting of products over the internet or any form of electronic media. Now, people consume digital content on a daily basis. Now, like, for example, in the beginning, we would read all the news or the day to day news over the newspaper. But ever since we've got smartphones, we've got tablets, everything is bound to the online activity. So very soon, the traditional marketing platforms will disappear by replacing it with a digital market, which will completely take over the industry. There are so many advantages which you cannot even count, guys. Now, if you talk about the history or the evolution behind the growth of digital marketing, this was first used in the early 1970s, where a programmer called Ray Tomlinson sent the first email and through this, it was established that you can communicate using machines. But this was just the beginning. The lesser did they know that digital marketing would create a revolutionary in the field of marketing. As the number of users increased, the landscape evolved from email to search engines like Archie, Yahoo, Google, e-commerce sites like Amazon, eBay, and many more. And also the better starting point for the history of digital marketing was in the year 1990. This was when the term digital marketing was first used in the launch of Archie first search engine. Now, what is Archie? Archie is a tool for indexing FTP activities, allowing people to find specific files. Most of you might not know that Archie is a very first internet search engine. This is when the digital marketing term was first used. Then in the year 1993, the first clickable web advertisement banner was released. So this is also another added wing for digital marketing, followed by which in the year 1994, Yahoo was launched, which was the first e-commerce transaction over net market. And also in the year 1996, smaller search engines like Hotbot and Alexa were released. Next in the year 1998, Yahoo launches Yahoo Web Search. So in this case, digital marketing has already been grown to one extent 
and uh, this was also the birth of Google. Microsoft also launched MSN and also in the year 2001 the first mobile marketing campaign took place. Next in the year 2003 WordPress was released. I think most of you know how WordPress works. Any of the content creators would know how a WordPress is used. And also in the year 2004, Gmail, Facebook, and Google goes live. These are the milestones which digital marketing has achieved. 2005, you have YouTube being launched. And in the year 2006, Twitter was launched. And also in the year 2007, Tumblr. Spotify was launched in the year 2008. And Google launches its first real time search engine results in the year 2009. And WhatsApp was also launched in the year 2010, which I think this application is used by most of them. WhatsApp is also a platform for digital marketing. In the year 2011, Google Plus and Google Panda was launched. 2012, Knowledge Graph was launched by Google. And also in the year 2013, Facebook Messenger app was launched. And also, this is the year where Facebook took over WhatsApp also. In the year 2015, there was Snapchat. So this is exactly how digital marketing took the mainstream one by one. Year by year, you can see that they've come across so many challenges and they've discovered so many new things. The mass adoption of the internet into everyday life is the single biggest event that has affected marketing over the last few decades. Although early desktop publishing software in the first PCs caused search in print marketing in the year 1980s, the computers were a little more than glorified typewriter. And also in the coming few years, the number of people using the web soared from 16 to 70 million. So this is a very huge number. You can see that this is exactly how digital marketing was in the play ever since the beginning. Now let's move ahead and understand this concept in depth. So what according to you is digital marketing? So it is just a platform or it is just a medium through which you can get a lot of followers or you can promote your product, but that's not it. Digital marketing is one of those fancy new buzzwords that is used in the recent days. It encompasses all marketing efforts that promote your product or brand using electronic devices or the internet. It leverages online marketing tactics such as mainly search marketing, email marketing, social media marketing and mobile marketing in order to connect with the current and prospective customers. So if you go by the definition, digital marketing is basically internet marketing. It is also referred as advertising and delivering through digital channels. The channels can be social media platforms, mobile platforms, email or web applications, search engines and websites. To make it simple for you guys, digital marketing is any form of marketing product or services that involves electronic devices. So this is a major reason why it's been around for more than decades. Okay, so now that you've understood what is digital marketing, Let's move on and understand why exactly do you need to master digital marketing? What's the need? What is the necessity for you to learn digital marketing? The major reason would be marketing has a lot of options guys. It is always related to the strategies associated with it and also you can get creative and experiment with every little aspect of the marketing campaign. But when you compare this with the traditional way of marketing, this is impossible guys. The tasks that you can complete online cannot be done with the help of traditional marketing. So the traditional marketing forms would be printing ads, phone communication and also physical marketing. Now say if you want to start off your business and you want to promote them. You cannot go to everybody's house, knock on their doors and tell I'm going to start this project or I'm going to work on this. Would you please help me do it? No, nobody in the recent days do that. So. One platform where you can actually put across your views, put across your ideas about what you're going to be doing is digital marketing. So you can actually get a lot of support from the other people who are already working on it and also you can get a lot of guidance. So this is exactly why you need to master digital marketing. Now that you guys have understood why this is required, let's move ahead and take a look at the scope of digital marketing. Digital marketing has several smaller divisions that work in different directions 
yet contributing to the overall growth of the firm. Basically, digital marketing is considered as an umbrella term which is also known as data driven marketing and operates over the digital platform that is the internet for the introduction and promotion of various goods and services. The future of digital marketing is booming not just in one particular country but all parts of the world. In the year 2016, the industry was taken by surprise with over 1.5 lakh job opportunities in the digital marketing domain. Well, what followed this was an even bigger surprise when the only first quarter of 2017 marked close to 8 lakh job opportunities. The surveys were conducted by various forums which have predicted this number to grow with digitalization in the nation. Now, digital marketing industry is at its peak and the moment due to many reasons are these points. It is flexible. Since the entire work can be done on the internet, there is no restriction of a particular place. It doesn't matter if you are at office or you are at home, even if you are at your native or any place. All you need to do is have a device that is connected to the internet and then you're sorted. And it is very easy. Accessing the digital media is no rocket science, guys. It is just a piece of cake. The newest of all the users used to take a minimum of few days to learn how to operate the digital media. This is purely a user friendly medium. It also has high engagement ratio. This is also considered to be true because the traditional media are being completely overshadowed by the internet led digital marketing due to the high engagement factors. The brands and companies have begun to give extra emphasis to the ad campaigns run on the internet or over the television advertisements. And the next we have the job opportunities. Like I mentioned, uh, the number of job opportunities in the field of digital marketing is very massive. The more user engagement, the more job opportunities. The employment sector has seen a major share of jobs generated by the digital marketing domain. The career scope in digital marketing seems very attractive to masses and that is one of the major reasons why the professionals are learning this course to enter the industry. So you will for sure get a promising job if you take up digital marketing course from Edureka now. And also it helps in getting immediate results. An advertiser running a social media campaign can easily measure the performance of the campaign in real term without waiting for long intervals. You don't have to wait for any of the results that you're looking for. The result generation is very easy. So these are the major reasons or the scope where digital marketing is required. So as you can see in the television, a character is trying to distribute the pamphlets among the people, but they are simply ignoring it. This is how what used to happen during traditional marketing. We also know that time we had no digitalization, but now in this digital era, you can see that now you have so many platforms where you can just post or just advertise or brand with one click and you can get n number of responses. To know the communication, which increases the client happiness, also increases the engagement between the both ends. Next is investment returns. In traditional marketing, the returns on investments for traditional marketing is very challenging and it's quite difficult to measure. Whereas in the case of digital marketing, it is very straightforward to calculate. Using different analytical tools, it makes it more simple to measure the investment returns. Now, if we talk about the effectiveness, then in the traditional marketing is not as effective as digital marketing. Because in traditional marketing, you have a more expenditure, like you spend more money, like in TV advertisements, radio, banner ads, broadcasting, sponsorships, print ads, etc. So it obviously takes a lot of effort and wealth, but it ends up showing less effectiveness because it is only one way communication plus there is no strong engagement in traditional marketing. Whereas in digital marketing, the expense is very less because nowadays we have search engine optimization, pay as per click advertisements, web designs, content marketing, social media, email marketing 
and all these are like open source platforms where you can just easily like advertise your product brands anything and here you get a lot more effective results as you have good number of engagement and you get good responses from the customers or new clients if you talk about targets in traditional marketing there are standardized ways for targeting users that means that there are limited ways where you can target those many number of users you can't customize it or you can't go ahead the standardized limits whereas in digital marketing the targeting is totally customized and relies on the type of users so here based on the requirement by the user you can just customize your targets like you can either increase your targets or decrease your targets based on your requirements well talking about the reaches here in traditional marketing the reaches are local because as i said that you have a standardized limits and you are only bounded with limited uh, ways like for example tv advertisements pamphlets newspapers which are like only within the locals and you have no accuracy or you have no assurity that you will be getting the response at once so in digital marketing it is totally global here you don't have to roam around and look on to people you just have to sit and just advertise and people will come to you so these were some of the key differences which let you know that how digital marketing is more better than traditional marketing Now talking about the current digital marketing trends digital marketing is all set to increase to a total of 118 billion dollars statistics also indicate that the indian marketing traffic is expected to grow 291 times bigger than what it was in 2005 now talking about the digital marketing channels like seo content marketing email marketing and so on 22% of the entire world's population is on facebook and close to 50% of instagram users are on it every day now you can imagine the scale at which digital marketing is growing right now talking about the actual trends of digital marketing industry the first thing we have is the artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is considered as the biggest commercial opportunity for companies industries and countries and will increase the global gdp by up to 14% by 2030 this means that ai late comers will find serious competition within the next few years so start gearing up guys and have a look at how artificial intelligence works and how digital marketing plays a vital role in this now artificial intelligence is actually considered as a cutting edge technology and has numerous potential applications in marketing it is also deployed for content marketing advertising and customer service so this is also considered as one of the hottest job trend in the market right now and the next current trend for digital marketing is the chatbots chatbots will power up to 85% by 2020 this ai based technology uses instant messaging to chat in real time with your website visitors or customers i think most of you know how chatbots work So nowadays almost 30% of the tasks are fulfilled by the chatbots. Company use chatbots to provide services like customer support, generating information and many more. With examples like Siri, Alexa, it becomes clear how chatbot can make a difference in our lives every day. And also this chatbot is also known as a chatbot, bot, artificial agent and so on. And this is basically a software program driven by artificial intelligence. which serves the purpose of making a conversation with the user in the form of text or speech so many people across the globe prefer using chatbot as their responsive platform for 24/7 support like i mentioned it is mainly for building a conversation with the user and responding to their queries it mainly helps in answering and it also helps in very accurately recalling your entire buying history but most often These are used to answer simple questions or help a user accomplish a simple task. So this is also one of the latest trends in the market right now. Now talking about video marketing. Video marketing is one of the most famous and most important market trends today 
and is likely to continue for the next 5 to 10 years. I think most of the viewers out there know the value of a video. Also, a notable fact is that 70% of the consumers say that they have known a brand by watching their brand promotional video on different marketing channels. The marketing channels will definitely include social media marketing, which is a very wide platform. Also, in addition to this, 52% of consumers say that watching product videos make them more confident in online purchase decisions. So video plays an important role, guys. You know, you can read a lot about anything that is happening throughout the world, but watching a video is equivalent to reading 10 books. And also the fun fact is that by 2020, just the marketing videos will make up to more than 85% of all the consumers over the internet traffic in the US. It's most of them guys. Now, when I say in video marketing, YouTube is not the only way to achieve traffic. So when you're talking about video marketing in terms of digital marketing, YouTube is not the only way you can achieve traffic, right? There are plenty of ways to drive higher engagement ratio in terms of video marketing. As you have all the chances of making a small video post or start a live broadcast on either any social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or so on. So this is also one of the latest trends of digital marketing right now. And the next comes the biggest hit of the year. Augmented and virtual reality marketing. Augmented reality advertisements rank among the top applications used by the marketers throughout the globe. Using this, you can bring static or unreal environments, something that would integrate the offer with the reality of the buyer. Now, what do I mean by offer and the reality of the buyer? It means to say that you can experience a lot of things right in front of your eyes, but just that there's a little difference between what is being offered to you and the reality. Reality is going to be completely different with the offer. Now, this trend is one of the top highlights of the year 2019. And according to Statista, AR and VR worldwide market size is expected to reach around $209.2 billion in only five years. This is definitely a very huge amount, guys. So augmented and virtual reality is going to be the future of digital marketing. Now, the next one that I have on the list is voice search. I think most of you use smartphones and also everybody know what are voice assistants. And when I say voice search, voice search or Google voice search is a Google product that allows your user to use Google search by speaking on your smartphone or your computer. That is have the device search for data upon entering information on what to search into the device by speaking. So we have a lot of technologies intertwined for this. Also, there is something called as Alexa and Siri, right? These make our lives very easy. You can just find any of your restaurant or any of your queries, or any of your doubts regarding any of the topic. You can just say hello Google or OK Google and just say Alexa, find me a best restaurant or find me something to wear. Find me a place which is very cozy and all of these, right? So this is how easy our lives are right now. So talking about the stats of voice search in the field of digital marketing, 111.8 million people in the US are using voice assistant in a week. And also around 31% of smartphone users across the world will be using a voice activated search like Siri, Alexa and so on by the end of 2020. And as a matter of fact, by 2020, that is by the end of 2020, 50% of all the queries will be voice based. So you can see how drastically voice assistance or voice search is growing. Businesses must always focus on their marketing outreach efforts for using voice engine optimization. This helps in letting you know about your target audience who might use your keyword in their voice queries and so on. Also do focus on long tail keywords. This is because the searches are more likely to be more specific when it comes to asking a question. You can just ask what is digital marketing by just calling up Alexa. Just tell me what is digital marketing. It'll give you the top search engine results. So this is how easy it has become guys. And also you can make use of this to promote your product as well. Now talking about the importance of digital marketing. Why exactly do we need digital marketing? Why is it so important in our day to day life basis? 
technology well again continues to drive business in the 21st century and mastery of digital marketing techniques is a must known prerequisite. Well, I guess you guys are aware of the term digital marketing as a medium to promote your product and your business. That's absolutely right guys, but why do we need digital marketing? What's so important or why do you think you need digital marketing for your business strategy? And also how do you think digital marketing is important? So let me just put out a few pointers to you guys. These are the major reason why you should actually have digital marketing. So today's marketing strategy completely depends on digital marketing. So when you're strategizing your business needs, digital marketing plays an important role here. So how do you create a strategy in digital marketing? Each company has its specific set of goals, but the majority of them are only concentrating on driving sales to their organizations and finding new gateways to success. This is where the marketing strategy comes into the picture. To take your company's work more effective, you have to take advantage of all the most valuable marketing resources and technologies. When I say digital marketing strategy, it is basically a plan of action to achieve your marketing goals. The next important thing which will lead to great success of your organization would be the increased number of sales. So digital marketing helps in driving more sales to your organization, which in turn increases the revenue and also the pay scale. Now the next one is it helps you brand your company. Branding your company is a must guys. You should be very confident about what your company is dealing with and also you should know how to promote your product. Promoting your product and branding your product is a little different. So please note guys branding your product is making people know that your product is worth buying and also gaining the customer's trust. Now the next one is it is easy to get familiar with the marketing channels. So there are close to six to seven or seven to eight marketing channels available and getting along with these marketing channels is very easy. Well, you guys know about SEO. SEO is search engine optimization, which is basically used for blogs or articles that you write and email marketing is for prospective customers. Send out a professional email to them and get a proper response. Social media marketing mainly deals with promoting your product on the social media platform and so on. So getting along with these marketing channels is very easy. And also digital marketing helps build a better relationship with your customers or prospects. So this is actually why we take up digital marketing. Getting people's trust, building a good relationship with them eventually leads to the growth of your organization. Digital marketing is one such platform which helps you build a better relationship with your customers. Now the next one is better ROI. Return of investment is also an important factor that influences the profit of your company. So the amount which you invest in the marketing channel or marketing medium is going to be really very high. But by using digital marketing, you're going to be getting a lot back. The money which you're going to be investing on a digital campaign or a digital marketing campaign is definitely going to be coming back with better interest. And also digital marketing has a wider and dynamic career opportunities. You can be hired as a digital marketer as for the role of SEO manager, content manager, SEM specialist and so on. Okay, so these are the hottest job roles in the market right now guys. So grab the opportunity and seize the day. And also the important factor which influences your company's growth would be appearing on the search engine result pages that is on the front page of Google. So making a company appear on the search engine result pages is a tedious task in hand. But by using digital marketing and the techniques you'll be able to make this task easy. So these are some notable benefits or I would say importance of having a digital marketing team in your organization. So now that you've understood what are the latest trends in the market and also the importance of having a digital marketing team or importance of having a digital marketing campaign in your company. Now moving on to the next reason why you should actually learn digital marketing is it has a variety of career opportunities. Digital marketing gives you a huge scope and a multitude of job options right in front of you. A recent report also states that there are over 75,000 job listings 
on the very famous job portal that is indeed.com. Also do note guys this field is in high demand as many digital marketers start with a salary range of 45,000 US dollars. Unlike other fields, digital marketing has a lot of opportunities for freshers as well as experienced candidates. Not only in terms of jobs, but also you can earn as a freelance or digital marketer and make some awesome amount out of it. This field is actually evolving and hence it creates a lot of opportunities for freshers and experienced professionals. If you're out there looking for a job in the field of digital marketing, now is the right time to start preparing yourself. And also the most important part is it is easy to start a new creative business project. You can easily create your own project by making use of very commonly used platforms such as YouTube, blog creation and affiliate marketing. These are actually a part of digital marketing guys. So once you understand how this works, you know where to put in more effort, which marketing channel you should prefer to reach your target audience and so on. And also in addition to this, you'll also have enough knowledge about optimizing your blog and the marketing channel of your choice so your audience can find you. So this is like you do something for recognition, but in return you get a lot of trust. So this is like a chain reaction. Now once people know about your project and also have a variety of career opportunities, it is easy to generate results and the digital sales funnel. Social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and many more are responsible for driving good traffic onto your website. These applications even involve advertising your product. When a user lands onto your website, many tend to browse more than just the web page that you land them on. Once they click out the web page that you land them on, you probably lost the potential customer lead that you could have to follow up on. Generating leads from the sales funnel is actually a very difficult task. Keep a hold of how your customer is going through your videos or blogs or your content that you create and also do answer all the queries that they have about any of the problem that they're facing. It is easy to drive traffic to your website from digital markets. Once you shift your focus to digital marketing, there's no turning back guys. The reason behind this is having a website and letting the audience know about your product or service is a very difficult task and with digital marketing, this is definitely made easy. As this plays a major role in generating good traffic to your website, you'll have all the opportunities to convert them into sales. Now the next is digital skills gap. There's an enormous demand for people with digital skills, especially the soft skills for those under the income bracket. So sticking with ongoing scope in this area, even if you're not a complete techie, you'll have to look at the foreseeable future of digital marketing. The skills gap actually refers to the difference between the skills required for a particular job and the skills the person actually possess. The skill gap is responsible for not being able to perform a complete job. So using digital marketing, you can upskill your learning or knowledge about the trending technology. Now the next major reason is the versatility. Once you master the top skills for the role of a digital marketer, you'll have a lot of exposure to the broad set of skills. This makes it easy to change your focus later if you decide to switch to a different specialization. The actual fact is if you choose a career path or specialization in the field of digital marketing and then decide to pivot later, you're likely to need a little training in order to make the switch. Also, you could work under any specific domain of digital marketing. This can keep your skills sharp and your work very interesting. In this sense, you can upgrade existing skills while still learning new ones, but also stay in the same field. In digital marketing, there are plenty of choices and ongoing learning opportunities where different skills fit together in different ways. And the next factor which influences the need for digital marketing is this field is evolving. This is an evergreen field which is always evolving. Digital marketing is one such field where you'll find something new to learn and follow. You'll find it interesting and gives you freedom to be more creative in terms of creating a master plan that is a master digital marketing plan. It is going to help whether you're taking the lead on the initiatives or not. Since there are a variety of specialists working on a given agency, 
You'll also be working alongside professionals with a variety of backgrounds and new strategies. So get your hands dirty with this amazing digital marketing field right now. One major factor which always people look for is how to stay updated with the current trends and how to stay ahead of our competitors. Adapting digital marketing to your organization is a must guys by doing this. It lets you know your own company and also your prospects interest. Even though you make good content and beautifully design your website, you might still end up not getting enough leads. This is possible. This is like the reality, right? This might also be because you don't know about the current market trends. So unless you're up to date with the current market trends and also try to adapt them in your company, you'll have a rough time planning your strategy. So digital marketing is one such way through which you can always be one step ahead of your competitors. Now the next major factor which eventually increases the growth rate and also the job opportunity would be having a good certification course. Having a digital marketing certificate is definitely going to help you get better job opportunities in this domain. Also 60% of the professionals feel that online certifications have helped them a lot in mastering this amazing technology. You need to know how to learn digital marketing. Jane was aspiring to learn digital marketing. She's enthusiastic about web development, so she thought of starting off by making a website. Once it was ready, she realized that it didn't look appealing. So then she started learning design. But even after making her website very appealing, she was not able to reach a large audience. So then she started learning about SEO. Now getting a hand in digital marketing, she wanted to promote her content further. Hence, she started learning about social media marketing. She then found out about the various algorithms used in social media platform for targeting audience. To overcome the algorithms, she then discovered and started learning about email marketing. So you see, Jane learned as she practiced and is now a successful digital marketer. Now, with Jane's success story, let's have a look at the steps to take in learning digital marketing to build your success story. Digital marketing is very wide. Once one starts, they might get lost in the wide pool of options. But trying to learn everything at once is a wrong approach. Take into account all the branches and consider your interests. For beginners, I suggest you start with SEO. Now that you know that you are supposed to start with one particular branch, next you need to decide on the strategy and tactics you are going to implement. At first, you need to pick your strategy. Now that you know that you are supposed to start with one particular branch, Next, you need to decide on the strategy and tactics you are going to implement. At first, you need to pick your strategy. These are the big picture stuff where you want to focus your efforts first because this is the foundation where all your future marketing tools and softwares are going to be built on. If you get this wrong, nothing else will work. There are many different strategies and methods to digital marketing, but I suggest you take into account the core four to determine your strategy. First, you need to pick your model. This is about what business you are promoting or what service is available. With that, also determine what package or price to set based on what's profitable and in demand. Next, know your market, that is the people you are going to serve. Focus on the ideal customer base, taking into account their demographic, geographic, and psychographic details. Next is the message. When marketing, you need to connect with customer and their problems and deliver how your model helps solve their issue. For this, you need to understand the market. Chat with customers to figure out your message. And finally, the media. This is the center of digital marketing. This is where you are going to do your marketing, such as to Facebook ads, Google ads, or anything else. A lot of people make the mistake of starting with the media, like when they hear about, let's say, Instagram ads or so. But without figuring out your model or knowing your market, don't start with this. Go in the right order and pick your media based on your ideal target market. So once you have figured all the major stuff, move to the tactics. Tactics define how you are going to execute the strategy. These are the actionable steps to take, such as what frequency to post in, 
or what kind of content to post or the level of consistency that you are going to maintain a tactical question would be what's the best time to post on social media whereas a strategic question would be which social media platform should we post on you now know about the strategy and tactics if you are new to digital marketing seo is a good way to start off with seo stands for search engine optimization it is the process of improving the quality and quantity of traffic to a website or a web page from search engines it can be broadly classified in three categories technical seo comprises of anything technical undertaken to improve search rankings on page seo can be anything on your web pages such as blogs product copy web copy etc and off page seo is anything which happens away from your website that helps with your seo strategy such as backlinks next have an understanding of organic and paid content organic content is what you create for free such as an instagram ad or facebook ad or youtube video i wouldn't call it free content because you put effort or maybe money to put it forward it is simply organic because you are not paying to promote it paid marketing is to distribute through media by paying them facebook ads instagram ads or youtube ads are examples organic content shows up in the news feeds of the people who are following you organic is free to promote but limited in reach and paid content costs money of course but reaches a lot of people and also ideal people quickly hence select your content based on your resources once you have your content get acquainted to free tools you do not want to start with digital marketing and go in debt already hence familiarity with tools such as google analytics google search console canva or semrush among others comes handy as you go on eventually you can learn about the paid tools too next let's have an understanding of direct response and brand awareness direct response marketing is direct in its goal to get response you can create a piece of content and you're focused on getting an immediate and tangible return like a sale a phone call or subscription for example run a google ad and expect to generate a lead this is easy to track and measure whereas brand awareness is long term it's about building trust and authority and brand name in the market it's harder to quantify branding is useful to build sustainable business for your business you can use a mix of both but be careful don't conduct brand awareness marketing and expect direct response have a good understanding of each once you have learned enough about a certain branch it's time to start executing theoretical learning is not an ideal approach to digital marketing you need to execute it on action for instance you may help out your friend with an existing business or apply for an internship freelancing as digital marketer is also a good option once you are well versed and experienced in a particular branch it's time for you to move to other branches such as video marketing website optimization social media or email marketing there is no set order for the branches it's all up to your own interest still confused if you should learn digital marketing Let's see why it's better than traditional marketing. First of all, digital marketing helps you reach a much larger audience. Not only is your audience larger, but also more targeted and ideal. It's cost-effective compared to, let's say, putting up an ad on the TV, and you receive immediate feedback for your work, which makes it easier to track the result. So the first topic is why digital marketing plan is necessary. A digital marketing plan is a document that mainly includes the details of your marketing campaigns, short and long term business goals and so on. It is also sometimes called a digital marketing strategy. Now when I say digital marketing strategy, what do I refer to or what do I mean? A digital marketing strategy is a plan of action to achieve your marketing goals. So when I say strategy I think most of you know that strategy means planning in advance right so it is a plan of action which is achieved by a particular goal and you can achieve this by using channels like paid 
earned social media and all of it which come under the strategy and also depending on your job scale the strategy might involve planning each with a different agenda and the end result so in this session we are going to be focusing on the planning aspect and strategy mainly involves more creative thinking and also it is difficult to create one so let's see how to get started with prioritizing your strategy or your planning for your business operation and also planning is basically for maximizing your business benefits and the goals associated with it so why do you think planning is required what does the main agenda or the main goal of having a plan undoubtedly digital marketing is becoming an integral part of our lives and also our business as well so without this added to your plan structure you are missing out on a lot of opportunities to connect with your customer base so the main goal is to connect your customers and then move forward to how you can improvise yourself or improvise your method of dealing with your customers however you can actually make your strategy work but you should have some clarity in it this clarity can be got by proper planning so some major reasons that you should consider having a perfect digital marketing plan will be you'll be easily able to attract viewers to your website and also you'll be converting so if you get viewers on your website who are actually looking out for something which they need and you're giving out something which they want so it is going to be becoming a proper conversion rate there you can actually get a sale out of it and also they will become your loyal customers and create a marketing strategy that helps in planning all the actions on how to reach your target customer target customer is something which you should analyze or research about guys target customers are those who actually want something from you and you're giving something to them and they might have some issues or they might have some queries related to what they're going to be paying for so this is how you should make your strategy to reach them in a way that they will find it easier to interact with you and also have trust in you you'll also gain a lot of in-depth knowledge of the market and your target audience so when you do a proper research proper homework on how you can analyze your viewers how you can work your way around the target audience you're good to go guys and this lets you use all the resources that are available in an effective and an organized way so when i say planning it is pretty sure or pretty obvious that it should be an effective plan where you can utilize all your resources and also you should do it in a perfect way so these are some major reasons why you should take up digital marketing planning and also if you talk about the scale in which marketing or digital marketing is growing you should start planning your business strategy in a way that you shouldn't try to copy other business strategies and try to implement your business plans accordingly so you should be unique in that way okay now moving on to the next topic so what is the structure of a good marketing plan have you guys ever wondered is there can be a structure to a marketing plan well there is a good marketing plan or a good digital marketing plan is a key to all your strategies that will give you a foundation for all key online marketing activities so we have praise to the rescue what is a praise what am i talking about when i say praise praise is nothing but plan reach act conversion engagement so these five put together will make your good digital marketing plan now planning consider using the data driven approach to review your current digital marketing effectiveness customer analysis kpi that is key performance indicator dashboards smart objectives and helps you create a strategy of prioritized improvements on how you can deploy your digital marketing media technology and everything all these come under the plan part of digital marketing planning so planning is very important it will eventually help you guys in conversion also and talking about reach you should be able to build awareness using online marketing channels or mediums like social media marketing seo that is search engine optimization content marketing and so on and this will drive more visits to your website and talking about act the next following step would be act you should know how to act when you get a lead or when you get a feedback regarding whatever you've done or whatever plan that you've been taking part in always encourage interactions on your website or sometimes social media which will help you generate more leads you should actually involve in more and more interactions with your customers and talking about conversion the superlative goal is to generate revenue by retargeting nurturing and conversion rate optimization or cro 
this is used in order to remind and persuade your audience or customers to buy any of your product via one of the marketing channels. So this is how the conversion takes place guys. You have a viewer on your website. He tries to reach you. He tries to go through the website what you provide what services you provide what your products are up to and so on. So this involves planning here. You should know how to target your customers. You should know how exactly they'll stay if you're going to be giving them discounts on any of the course or any of the product that you're going to be interested in. And the next one is engagement. Increase the number of sales from existing customers by improvising personalized communication using web, email, and social media marketing. I think most of you get emails regarding any of the new product launch on Amazon or Flipkart, right? This is how you build customer engagement. So this is how you have praise to the rescue and once you know your way around this let's give you a breakdown of a step by step structure of a digital marketing plan. First thing you should know is list your business goals. You should know what your business goals are. You should know how to define your business goals. So the very first thing to do when you're developing your digital marketing plan is to carry out an internal and external analysis of your firm. They need to be so important to brand your business but it will definitely help on your final marketing plan document that sets the stage for everything to come. Also to do this we have some useful framework called SWOT analysis. So this is going to be helping you in looking into matters like strengths weakness opportunities and the market. So what is a SWOT analysis something familiar something new. All right. So let me just not beat around the bush and let me give you a proper definition to what a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is a strategic planning technique used to help an organization identify its strength weakness and opportunities threat and everything related to business competition or project planning. Once you have everything in place strive hard to put up some goals related to your domain. Also the wonderful part is you can work on developing your digital marketing plan with smart goals. Now the question is what does smart stand for. Is it a full form? Is it an abbreviation? Is it just saying smart goals in general? Let me help you guys. Smart goals are nothing but the abbreviation for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Smart goals helps in analyzing your business venture. Now, when I say specific, it deals with leads, the number of visits that you get onto your website, and so on. Measurable helps in providing a specific number of those leads and visits. Attainable deals with analyzing the benchmarks that you've set and relevant helps in relating back to the overall end goal and last but not the least timely. So you should know how to finish everything within the time frame. So this is how smart comes into picture and smart goals are very essential if you're going to be starting a business venture of your own. Now the next is research your target audience. This is important for focusing on trying to get the traffic and reaching the right audience. If you don't research your audience before creating your content, you might end up creating something really useless. So which is definitely not recommended or which is not appreciated. So you shouldn't actually do it. You need to first analyze their interests and plan accordingly. There are so many ways where you can collect prospects information to create a good persona such as we have we have web analytics data web based surveys focused groups and blog post comments. So these are some mediums through which you can get some information regarding your prospects and also their interests. The next on the list is the design persona. You should design your persona in such a way that people cannot find a single fault in your product. If you have the required customer data in hand you're good to create a good bio persona guys. You can't create an effective digital marketing plan without knowing who you want to reach. A buyer persona is important in this case. Generally, a buyer persona is a fictional thing, guys. It is people that represent the traits of people you're trying to target to buy your products or services. So it's like a robot in between you and the customer. So, how does this buyer persona help in digital marketing? What does it have to do with anything that is related to marketing field? So bio personas help you know who to target when you're running your campaign. In many cases there might be a chance that you might have more than one bio persona whom you'd be targeting. So creating these personas help you market to different types of buyers based on their interests and needs. So bio persona is important in digital marketing planning. 
Now the next is define your marketing strategy. Once you're done with defining your business goals, personalizing your strategy and help in planning, the major things that affect these would be the strategy. The entire strategy on how you're going to be building up your plan. So the first thing would be the audience. You should know what to focus on, whom to focus on and how to focus on. So what gives you the answer to what kind of content you should create? Whom gives you the answer to who to target? That is the prospects that you should consider focusing on and how to target are the mediums, the channels or the marketing channels which you can go for to reach the audience. Ranking this plays a major role guys. You need to know how you're going to be communicating with a unique value proposition and how to do so appropriately in terms of channels. So ranking plays a vital role because you'll be having your page or your website rank on Google and which will eventually drive more traffic to your website. And the next is a content strategy. Know how to create informative content, keyword research, social posting and so on. So now that you know how to define your goals, how to create your strategy, how to create a buyer persona. Let's take a look at the last thing that you should do after creating an effective strategy that is choose the right marketing platform. It doesn't matter if you're new to digital marketing or have enough experience in this field. But what matters is your idea about marketing it via the right channels. There are a few marketing channels or mediums through which you can let people know about your product. So utilize this knowledge and market it in the right way. So the first thing is you cannot stick to one digital marketing channel. You need to be well versed in all channels starting from SEO with over 2.7 million blog posts getting published every other day and more than 500 million tweets per day. You have no choice but to enhance your knowledge in a particular marketing channel. So choose the right marketing platform for your business and your planning is done right and it will eventually lead to more revenue generation as well. Now moving on to the next topic we have how to make an effective digital marketing plan. So follow these instructions to have an effective digital marketing plan. So the first thing you should do is brand yourself. The very first thing leading to success of your digital marketing plan is defining your brand. It is important to analyze your company's growth your ins and outs of your brand so that you can easily sell your product. In addition to this create unique selling points or USPs in general to give proper insights about your brand to the audience. Also even here focus on the smart goals which is namely specific measurable achievable realistic and timely. So focus on these goals you will be branding yourself as a trustworthy company. So in order to try to increase your audience base follow these instructions. So first thing is launch your product. So this is more important guys launching your product which is error free bug free and so on. So you should focus on creating your product first and reach out to new markets. If you're very confident about your product just reach out to new markets and it can vary depending on your location or the type of audience and also try to promote your product. Promotion is a must even if it's a very minute thing that you've done you've achieved something you've created something on your own try to promote it. And also you can improve your ROI that is return on investments. Usually when I say marketing it costs you a lot of money guys. But using a digital marketing the cost that you're going to be spending on marketing campaigns or so on will be less. Even if it's more you're going to be getting more back in return. That is the improvement in the ROI. And next analyze the market growth and expand your market share with respect to the competition. Try to optimize your conversion funnel. So when I say conversion funnel conversion funnel is something where you will know the exact ratio of how many people are landing onto your website and how many people are actually buying your product. So the number of people landing on your page and the number of people who are actually going to be buying your product is very less because the number of viewers will be very more. They'll be interested to see how your product will work what you guys are into and so on. But eventually when the process takes place they will not be much interested in your product. They'll try to say that I found another one which is more interesting which is more nice or very better compared to whatever you're selling. So I'm going to be going to that and now I don't want this. So these are a few ways where you can try to optimize your marketing funnel and try to attract new customers and increase the number of sales. So attracting new customers wouldn't be easy if your product is performing well. So make sure that your product is right. 
So these are a few important points you should note for having a perfect digital marketing plan. Now moving on to creating an effective marketing plan. We have choose the right marketing platform. If you're creating an effective digital marketing plan, you need to choose the right marketing platform. There are several marketing channels through which you can easily promote your content and get good leads from it. Some major channels include search engine optimization, content marketing, social media marketing, pay per click, email marketing and so on. So choose the right one for your business. Now measure the business. Once everything is in place, you need to know how to measure goals. Not just create a plan in such a way that it will help users. It will help you gain more profit. It is not like that. You should know how to measure your goals. You should know how to analyze where you're losing traffic or where you're gaining interest of people. So a strategy or a plan will always yield results and you should always have a strategy to measure the results. So this is a crucial phase of digital marketing guys. It determines whether your business was successful with the efforts that you put in or not. You will be done with your marketing plan only if you will be able to analyze and measure the corresponding results. And you can measure your marketing strategy results using KPIs. Like I mentioned, they are key performance indicators. These help in determining your campaign success and also it helps in showing you if you've got an expected ROI or not. Also, in addition to this, you should have a real time data visualization system. Why do you need a data visualized system? This is because the world is evolving towards digitalization and there is much more to explore in this field. So be up to date with the current market trends, identify opportunities and room for improvement in an instant. So these are the ways you can actually improve your marketing campaign or these are the effective ways which you can design your marketing plan. Now moving on to the next topic. We have the best practices for a better digital marketing plan. So in order to increase or improve your digital marketing plan, you should follow some guidelines or some practices, right? So the first one would be prioritize your customers need and plan accordingly. So when you are into marketing, you should always prioritize your customers needs first. This is because you'll be giving more and more time to your customers. You should know what their thought process about your product is. You should know how to analyze the situation, give them proper guidelines, provide help when they need it and so on. And also audit your SEO on a regular basis. SEO is mainly into blogs and articles like I mentioned. So audit your SEO in such a way that it will help your website rank first on the search engine result pages. Conduct webinars and live events. Webinars actually help in improving your knowledge about the subject and also this will eventually help the customers who are looking for an answer. So conduct webinars and live events. Live events basically deals with you being there in person and explaining about the product. Now next is prioritize blog as your primary lead generation medium. This is because organic traffic drives more traffic to your website guys. So focus on creating more blogs or more videos regarding any of your product generation. Any of your marketing plan. Make organic traffic your priority. Like I mentioned blogging video making all of it come under organic traffic generation. So give more importance to organic traffic. Distribute your content on the marketing channels. We have so many social media marketing mediums or marketing channels through which you can promote your product. We have social media which is like a boon to us and which is helping us in all ways that we need. So these are some best practices that you should consider while taking up or while creating a proper digital marketing plan. Let's take a look at the components or sometimes which is referred to as the channels or types of digital marketing. But before you can actually start your selection process to identify the best digital marketing tools, you must always be familiar with the various channels that are available. So like I mentioned, there are mainly five to six channels of digital marketing. So the first one on the list that we are going to be discussing would be search engine optimization or say SEO. So almost all people using the internet are familiar and are making use of search engines to look for anything that is promising and worth searching for. In fact, up to 93% of online experiences happening to people usually begin by using a simple search engine. 
people use search engines to look for information regarding a product a brand or service it is also stated that 60% of search engine users find a local business to satisfy the particular need so seo is basically the process of optimizing content technical setup and the reach of your website so that your pages appear on the top of the search engine result pages for any specific keyword the major goal is to attract visitors to your website when they search for products or services related to your business this is going to profit the visitor as well as the business because the number of views that you get is directly proportional to the number of revenue or the number of sales that your company deals with also a fun fact to note here is wordpress users alone publish over 2 million posts every day this comes out to approximately 32 blogs every second so this means that the users are publishing over 216 blog posts while you're still watching this video also even in this blog creation sector i would say we spend around 2 to 3 hours and also it might go up to maximum 5 hours when you're writing a blog this is because we are well aware of the fact that i should make a content appropriate and very appealing it takes time to make it good make it promising and also give a sales pitch so now that you've understood what exactly is search engine optimization let's take a look at a few key points to note while you're optimizing your content So firstly that I have on the list is optimizing your content. So try to target business analysis. Here you need to be sure about whom to target and how to target. You might find people with relevant taste and thirst but they wouldn't be convinced with the type of content you create. So try to target the right audience. The keyword also plays a major role in better content creation guys. This is basically the development of a prioritized list of target search items. that is related to your customer base and market segment so do note that guys keyword also is important for search engine optimization now the next thing is web analysis web analysis helps in analyzing visible text and code to determine how well you're positioned for a search engine all right now the next way to optimize your content is keyword research as i mentioned keywords play a major role in better content creations Keywords are the targeted list of topics that are related to your customer base. Do review competitive lists and other pertinent industry sources to get a hold of what are the keywords which are ranking. Also check for how many websites are competing for each keyword. Prioritize keywords and phrases, plurals, singulars and misspellings, okay? So keep a note of these guys and also long keywords will help you rank more. and do check for search volume guys this helps if you want to know how many people are looking for the content based on your business now once you know this you should know how to rank your keyword so google ranking plays a major role in creating traffic and generating possible leads so check for your content every month to see where exactly it is positioned so this was about keyword research Now the next way to optimize your SEO is by optimizing your content. Create a proper length title. Also it should be keyword based as these establish page theme and direction for your keywords. Use meta descriptions or meta tags that help in providing the user a gist of what is the article about. So these are the ways you can optimize your content using SEO. So now that you've understood the different ways to increase traffic pay per click which is also called PPC for short refers to the sponsored results on the search engine result pages or SERP PPC ads are visible flexible and effective for many different types of organizations with paid search you only pay when your ad is clicked so these are basically the ads that are present on top whenever you search for a particular keyword So essentially this is the way of buying visits to your website rather than attempting to earn those visits organically. SEO is organic marketing and pay per click is your spending money on that ad to get a click or to get people buy your product. Search engine advertising is one of the most popular forms of PPC. Now you must have had this thought when I say ads what kind of ads am I going to be seeing? These are nothing but Google Ads or formally called as Google AdWords. 
PPC is commonly associated with the first tire search engines like Google AdWords. So let me show you guys how exactly this ads look like. So if I search edureka over here, you can see I'm getting an ad over here. It says ad edureka.co edureka course. So this is a paid ad or PPC. So this is exactly how Google ads look like it is going to be on the top rank when you search for a particular keyword. So the keyword here is edureka. If I'm going to be searching for edureka, this thing pops up, which is PPC. You'll normally find shopping ads and text ads. Now, why do you need PPC? How does it help your business? It's just spending so much money on something people would not prefer investing on. So firstly, you need PPC to generate more traffic to your website. And as the link stands on the first position, the possibility of people landing on your website actually increases. And another major reason why you should opt for a PPC in your business is the speed, precision and the agility. Speed as in the advertisers can quickly drive a significant amount of traffic to their website. Precision is for creating a highly targeted audience to show your ads and it is straightforward. Agility refers to the performance measurement data which is available pretty quickly. So for all these reasons, you should go for PPC for your business. Now there must be some downfall if there are so many noted advantage for a business strategy, right? So what are the drawbacks of using PPC and how you should be aware of the malfunction? So the major drawbacks of PPC would be the cost and the volume. Cost is one major pitfall of using PPC marketing because the amount of money you spend on each ad is very high. So depending on your competition and the business requirement, PPC will benefit your organization, but you'll have to spend more on it. And the volume. If the users aren't searching for product or services that you offer, search and shopping ads won't generate much traffic, thus leading to the downfall of your business. Okay, so what sort of PPC ad should you go for? Are there any types or so on? So the types of PPC ads completely depend on your marketing strategy and goals. So you should always be aware of the ads that you want to promote. Grasp the interest of the viewer by making it more appealing. Decide to promote your product. This is the must guys because until and unless you like the product that you're promoting, nobody would actually go for it, right? And always be ready to take action on any of the activities that might lead to revenue generation. So you should be well aware of what you're doing. So what are the notable things that you should know before going for PPC? You should know about digital ad strategy, digital advertisement design, ad landing page, ad targeting and pricing. Ad strategy or the digital ad strategy is the important part of PPC. You know how to develop the foundation of your business with the step by step process to create goals and persona segments for your campaigns. Also the cross channel methods for acquisition, nurturing, building customer loyalty and branding are very important in this phase. Now the next one is digital ad design. If you break down the differences between PPC display and social ads, you know that the benefits and the best practices for each find out how to write relevant ad copy headlines lead generation forms and CDAs that is call to actions. Also learn about relevant imagery content including cinematography video flash banners pop ups and so on. Okay now talking about the ad landing page no matter how much time or money you spend on digital advertising campaign it will all go in vain if your landing page doesn't resonate with your audience. Optimize your forms ads and landing page design by platform and set lead generation and social media goals to ensure a seamless and personalized experience for every visitor. And how does ad targeting work? You need to discover various ways to reach your target customers including ad content, geographic location, behavioral and buying patterns, audience behaviors, specific demographics and many more. And at the end pricing you can develop a comprehensive understanding of what the models mean for your business strategy and also do cover the manual and automatic bidding and many more. 
So this was everything that you need to know about PPC marketing. So let's move ahead and take a look at content marketing. So this is actually considered as the key to success of your organization. So there is a famous saying content is anything that adds value to the readers life. And also there is another saying which says content is the king. This saying had created a lot of buzz amongst the online marketers and this is a different area of marketing like social media and SEO marketing guys. So content is the heart of what we do as marketers. You talk to the customers clients and the viewers and whomever you want regardless of what form it takes of the content. Content marketing is the use of that content any of it to help meet a marketing goal of your organization. That could be the acquisition of potential customers retention of existing ones reach more people with your brand or your product and really anything else guys. So what do you understand by the word content content actually means something that has valuable information in terms of business. It is related to data and strategy of how to deliver your product to the audience and the standard definition of content marketing goes something like this. It is a strategic marketing approach that is focused on creating and distributing valuable relevant and consistent content in order to attract and retain a clearly defined audience. It ultimately helps drive profitable customer action. So what are the major reasons do you think would help you consider content marketing as a career opportunity or for your business aspect as well. So content marketing helps increase the sales which in turn increases the revenue. You'll be saving yourself from spending more guys. The amount you spend on content creating and marketing is less compared to what all the other people do. The major reason to shift your focus to content is that you'll gain a lot of loyal and good customers. Now what exactly is the history behind the growth of content marketing? Now you'll wonder why the word content marketing comes into picture. Was it there since the beginning or was it named recently? The answer to this is it was used in the year 1732 by a man called Benjamin Franklin who published the first version of his annual poor Richard's Almanac. He did this because he wanted to advertise the new printing business that he had created. So this very event laid a proper foundation for what we are today. So why content marketing? Why not any other field? No doubt that content marketing these days is very popular and many short scale industries are using content marketing for the growth of their business organization. But you can't do something just because it worked for early adopters and just because massive B2B and B2C businesses are using it today doesn't mean that it is right even for you. Choose a domain that you are comfortable with working and then strive to reach your target and also categorize your agenda as to what part you have to put in more effort. This will eventually start giving you convenient results. Okay, you will find a lot of people using social media applications like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook and all these applications are actually considered as a platform for distributing the content that you create. Hence resulting in a lot of traffic onto your website. So let's take a look at the sales funnel guys. The main reason or the actual reason for you to work on content marketing is to sell your product. So the outlook of content marketing sales funnel looks something like this. Here you can see that the number of viewers are high. This is the double number of people who are actually purchasing your product guys. So say close to 75% of people are looking for information about the content that you already have. And the next phase is the one where the users show some interest in your website or your content and has thought about going further with it. Here he or she has to decide if he wants to invest money on your product or not. This is close to 23% guys. So these many people are actually looking forward to taking up your product. In this phase he or she actually wants to look into more further information regarding your product and has related queries regarding the same. So this is also a crucial phase for customers as well as the organizations because there is a chance that the customer might end up not buying or demands a lot of discounts. So this is the most important phase of content marketing. Okay, so here you can add in or you can talk about your blogs or your videos 
or your guest blogging and all the achievements of your company as well. The last phase is where the customer ends up enrolling or paying for your product. The density is very less compared to the number of visitors on your website. So this is what content marketing strives at. You're going to be striving hard to get the conversion rate to be equal because the number of viewers are very high and the number of people who are actually ending up buying your product is very less. So we are trying to make it very equal so that the revenue or even the ROI is going to be equal. So this was about content marketing. So let's move ahead and take a look at what exactly happens in social media marketing. Social media marketing is a powerful way for businesses of all sizes to reach your prospects and customers. Great marketing on social media can bring remarkable success to your business, creating devoted brand advocates and even driving leads and sales. It is also defined as a form of digital marketing that involves creating and sharing content in order to achieve your marketing and branding goals. But before you consider social media for your business, you need to know the strategy behind it. So starting off with social media marketing campaign without a strategy in mind is like wandering around a forest without a map. It will be fun, but you will get lost in the process guys. So have a look at how exactly you can build your career or know about social media marketing. How can social media help meeting your business goals? Is this even possible? Because when you log into any of your social media pages or accounts, all you can find is TikTok videos, any of the animal pictures or videos or so. Is there anything that can help you promote your product? There is. Social media marketing increases the website traffic, helps build formal conversation with the clients and also helps in raising brand awareness among the people on the social media platform. Because more than half of the entire world's population is on internet and also most of them are on social media. So creating a brand identity and a positive outlook for your organization is done using social media marketing. The bigger and the more engaged your audience are on social media networks, the easier it will be for you to achieve your marketing goals that is there on your list. So to start off with social media marketing campaign, I'll help you with some tips. So here are a few tips that you should follow or you should try to incorporate in your business sector as well. Content planning. So this is the first one on the list guys. We have content planning. Building a social media marketing plan is very essential. Always consider keyword research, competitive research to help brainstorm content ideas that will interest your target audience. And the next one is create great content. Always be consistent with other areas of online marketing as the content reigns supreme when it comes to social media marketing. Do make sure you post regularly and offer extremely valuable information that your ideal customers will find it helpful and interesting. Create a consistent brand image. Using social media for marketing enables your business to showcase your brand image across a variety of different social media platforms. So do use social media for promoting your product. Now the next one is a promotion. Like I mentioned, social media is for promoting a product. Social media marketing is a perfect channel for sharing your best work with the readers by writing blogs. Once you gain a loyal fan following on social media, you'll be able to post all your new content and make sure your customer or your prospects can find it easily. Sharing appropriate link. Social media is a platform where you can leverage your own unique content to gain a lot of followers and fans. It is also the best platform to share links of your content that is relevant. If that corresponding content provides great and valuable information, your target audience will definitely enjoy it. So don't forget to link them guys. Always keep a track of your competitors. This is a must guys. It is always important to keep an eye on your competitors. If your competitors are using any certain social media tactics or any social media channel that seems to be working for them, do consider implementing the same, but do it in a better way. Okay. Now, how should you choose the right social media platform for your business? There are so many mediums through which you can distribute your content, right? 
So a few of them prefer using Facebook Instagram YouTube Twitter LinkedIn and many more So let's see what suits the best for your organization first on the list is Facebook Facebook is a user-friendly casual and easy to use platform and You can easily promote your product as well. Do you require an active social media marketing strategy for this? You will want to pay careful attention to the layout of your UI as the visual component is a key aspect of your Facebook experience So there are many groups that are already in use and you can either join these groups or you can create a own group of your own and let people add on to it So if you want to join the groups that are already existing you would just have to send them request Post your content and get a number of people to know about your organization It's a simple way to promote your brand as well as your product or your content that you're creating Facebook is just another medium through which you can communicate with people all around the globe and also Edureka has a Facebook page where we keep sharing updates regarding any of the recent technologies that we are working on Now Instagram is also another medium through which you can promote your product So Instagram is also a growing social media platform and the users use Instagrams for promoting their business and product It is a photo and video sharing social networking service created by Facebook so sharing your content on Instagram is also going to benefit your organization and also make you a socially active person I see most of the people try using Instagram for showing off their social life But Instagram is also used for promoting the products as well There are groups or there are websites which have the Instagram account so that they keep posting updates regarding any of the new change which is there in their organization so you can add stories about the quiz competition and the offers that you're going to offer your customers You even have something called paid ads on Instagram So when you open Instagram you get ads which you don't want to view but it is already present there So you just have to scroll through it and even in the stories you get a sponsored promotion guys So you can look into it and also yeah, you can get paid on Instagram as well It is just like PPC guys, okay? So let's move ahead and understand how you can promote your product using LinkedIn So LinkedIn is a business and employment oriented service that operates via websites and mobile applications It is mainly used for professional networking by using LinkedIn You can target your prospects and customers and post relevant content You can join relevant groups on LinkedIn as well and share your content or you can either build your connection By posting it on your timeline itself to let people know about the work you do Okay, so LinkedIn is a professional way of promoting a product guys So encourage customers or clients to give your business a recommendation on your LinkedIn profile and these recommendations Make your business appear more creditable and more reliable for new prospects Now the next one is YouTube YouTube is the number one place for creating and sharing video content and It can also be incredibly powerful social media marketing tool it is now operating as one of the Google subsidiary So what is so fascinating about YouTube? YouTube allows users to upload view rate share Report or comment on videos and subscribe to channels to get more views and likes focus on creating useful Instructive videos guys this will help gaining a lot of subscribers and also increase the chances of getting your video to rank on the first page on Google So you can see Edureka's posts coming up every now and then right? So you can either check for any of the possible keywords by Edureka It will be ranking on the first page So this is how you can create your content you create more important Instructive and easy content so that people or the viewers will understand what you're trying to tell them and also it is a platform where you can earn a lot guys. So YouTube marketing is like a boon to us Now the next one is Twitter Twitter is one of the most widely used social media marketing tools that let you broadcast your updates across the web It is a micro blogging and social networking service on which users post and interact with messages known as tweets Follow tweeters in your industry or related fields and you will gain a steady stream of followers in return Always be active on Twitter and be sure to retweet when a customer has something nice to say about your work and don't forget to reply 
I think I've come across a lot of people who just post something on the social media and just forget about its existence. That shouldn't happen if you're working constantly or if you're focusing more on social media marketing. Do reply to their queries, do ask for suggestions, do ask what they want from their end. All right? So doing this will make them feel that you are actually a person and not a bot. Using Twitter for social media marketing revolves around dialogue and communication. So always be confident and interact as much as possible to nurture and build your following. So these are some major social media marketing platform which will definitely benefit your business guys. So moving on, let's take a look at how email marketing works. Email marketing is one of the oldest and the most professional way to communicate with your clients and prospects. It is the most direct and effective way of connecting with your leads, nurturing them and turning them into customers, consistently winning out over all other marketing channels. How did email marketing come into the bigger picture? The first email was sent by Ray Tomlin's son in the year 1971, according to a few sources. What he sent was nothing really special, but it was just a series of numbers and letters that looked more like a password. The email was sent from one computer to another, traveling through a network of machines unlike the internet we know today. This guy also introduced the symbol at in the email addresses to the entire world. And voila, we are here using emails on a daily basis in terms of work or promotional purposes. So email marketing actually helps you to connect with your audience and promote your brand. So why do you need email marketing when you have social media marketing and other platforms where you can promote your business? For sure, even this will have its own reasons, right? So let's understand what those are. Apart from being a primary source of communication, there are a few more reasons why you should go for email marketing. The major reasons are listed here. So the first reason would be it gives you a better ROI or high ROI. Email marketing returns close to $44 for every $1 that you're going to be spending. Also, it is an effective channel to reach your customers or prospects. Email marketing is close to 40 times more effective than Facebook, Twitter to gain a lot of new customers. And also it is easy to integrate with other communication channels. And also you can take this chance to enlarge your audience through emails and by blending these emails with your profiles on the social media platforms. In fact, the recent study shows that 72% of people prefer receiving promotional content through email compared to 17% people who prefer getting notifications from social media. So this graph here shows the number of people who prefer using email over other mediums. So yeah, email also helps drive conversions. Most of the marketers are focused on driving more customers to their product, but regardless of whether they do so in the form of lead sales membership, the ultimate goal for marketers is to turn potential customers into paying customers. This is the right platform because when you talk about conversions, there isn't a more powerful channel rather than email. In fact, the average click through rate of an email campaign is around 3% and if you compare it with Twitter, the average click through rate from a tweet is around 0.5%. So what are the best practices for email marketing? If you start with email marketing, you would definitely know the best tactics and some ways to improve your skills. So a few notable ones among them are build your own list. Buying email list is actually a waste of time guys. You'll be turning off most of the people whom you're hoping to turn them into customers and run the risk of being a labeled spammer. So do not buy email lists. Okay. And also do not send out ads all the time. Use your emails to build rapport with customers by sharing your expertise giving them tips and insights they can value. Also establish your goals clearly. Check what you want to focus on and deliver it to the customers as it is required. And also select a type of campaign that you want to send out. This lays a foundation of what kind of campaign you want to create on your own. So this was about email marketing guys. Now moving ahead, let's take a look at Google Analytics. 
Google Analytics is basically a web analytics service offered by Google that helps in tracking and reporting website traffic. It is also one of the most powerful digital analytics software. This software provides valuable insights that help in shaping your business strategy. So what does it mean? What valuable insight do I need to build my business? All companies have an online appearance and therefore it becomes very important for you to learn the inner structure of your website to see whether it is accomplishing its goals or not. Irrespective of the type of website, you should understand the study of the behavior of their visitors. So why do you need Google Analytics? Google Analytics is free of cost. Google does not charge you for using Google Analytics and you don't have to pay anything to use this product. Data collection is also automatic in Google Analytics as this has special feature that reduces the work that is required to put Google Analytics data into Google Docs, sites or spreadsheets. And also you can easily customize your results. You can create your own reports in Google Analytics. You can either choose one from all the reports that Google creates or even build your own customized report using drag and drop mechanism. It also helps measure internal site search. Internal site basically reveals what potential customers are looking for after landing onto your website. You can track them using Google Analytics. Also, this helps you a lot with targeting the right platform. Social media platforms are a great way to drive a lot of traffic and engage potential customers. And using Google Analytics, you have access to view what catches the attention of the users and then place the ad accordingly. So this is about Google Analytics. Moving ahead, let's take a look at CRO or what we say is conversion rate optimization. Conversion rate optimization is a systematic process of increasing the percentage of website visitors who perform desired actions like filling out a form, becoming customers and so on. The CRO process involves understanding how users move through your site, what actions they perform, and what's the barrier that is stopping them to complete the task. For example, let's say you're purchasing a product online. Here, you first perform certain actions on the web page and then ask for suggestions from your friends or relatives and so on. And finally, when you want to decide to go ahead and buy this product, you'll have your own set of queries, right? and you want some assistance for it and you'll go across and call the customer care as to how you can do it why should you want this product and all of it and then finally you decide to buy this product online so this exact process is called conversion rate optimization so how to calculate a conversion rate your site's conversion rate is the number of times a customer or the user completes a task divided by your site's traffic if a user can convert in each visit, such as buying a product, divide the number of conversions by the number of sessions, that is the number of different times a user came to your site. If you sell a subscription, divide the number of conversions by the number of users. So the conversion rate optimization takes place after the visitors makes it to your website. This is different from conversion optimization for SEO or paid ads that focuses on who clicks through your site from the organic search results, how many clicks you get and which keyword are driving traffic. Okay, so what are the different ways in which CRO can benefit your business? While not necessarily directly related to attracting organic website traffic or ranking on a search engine result pages, conversion rate optimization has distinct benefits for SEO or your company business. They majorly include improved customer insights. CRO can help you with a better understanding of your key audience and find what language or messaging best opens up to their needs. CRO looks at finding the right customers for your business. Better ROI. Higher conversion rate means making more of the resources you have. By studying how you can get the most out of your acquisition efforts, You'll get in more conversions without having to bring in more potential customers. It also increases the scalability. While your audience size may not scale as your business grows, CRO lets you grow without running out of resources and prospective customers. Audience aren't infinite. You can turn more browsers into buyers 
and you'll be able to grow your business without running out of potential customers. Better user experience is also established. When users feel sophisticated on your website, they tend to stick around. CRO studies what works on your site. By taking what works and expanding on it, you'll make a better user experience. And the last and the most important benefit is the trust. So for a user to share their credit card, email and any sort of personal information, they have to genuinely trust the site. Your website is your number one salesperson. Just like an internal sales team, your site needs to be professional, courageous and ready to answer all your customers questions. Okay, so this was about CRO. But this let's hop on to the next topic of this video on digital marketing tutorial. So let's understand how to become a digital marketer. So well in order to become a successful digital marketer, you need to possess some desired skill sets. Some of the top skills that you need to have in order to bag a role of digital marketer are specific marketing channel expertise should have worked on a marketing campaign ability to execute and analyze marketing campaign should have the basic knowledge of WordPress the working of it and also should be able to sell the product and the most important thing is you should always be updated with the latest technology trends. Okay, so this is exactly how you can start your quest to become a successful digital marketer. So firstly, we'll see why do you need search engine optimization? Well, SEO is one of the top digital marketing channels used to generate traffic onto your website. This marketing channel is also very important because it is not only the search engines, but also it is about having a good SEO, which improves the user experience and eventually the website traffic. So what does it have to do with your business? Imagine you have your own company and you're just surfing through the internet what could be the best way to increase the traffic to your website? And the simple answer to this would be SEO. Almost all websites need optimization in order to rank on Google or SERP, that is search engine result pages. So in short, if I have to say about SEO, I would say that you need SEO services because it will help send the right signals to search engines and also push your website up the list of results which help in ranking in the first spot. Well, lots and lots of people search for things, right? That traffic can be extremely powerful for a business, not only because there's a lot of traffic, but also there's a lot of very specific and high intended traffic directed towards your website. Now, what exactly do you think works for driving traffic from search engines? Why search engines are very important? People are searching for any manner of things directly related to your business. Beyond that, your prospects are also searching for all kinds of things that are loosely related to your business. These represent even more opportunities to connect to those folks and help answer their queries, solve their problems and become a trusted resource for them. Regardless of what search engines you use, search results are constantly changing in recent days. So Google particularly has updated a lot of things surrounding to how they rank websites by way of lots of different animal names recently and a lot of easiest and cheapest way to get your pages to rank in search results have become extremely risky in recent days. So how does it work? How does Google determine which pages to return in response to what people search for? How do you get all these valuable traffic to your website? If I have to say Google's algorithm is extremely complex guys. I'll share some views about anything that is related to this Google algorithm so that you can dive deeper into how Google ranks its sites at the end of each section. Google is looking for pages that contain high quality relevant information about the searcher's query. So they determine relevance by crawling your website's content and evaluating whether that content is relevant to what that person is looking for, mostly based on the keywords it contains. And also talking about the quality, it is determined by the number of means and also the quality of your websites that link to your page and the whole site as well. Now, surprisingly, additional number of elements are being weighed by Google's algorithm to determine where your site will rank. This basically depends on how people engage with your site, how long do they serve for, what action do they perform, 
and so many other things actually play a vital role in shaping your website's traffic and also there's another factor that is the speed of your site how long does the loading speed take and is it mobile friendly and how much unique content you possess if it's a low value content or it's a duplicate content and so many other things so there are mainly hundreds of ranking factors that affect the google's algorithm considering the fact that you get the response searches and also they're constantly being updated and refined by this process and surprisingly you don't have to be a search engine scholar to rank for valuable terms in search results we'll walk you through the proven repeatable and best practices for optimizing your website for search that can help you drive traffic through your website so this was about why do you need search engine optimization for your website moving on we'll see what exactly is a search engine optimization or seo search engine optimization which is often called as seo is basically a process of increasing the quality of your website traffic the major search engines like yahoo google bing all have primary search results here the web pages are displayed and ranked based on what the search engine selects as the most relevant in accordance with the context seo helps websites achieve a better ranking on the search engine result pages that is serp when prospects search for a particular keyword related to your products or services thus this increases the quality and the quantity of traffic on your website through organic results seo is also the process that organizations go through to help make sure that their site ranks high in the search engines for relevant key phrases and keywords now let's say for example if you have an article on what is digital marketing in order to get your content in front of the right people you want to try to optimize your blog post so that it will show up on the top results for anyone who searches for the phrase or keyword what is digital marketing or digital marketing there are so many benefits of using seo for your business by improving your seo you can work to expand your visibility on search engines this will eventually help you reach and engage more potential customers and also you can create more engaging and effective seo focused content which will in turn increase your chances of bringing in more targeted organic traffic and also i would also put across this point search is a big source for traffic so here is the most breakdown report as you can see here 60% of all the traffic on the web starts with a simple google search and if you add together traffic from other popular search engines like yahoo bing youtube 70% of traffic actually originates from a search engine now let's say for example if your company is a e educational site according to google around 3 lakh people search for online training every single month this might be even more but yeah considering the first result in google that gets around 20% of all the clicks that is 22000 visitors to your website each month if you show up at the top but let's quantify this how much are those visitors worth the average advertiser for that search phrase spends up to $1 per click which means that the web traffic of 22000 visitors is worth roughly $22000 a month and that's just the search phrase guys if your site is seo friendly then you can rank for hundreds or even thousands of keywords in other industries like real estate insurance and all other part of digital marketing the value of search engine traffic is significantly higher we even have something called as organic and paid traffic organic traffic is something that is got out of the content that you create and how you market it whereas paid traffic is you are pushing them so that people can see it and get more traffic out of it okay so this was about seo now that you've understood how it works let's talk about certain myths about seo optimization so there's this famous myth saying that seo is all about optimizing google but the reality is it's not more platforms like yahoo bing and so on also depend on your business so yeah seo is not only about optimizing google another myth is you should pay for traffic to attain seo this process is actually called black hat in digital marketing it's not about only seo so this were a few myths about seo now that you figured out how seo works let's understand how digital marketing came into existence its roots and how its branches spread out that is the history of seo 
search engine optimization is considered as a millennial it is believed that seo was first born in the year 1991 during this span is when the world's first website was also launched that is www that is world wide web this led to the launch of many such websites that crowded the internet seo very much revolves around google today so however the practices that we know as seo actually predates the world's most popular search engine which was co-founded by larry page and sergey brin but although when i said uh, it was first started in the year 1991 the story of seo officially began a bit later around 1997 guys so here are a few series of events that would justify the evolution of seo so in the year 1993 search engine excite was launched first by the stanford students So there were six students of Stanford who helped in developing the search engine called Excite. And also in the same year in the month of June, World Wide Wanderer was launched, which was later coined to Wandex, and in the same year AliWeb was introduced. This site allows the owners to submit their own pages. This is something interesting and also something new in the field of SEO at that point. Also correspondingly in the year 1994 Yahoo, Vista, Lyco search engine were also created. So I think most of them know what Yahoo is. Vista, I think everybody might know it. Also in the year 1995, Look Smart, Excite, Alta Vista were created. Look Smart is a search advertising content management and online media company. It provides search, machine learning and chatbot technologies. So this was created in the year 1995. And also in the year 1996, the initiation of backrub was started even this is a search engine and also in the year 1997 msn search engine was built and google was launched so yeah this was way back before we had google as a registered domain so now we know where seo and google stand right now right so ever since google was created it wasn't an easy task to move from a particular domain to one particular search engine So Google is a search engine where you can find everything now. Even a small piece of information that you need or you want to know something, you can just Google it and you'll have the information right away. But back then it wasn't the case, but then as Google was launched, everything changed. So this is when SEO had a major twist in the field of digital marketing. So yeah, this was about the history of digital marketing. Hope this satisfies how SEO came into the picture or SEO came into the mainstream of digital marketing. Now moving on to the next topic, we have the types of SEO in use. Now talking about the different types of SEO that exist, we have a wide range of SEOs in use. A few notable ones among them are white hat SEO, black hat, gray hat. So let's understand each of them in detail and also there are a few techniques which also come under these types. So these are not exactly considered as types but yeah we call it techniques which is on page SEO off page SEO and technical SEO Now let's start discussing about it SEO is something which is actually used to increase the organic traffic on your website from search engines So using the right type of SEO you'll be able to achieve this mighty goal So first on the list we have is white hat SEO As the name suggests white hat SEO basically refers to the most upright practices adapted by the digital marketers worldwide to help rank your product high on the search engine result pages or SERP This type is strictly abided by the Google guidelines so you should follow the guidelines of Google for better SEO You'll also be able to focus more on the meta tags keywords in the title and body of the content It is also called as ethical SEO guys. So white hat SEO is also called ethical SEO. It is most widely used practice for publishing quality content on the website, restructuring the links and many more. Now talking about the exact definition of white hat SEO, this white hat SEO utilizes the techniques and methods to improve the search engine rankings of a website which don't run our foul of search engines mainly the google guidelines it also focuses on audience opposed to a search engine guys and people who are looking for a long term investment on their websites rely on white hat techniques okay so the next one on the list is black hat seo so what exactly is a black hat seo 
So this black hat SEO includes certain practices that focus on finding loopholes in Google's algorithm for ranking a particular content higher on the search engine result pages. So if I have to say or compare a black hat and white hat SEO, black hat SEO is dead opposite to the white hat SEO. By this I mean to say that the practices followed by the black hat SEO are totally against the guidelines provided by Google and its algorithms. Now talking about the techniques that it includes, uh, we have uh, spam links, keyword stuffing, cloaking, hidden text and links. So spam links are nothing but linking your blogs or overlinking your content. And keyword stuffing is something that is required if you are going to write an article of close to 5000 or 6000 words and you are not able to being add your keyword at a particular place, you'll stuff those keywords at some point so that it gives up heads up to you telling that SEO is good. Cloaking is a SEO technique in which content presented to the search engine spider is different from that present to the user's browser. This is done by delivering the content based on the IP address of the user agent HTTP header of the user requesting page. Now the next one is hidden text. Hidden text I think most of you know. Hidden text is something which is invisible or unreadable. So hidden text is mostly achieved by setting the font color to the same color as a background and rendering the text invisible unless the user highlights it. Okay, it can serve several purpose guys. So using black hat SEO you can do these. So you can link any of your videos or blogs to any of the platform that you're going to be working on. So using these techniques you can make your content appear on the SERP which is going to generate more traffic to your website and also you'll get good leads out of it. Now the next one that I have on the list is gray hat SEO. Generally if I say types of SEO we make use of black hat or white hat but also sometimes we make use of gray hat as well. So what exactly is this gray hat SEO? Defining this gray hat SEO is a little tough but I've put across them in certain way that it could help you understand what exactly it stands for. Gray hat is not something that is between the black hat and the white hat. It's much different from what people say guys. Here in this case it is a practice of using legal methods that help in improving websites traffic. These are also referred to as DBS which could one day turn into a black hat. Also this falls somewhere in the middle as these tactics and techniques are not specifically present in Google's guidelines. So this is about the types of SEOs that are present in the market right now. Now talking about the different techniques or which is sometimes referred to as types as well. We have something called as on page off page and technical. So you might have come across this keyword on page off page SEOs right. These are nothing but the strategies that you follow to gain more traffic by having content on the page and off the page. Now talking about on page SEO this relates to the content that is present on the web page. Now you might think what's so special about working on the content that is already present on the page. Well there is all on page activities primarily include distribution of keywords in the right place, inserting external links, meta tags, description for it, adding a customized URL to your content and also last one but not the one which you should ignore images. So all these are present on the page and hence optimizing it in a better way will eventually drive more traffic to your website. Now talking about the keyword distribution, keyword distribution should be done at the right place. By this I mean to say that if you're going to be writing a blog on SEO, you need to know where to include the word SEO in the entire blog. If you're going to be using SEO at the first part of the sentence on every other line is going to be making it very awkward. So keyword distribution plays a vital role in generating more traffic or many leads to your website. Inserting external links. You need not provide links to other blogs or other external resources. You can either link to your company's blogs or articles or also you can link something which is more relevant to it. Even if you think the external source is giving more enlightenment or giving more opportunity to learn about some other factor that you've mentioned, you can always put a link to it. Links play an important role guys. If you're going to be writing an entire blog about digital marketing, you need more facts, more resources and also stats. For stats and facts, you can either refer to the people or companies which are mainly into digital marketing. 
So this is how a links play an important role. Now talking about meta tag description meta tags are something that is present below your topic on the search engine pages. Let me show you guys how it is visible. If I type selenium resume. You can see that our post is present over here. And also you can see a description a small description over here. So how to build an effective selenium resume go through this blog to understand how to build your selenium resume and ace an interview. So this meta description also plays an important role because you need to add your keyword even over here. Now talking about adding customized URL to your content adding a different URL is definitely going to be working for you guys because the domain is going to be your company's name that is Ours is going to be edureka.co and followed by which we are going to be adding the keyword also in the URL. Right, so customized URL is going to help to get a better view to your article and images. Images should have all tags and also these should contain your keyword. Make sure that you add your keyword in such a way that it would help users to find it very easily and what you're going to be discussing about. So this was about the on page optimization or on page SEO. Now moving on to the next technique we have off page SEO. This off page SEO is also required to increase traffic onto your website, but it mainly focuses on external ranking mediums like backlinks, internal linking and many more. This is most widely referred to as the activities that are performed on the web page after it goes live on the internet. Link building brand promotion are all a part of this off page optimization or off page SEO. In addition to this off page SEO also includes commenting on a post sharing liking and building the user engagement brand promotion is always required guys because branding is something that you should work for from the scratch. Even if you have SEO even if you don't have SEO it doesn't matter but branding yourself in front of the social world or social media is very important. This can be done using off page SEO. This is not going to be dealing with anything that is present on the page, but everything that is taken care of after the article is posted online. After you finish writing your article or anything regarding a content marketing, you'll have to link your post to one another, right? Now, say if I've written a blog on what is digital marketing, I can use this what is digital marketing's link to another blog where I can just refer to just writing digital marketing but not writing the entire definition of it and not giving the exact proper explanation to what is digital marketing. I can just mention or put up a link to what is digital marketing and then you're there. So this is exactly how off page SEO works. Backlinking and internal linking plays an important role in off page SEO. Now the next one that I have on the list is technical SEO. Technical SEO is often related to the parts where there is no content. So what's this supposed to mean? SEO is basically having a content and optimizing it, right? So what exactly technical SEO does here? It means that you'll have strategies that improve the website's backend structure. Also, as the name suggests, it handles the technical parameters that affect the visibility of your website on the search engine result pages. So what exactly this means? Like I mentioned, it takes care of all the backend activities and you'll have to make strategies to improve the back end of your post. So when I say technical parameters, we can talk about HTML CSS, HTML CSS JavaScript. Now traditionally the phrase technical SEO refers to optimizing your site for crawling and indexing. So we'd see what are crawling and indexing in the next part of the session, but it can also include any technical process meant to improve search visibility. Technical SEO is a broad and exciting field covering everything from sitemaps, meta tags, JavaScript indexing, keyword research, and many more. It is called technical because it has nothing to do with the actual content of the website or the website promotion. The main goal of the technical SEO is to optimize the infrastructure of a website. So this was about the types of SEO and also about the different techniques that are used in the types of SEO. Moving ahead, let's take a look at the working of a search engine. Search engines are basically used for a better generation of results that you can look up to. Knowing the working of search engines is definitely going to be useful for better end results. So let's see how these search engines work. 
technically speaking, search engines have these primary functions that is crawling, indexing, and ranking. So let's learn about them in detail. Okay, now talking about crawling, this process is called as spiders or web crawlers. It automatically browses the web and stores information regarding the web pages you visit. It can also be termed as a Google bot. They help in finding new and updated content online. So this starts out by fetching the web pages that you had looked for and then follows the link on those web pages to find new URLs. By following the trace of links, the crawler will be able to find new content and add it to their index. This is called caffeine, a huge database of previously searched URLs that can later be retrieved when you are seeking information about the content on a particular URL and think it is a good match. To be honest, search engines work by crawling hundreds of billions of pages using their own web crawlers. So these web crawlers are commonly called as search engine bots or spiders. A search engine navigates the web by downloading web pages and following links on these pages to discover new pages that have been made available. Crawling is a very easy process guys. So this image here shows you how exactly this works. Most search engines build an index based on crawling, which is the process through which the search engines like Google, Yahoo and Bench find a new way to index mechanisms known as bots or spiders crawl the web using new pages. So these bots typically start with a list of websites URLs determined from previous crawls. When they detect new links on these pages through tags like href, src, they add these to the list of sites to index. Then the search engines use their algorithms to provide you with a ranked list from their index of what pages you should be most interested in based on the query that you provided. Then the engine will return a list of results that are ranked using the specific algorithm. On Google, other elements like personalized and universal results may also change your page ranking. So in this personalized results, search engine utilizes additional information it knows about the user to return results that are catered to their interest directly. The universal search results combine video, images, and Google News to create a bigger picture result which may mean a greater competition from other websites for the same keyword. So this was about web crawling or crawling. So the next process is called as index. So how does index work? Once a spider has crawled through your page, a copy of it is stored onto a data center. These data centers are massive repository which has all copies of the web pages that were crawled. Web pages can be easily discovered by search engines and it's done in a better way by adding a data structure called an index. It can also be defined as a repository of web pages that are collectively called an index. This concept is very simple guys. If your website is not on their index, it will not appear for any of the searches. It is also true that if you have more pages in the search engine index, the more are your chances to appear on the search results. Now talking about the algorithm which is used, there's a huge collection of web page copies which are being constantly updated and organized so that you can quickly find what you're looking for. But you need means by which you can be ranked in order of relevance to your search term. This is where the algorithm comes into play. The algorithm is a very complex and the equation which calculates a value for any given site in relation to the search term or your keyword. We don't actually know how the algorithm is, but the search engines tend to keep this a closely guarded secret from competitors and from people who are looking to game the search engine and get to the top spots. That said, enough about the algorithms has been working out to let SEOs advertise website owners to how they improve their site's traffic and also move up top the list in the ranking. Search engines don't actually store all the information found in the page in their index, but they keep things like when it was created, updated, title, description of the page, type of the content, keyword, incoming and outgoing links, and many more. These are all done by using the algorithm, guys. So Google likes to describe their index in the form of something called back of a book or a really, really weak book. 
So why do you need indexing in this process? Why exactly indexing is required? So why should you care for having an index? So it's very simple guys. Like I mentioned, if your website is not in their index, it will not appear for any of the searches. This also implies that the more pages you have in the search and in indexes, the more are the chances of you appearing on the search results when someone types a query or something. Also notice that it is going to appear in the search engine result, which means that in any position, not necessarily on the top pages. All right. So this was about indexing. Now the next topic is ranking. So if ranking plays a major role in optimizing your website as well. So it is a process in which the search engine will pick highly relevant content and display it on the highest position on the SERP. These are nothing but the content you create that is handpicked by the search engines for better optimized results for a particular keyword. You can also say that the higher the website is ranked, the more relevant the search engine thinks that it's a solution to a query. Also talking about ranking, PageRank is one of the best algorithms for improving web search results. It is also considered as one of the ways to measure the importance of the website. And also in addition to this, the websites and the content that are present on the first page of the search engine are those which page rank thinks is the best. Like I mentioned in indexing, if your website is not on their index, it will not appear for any of the searches. In same way, ranking is based on page rank. So this is exactly how SEO works or I would say search engines in general work. Have these three things satisfied and yeah, you're good to go with your company's marketing plan. Now the next one I'm going to be talking about is tactics and the methods that you should follow. Just having a good website and a great content will not help you rank on relevant keywords on the search engine pages guys. You should follow a few techniques that will help you in better traffic generation and lead generation. So here are a few tactics that will help you rank your content on the top of the search engine pages. So want to be a leader in analyzing and optimizing your content to rank in the first page. Here are a few tips from my side. Okay, so the first one is a good user experience. So people landing on your website would often be looking for a smooth interface and you should be able to provide them with this with ease. This is because Google only picks those websites which put up relevant and quality results or quality content. So for Google to include your website as a unique content, you should have a good UI and justifying solution to the queries that are put up. And according to a recent survey, it was also stated that the content that you create should be useful, usable, desirable, findable, valuable, creditable and accessible. So these are some important factors that is required to help have a better user experience. Now the next one is content creation. There's also a saying that longer the content higher is going to be the ranking. This is the actual truth guys. It has worked in my case as well. Longer the content higher is going to be the ranking of it. Say uh, there are videos which go beyond 11 hours and also is close to five hours, four hours straight, right? So these content have better chances of ranking because you'll be learning everything from scratch. You don't have to sit and watch every other videos that are put up, which has bits of content in it. Like if the video is up to five to 10 minutes, you'll have information which is straightforward to it. You will not be revolving around the topics that is associated with it. So longer the content higher is going to be the ranking. The content that you create has a major impact on your website's ranking. A recent study also says that the longer the content, the higher the likelihood of its ranking at the top of the SARPs. So yeah, this is exactly how content plays a major role in SEO. Organic traffic is way better than generating traffic via paid search or social media platforms. So organize your business goals in such a way that it does not hinder your company's growth. Now talking about how much you're going to be spending on advertising rather than getting your organic traffic thing done. The average business venture spends up to 1% of its total revenue only on advertising. So if your business makes up to $1 million per year, you might have to spend close to $10,000 only on advertising. So think of the better picture here guys organic traffic is never ending. Organic traffic has no end or has no death. Whereas if you talk about the money factor here, 
it is going to be affecting you as well as your financial state of your company. I wouldn't say that PPC or paid advertising is bad, but you should know how to push your content and how to generate leads by them. But the main focus that I would say or that I've gone through would be organic traffic is getting more views more traffic and also it is leading to the lead generation which is then converted to sales and also gets you good revenue. So yeah organic traffic and content creation plays an important role. Now the next one is keyword research till now we've never spoken about keyword analysis or keyword research the entire topic here. So we are going to be talking about keyword research here because keyword is an important factor of SEO. SEO is mainly dependent on the keyword that you get how to analyze your keyword how to generate keywords how to build your content on that particular keyword and how to make them rank. So keyword plays a vital role in making your content rank. Google is evolving and so are its algorithms. Now the main aim is to understand the intention of the viewers or the prospects. What do they want their interest the search volume of a particular keyword and to be more specific what search results to the keyword will help answer the queries. Now say for example the search engine shows digital marketing has a search volume of 3 billion per month. This is a very huge number guys and you'll be exposed to millions and you'll have to target it very heavily. So creating a content on a particular keyword or the keyword that you're going to be using plays an important role here. We'll also see how to optimize your keywords in the next uh, part of the session. Now moving on. Let's take a look at content marketing. So these are the tactics that you should follow guys. Now talking about content marketing be a hero in the field of creating good content and delivering it to the right audience. Content creating is a must but promoting the content and distributing it across the marketing channels is a task in hand. But if your company is in a private sector say industrial or educational it's required to have corresponding articles or videos. Marketing is not just limited to making uh, videos and writing blogs guys. It is something which is way beyond it. You can promote your products by using social media as your platform your good to go platform. And also you can go for uh, email marketing as well. So when you want to promote any of your product say for example if you're in the private sector and you want to promote the product that you've created on your own. I have a friend who is good at quilling. She is going to be marketing her product online. She chose to use Instagram as a platform her good to go platform I would say because she's getting more views more likes more followers and also people are approaching her with new designs so that she could make and she could deliver it to them. What I would say is she's getting something in return for giving something to them. So this is how you market your product. Now if I say content marketing content marketing is something that is related to creating content and promoting it right. You'll have to take the opportunity of writing more articles and make more videos regarding the keywords that is being given to you. Even in this case you'll have to make sure that you work on the highest search volume keyword. This is definitely going to make your content rank among the top 10 articles or the videos on the SARP. Now I wouldn't say you should copy whatever is written on the first 10 links or the first page of the SERP. You should make a content which is very unique which has more information additional information regarding a particular topic or the keyword. So this was about content marketing content marketing is one of the techniques or a marketing channel which you can go for to get more views to get more people to know about your brand or your product. Now the next one is create a lot of backlinks backlinking is important to make your website rank on Google links are still the number one factor that determines the website ranking because without these links ranking your website would be very hard. Also links can be earned through high quality content influential marketing and so on. So these are considered to be extremely efficient guys. So yeah a lot of backlinking is also important. So this was about the tactics and the methods that you should follow now moving on to the next topic of the discussion that is how to optimize your keywords. Keyword optimization is very much required if you are going to be having a blog or an article. Follow these steps for better keyword optimization. So the first thing you should do is select your domain and target the most popular keyword. Be aware of what domain you are going to be working on and target the most searched keyword in that field. 
This is going to help in better content creation and drive more traffic to your website for that keyword. Like I mentioned, selection of keyword plays an important role. If you're going to be working on programming languages, you should know which programming language you should target. There are so many programming languages in the market which has high demand and also which has a lot of importance, like say Java, Python, C sharp and so many others, right? So these are the popular domains, programming languages and also keywords, I would say. So be aware of what you're going to be working on and target the most search keyword. Now, once you're done doing your homework about selecting your domain and getting the most popular keyword, write effective content on that keyword by doing your proper research. By adding appropriate optimized keyword in your website's content, you'll be able to connect with your prospects and customers online. By doing this, you can address your viewers in a much simplified way. So creating good content based on the keyword that is being given to you plays an important role. So you'll just be given a keyword as like I mentioned Java. So you should know how to build your content based on that keyword. I would say what is Java? Why is it required? How it came into existence? What is it as a programming language? What are its major uses? What are its loopholes and so many other things? So you should know how to build your content. Now the next one is after you know what your keyword is after you know what content to add. You should know how to add title tags, content strategy, links, URL and meta description. So when you work on digital marketing, the success of your organization is mainly contributed by organic traffic, which mainly focuses on researching, analyzing and many more. And the title of your content is also very important guys. So make sure that you add your targeted keyword in your title because this is the most important piece of work on your website, both on and off page. And also try to make sure that you write a title which catches the user's eyes. You shouldn't say that we we'll learn about this, we we'll learn about that. You shouldn't be doing that. So yeah. Also add corresponding links to the topics you feel relevant and have inbound and outbound links that help in better optimizing your keyword. Like I mentioned, if you have a digital marketing blog, that is what is digital marketing. If I want to specify or define digital marketing in each and every blog that I'm going to be writing, it's going to be very hectic for me as well as you because you're going to be going through the same thing again and again. So leave links which help in better optimizing your content and it is going to be neat. It is going to be making it look good and don't forget to add relevant internal inbound and outbound links. Internal linking is something that is related to the articles that is already present on the website and you're linking it to this page. Now if I say Python, Python's keywords or Python blogs will have different keywords, right? In each of the blog that you're going to be writing, you can add a keyword which is already present. You can use the keyword in that blog and also link it to the other blog. So this is how internal linking works. Always make sure that you're adding the slug part of your article. This is because this should contain your focus keyword. And also if you have a doubt, just let me just show you guys how this looks. Like I had already searched for a Selenium resume. I'm just going to be opening this. Yeah, you can see this is a slug part. This is the keyword which I had and this is exactly how I've used this slug. So this is exactly how you can optimize your keyword. Hope this is going to be a proper help for you guys. Now talking about the next part of the session, we're going to be talking about title optimization. Title plays an important role if you're going to be strategizing your business. So even before a viewer clicks on your link, he is going to look at the title, right? So how exactly you should design your title? What exactly are title tags? So like I mentioned, users or the viewer will look for the title even before he clicks on the link that is present on the Google web page. So the post title should drag more attention. A well written title holds the power to the interest of the reader. But that's all on the side of the audience. So make sure that you create a lively or a good title. Title tags are an important part of the SEO strategy. This is because these are unique, short and should have the focus keyword in it. This is also the first thing that the audience look once they search for a particular query related to your product. So you need to focus on crafting captivating titles. So let me just show you guys a title tag. Okay, the blog which I had opened. Yeah, so this is the title tag building an impressive test engineer resume. 
selenium resume i have the keyword and i'm going to be building my words across the topic that is building an impressive test engineer resume this is going to help the viewers get some idea about what is happening and also they're going to be much impressed with the title now how to optimize your title there are some rules even here to follow where you should watch out for every other thing which is going to help your company's name go up and also rank your page on the Google web page. So the first thing is watch the length of your title. Do not display it oddly guys. Normally the search engines display only the first 50 to 60 characters of the web pages title. So make sure that you fill in the right title within the given spot of 50 characters. Let me show you guys how it is. You can see here this also contains close to 50 to 60 characters in it. So yeah, this is the maximum length of your blog or the article which you can write. Always use unique titles. Do not try to copy or plagiarize your content or title. All the web pages are unique guys. So customize your title accordingly. See you could see that. Let me show you guys if I go back. Yeah, you could see that there's this title called Selenium Resume for Selenium Web Driver Job Interview, Selenium Test Engineer, and all of it. If I have to check for digital marketing itself, I would say digital marketing. See, you'll have so many results here. And also, you can see that this is the ad. Add something which is called as paid ad pay per click. Now take a look at the titles over here. If I've told digital marketing, it says exceed your marketing goals, student marketing for business. If I go down, we have digital marketing made simple. What is digital marketing? Digital marketing. What is digital marketing? Overview and resources. You can see that all the topics are different, but just that the keyword is similar. Keyword is same. Digital marketing is same. But you'll find all the other things revolving it all the other words corresponding to the keyword digital marketing is changing. So this is exactly how you should create your titles. Your titles should be very unique. Do not try to copy anybody else's guys. So this is going to result in downfall of your article or your blog that you're going to be writing and it is not going to be present on the search engine pages. So yeah, and also prioritize your keywords. This has to be done because according to the recent research, it is said that the keywords at the beginning of the title may also have a lot of impact on the ranking of your page. So prioritize your keywords more. Stuffing is also required. I wouldn't say no. If you're going to be writing a blog close to 8,000 or 9,000 words, you should know where to stuff your keyword. Also prioritizing them accordingly is also important. And also this is the best practice to follow guys. This is also one of the things which we as research analysts also follow. And last but not the least branding your product is important. Branding yourself is also important. If you have a well known brand, take advantage of it by adding it at the end of the title. Now, like I mentioned or like I showed over here. You can find the name of the brand. So I've mentioned Selenium resume automation tester resume and Edureka. This is the SEO title guys and the SEO title is different from the actual title that you're going to be writing for the blog. So yeah, you should optimize both of them. By doing this, you'll be driving more traffic to your website and also the prospects would know about your work. Okay, so this was about optimizing your title. Now let's move ahead and take a look at the tools that you should consider for SEO. Tools are very important if you're going to be optimizing your website and also you'll be able to find a variety of tools available in the market that helps you in one way or the other. The booming tools are namely Google Analytics, Ahrefs, Moz, SEMrush, Ubersuggest and many more. So let's take a look at the tools. We also have Moz, Google Search Console, Keyword Tool, Google Trends, Keyword Research, WooRank and so many others. So so let's understand them in detail. So firstly, I would like to discuss about Ahrefs. This tool is one of the most popular digital marketing tools that is used for analytics, preparing backline analysis, audit reports, URL ranking and many more. Ahrefs tool is also used for keyword analysis, but also a sad news here is it is not a free version. You have to pay for it. 
but the features that uh, this tool provides is very 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 good and also it's worth paying a buck for it so one of the important tool for seo and also talking about ahrefs it is one of the most recommended seo tools online it is only second to Google when it comes to being the largest website crawlers and SEO experts can't get enough of Ahrefs site audit features as it is one of the best SEO analysis tool around. This tool highlights what part of your website requires improvement to help ensure the best ranking. From a competitive analysis perspective, you likely want to use this Ahrefs to determine your competitors backlinks to use them as a starting point for your own brand. You can also use this SEO tool to find the most linked to your content within your circle. Now the next one is SEM rush. SEM rush is also one of the best marketing SEO tools which is used throughout the world. SEM rush tends to be the fan favorite in the SEO community and experts love using this tool as it can easily access your ranking and changes them as well as also the new ranking opportunities. One of the most popular features of this tool is the domain versus domain analysis allowing you to easily compare your website to other competitors. So if you're looking for analytics reports that will help you better understand your website's search data traffic or even your competitors you'll be able to compare keywords and domains. So on page SEO checker tools allows you to easily monitor your ranking as well as find some recommendations on how you can improve your website's performance. Well, uh, this is a magnificent tool I would say for SEO marketing and uh, it does your keyword research keeps a track of your business strategy and runs an SEO audit on your blog or article. The main agenda of this tool is to create the best competitive intelligence solution for all digital marketing spheres. SEM rush is definitely a perfect match for PPC that is pay per click as it allows a ton of keyword research that helps in planning tracking and performance of your paid search campaigns. So folks, this is one of the best SEO marketing tools which is currently booming in the market right now. Now the next is a KW Finder or SEO keyword tool. An SEO keyword tool like KW Finder helps you in your long tail keywords that have a longer level of competition. The experts use this SEO tool to find the best keyword that run analysis reports on backlinks and SERP. Their rank tracker tool helps you in easily determining your ranking while tracking your improvement based on one key matrix. Plus if this is not enough you'll get a ton of new keyword ideas to help rank your website even higher. And the best part of the KW finder is how darn easy it is to use. But don't let this fool you into thinking a KW Finder isn't powerful. It's a legit keyword tool that a lot of pros use. The best feature I would say according to me about this tool would be the link profile strength. This feature basically tells you how many links you will need to rank for that keyword. So if you find a keyword that has a LPS of 50 plus you know that you will need to do some more serious link building to rank for that term. All right, so this is exactly how a KW Finder works. Okay, so this was about the most amazing tool that is Keyword Finder. Now, talking about the next tool that I have on the list is Moz. This is the SEO software. So, SEO software Moz kept popping up as one of the best SEO tools that experts usually use. Some raved about how Moz was always up to date despite Google's regular algorithm changes and others raved about their chat portal because it allowed them to always use an insightful response to every question asked. Whether you're looking for a keyword recommendation or a site crawl, Moz is a full service powerhouse. You can get great insights into how your website is performing but also you can get uh, information regarding how to improve your website's performance. We also have something called as a free Moz bar toolbar which you can easily download for free and it allows you to see the store's metrics while browsing any page. This was founded by the great Grand Fishkin and Gillian Music in the year 2004. From then on Moz has come a long way from just a blog and an online community to a giant in the world of SEO and digital marketing. So Moz is actually a software which is also used as a tool. So the page optimization feature in Moz 
tells you exactly what steps are required to improve the SEO of your every single page of your website. Moz's SEO tool improves the business as it provides increased transparency. Comparing your website to competitors on basis of traffic and optimization has never been easy to say. Using this tool has been made easy. Now the next tool that I have is Google Search Console. This is offered for free to everyone with a website that is search Google by console. It lets you monitor and report on your websites present in Google SERP. All you need to do is verify your website by adding some code to your website or going through the Google Analytics and submit your sitemap for indexing. Although you need a search console account to appear on Google search results, you can control what gets indexed and also how your website is represented with this account. As an SEO checker tool, a search console can help you understand how Google and its users view your website and allow you to optimize for better performance in Google search results. Okay, so this was about Google search console. Okay, we also have something called SEO spider. SEO spider is an effective web trawler, but the free version is very limited. Also, the SEO spider was originally created in the year 2010 by the euphemistically named screaming frog. Okay, so one of the most attractive feature of the SEO spider uh, is its ability to perform a quick search of friendly URLs. SEO best practices dictate that the search engines are much more likely to index simple, relevant and human readable URLs over addresses which are meaningless strings of characters. So SEO spider can also crawl your site to check for broken pages as well. This saves you the trouble of manually clicking each and every link to rule out the 404 errors. So this is going to be a very good application if you have broken pages or broken sites in your website. This tool also allows you to check for pages with missing title tags, duplicated meta tags, tags with wrong length and any other feature which is not in line with the SEO practices. There is both free and a paid version of SEO spider guys. So the free version contains the most basic features such as crawling redirects, but it is limited only to 500 URLs. So you cannot customize robots and no Google Analytics integration is possible. This makes the light version of SEO spider suitable for smaller domains. So the paid version costs more so and it also has more advanced feature as well as the support. And we also have something called Google AdWords Keyword Planner. So knowing the right keyword to target is all important when priming your web copy. And the next one that I have on the list is Vurank. As a top SEO analysis tool, Vurank offers free and paid options to track and report on your marketing data. You can plug in your competitors to discover which keywords they are targeting so that you can overlap with theirs. Try reporting on how keywords perform over time to really understand your industry and optimize for users in the best way possible. And the most important thing about Vurank is understanding the things your website is lacking from both the technical and the content perspective as this tool can identify duplicate content, downtime and security issues and provide guidelines on how to fix them. So Vurank is one of the top listed analysis tool for SEO. Now Google Trends is also one of the most useful digital marketing or SEO tool. So Google Trends has been around with us for years and has never been underutilized. Not only it gives you the information regarding a keyword, but also it offers great insights into trends about the topic which can be invaluable at the stage of business growth. Search for keywords in any country and receive information around it like Top queries, rising queries, interest over time and geographical location depending on the interest of your viewers. If you're not sure which SEO keywords are the ones for you, this is the best SEO tool you can use. This tool helps you give you the insights of a particular keyword and also lets you know that there are not many blogs or videos regarding that keyword so that it can increase the number of views and also it can increase the traffic to your website. So these are the tools which you should consider using if you're going to be working on SEO. So with this, we come to the last part of the session. That is what are the different guidelines you should follow to create better content and also optimize it. So the first thing that I would say is create content that is extremely relevant to your focus keyword. Do not beat around the bush in this case. 
if you're going to be working on one content one keyword you should know how to work your way around it you should add relevant topics related to that keyword and then do the stuffing part write a small introduction to the topic this is also called as meta description guys so in this don't forget to add your keyword so like i mentioned meta description also plays an important role in generating traffic to your website yeah so do consider writing a small introduction to it and proper usage of header tag for the topics that you're going to be discussing about use a different header for the heading and also for the subtopics as well say for example if you have topics that has been listed and for the first topic you have some two to three subtopics under it so the first header should be h2 and then if the subtopics are present put them in h3 and if those subtopics have further topics to be discussed put them in h4 or h5 have a proper usage of header tags add appropriate images to your content don't forget to add images guys so images plays an important role if you're going to be making videos or blogs and also if you're going to be making ppts if you're going to be giving a presentation to somebody who's interested in your product yeah you should know how to add images relevant to the topic add all tags to your images even in this case add your focus keyword here so all tags are included in uh, blogs if you're going to be writing blogs regarding a topic and you want to add an image to it all tags are required in which you need to have your focus keyword as well internal linking is a must guys this is a very important factor which helps in ranking the relevant pages so if we've already discussed a lot about internal linking in this session so let's not focus more about it and readability should always be good so if you're writing a blog the readability of that blog should be very very good and the sentence formation should be very simple it shouldn't be complicated it shouldn't make the reader think that you're just adding a few words to make a sentence that shouldn't be the case so readability should be good you should be up to date with the topic or the trends and also you should know how to work your way around in creating your content so these are the few guidelines which i as a research analyst follow for writing a blog Now moving ahead let's take a look at the different techniques in use so often i come across people who get confused between the types and the techniques of seo so types majorly include black hat seo white hat seo and gray hat seo now talking about the techniques we have three techniques in use which is on page seo off page seo and technical seo so let's understand what they are Well, on-page SEO is the practice of optimizing individual web pages to rank higher on the SERPs and get more relevant traffic from the search engines. As the name suggests, it optimizes the content that is present on the page. Now, what do you think is the content present on the page? These are nothing but the title tags, meta tags, meta description, keyword density, URL of the page, and so on. So these are some strategies that you have to follow to gain more traffic by having the content on the page. You might think what's so special about working on the content present on the page? Well there is. As long as you focus on giving more attention or paying more attention to your content and the way it is presented to your viewer, you're in safe hands, guys. Now moving on, let's understand about off-page SEO. Off-page SEO deals with the actions that are performed outside your website to improve your ranking on the SERPs. A recent study also states that off-page SEO makes up to 75% of a good digital strategy. It has everything to do with your social presence, link building and many more that doesn't really have to be present on the page. Putting it across in layman terms, I would say off-page SEO simply tells Google or search engines about what the audience think about your website. Off-page optimization is just link building, but there's definitely more wings to it, guys. It has strategic control over the way of making you famous over the internet. So do note, guys, off-page SEO is very important for your ranking and generating more traffic to your website. So most widely used off-page SEO elements are backlinks, follow and non-follow links, anchor text, link juice and relevancy. So this was about what is off-page SEO. Now let's understand why is it so important. Search engine algorithms ranking factor and the tactics are constantly changing. And parallelly the general concord is that the trustworthiness, relevance 
and authority that an effective off page SEO can afford still plays a drastic role in the page ability to rank. Links are very important to make your website rank on the SER piece. So having links which are namely inbound and outbound links in your website could just increase your chance of ranking on the first page on Google. To make sure that your content rank there should be proper visibility to your website. Often websites don't rank because of off page SEO guys. This is due to the absence of link building social media videos and blogs. So this is exactly why you need off page SEO. Now moving ahead. Let's take a look at the link and non link related off page factors. So backlinks are the heart of off page SEO guys search engines like Google and many more make use of backlinks as certain indicators for good quality content. Backlink are also the most critical part of off page SEO. So for this purpose you can make use of SEO tools like Ahrefs, SEMrush and so on. So Ahrefs is one such tool that has a backlink checker which will help you in understanding how to create backlinks and to handle them. Now when I say link I'm talking about the links that are present on the page connecting it to the other website. So I'll mainly be talking about the three links natural links manually built links and self created links as the name suggests natural link is something which is created naturally and manually built link are the ones which you want to rank or you want to link it to and self created links are anchor tags. The major factors which influences these links are the linking sites popularity the freshness of the link the proper usage of anchor text or anchor tags authority of linking domain and the website. Now how exactly link building is done. One of the most effective and the most popular ways of dealing with off page SEO is link building. Here we have the concept of votes which help in gathering the ranking position of your competitors and your company. So there are many ways through which you can include a links guys and a few notable ones are in your blogs. You can always have articles pointing to your website. Getting traffic from other medium like guest blogging and so on is very important and also it is going to help you get recognized in the field of digital marketing and also help have exposure to the current market trends. Another way is comment link. One way to achieve more customer engagement is by solving their problems and guiding them right. So always have the chance of linking your content in the comment section. Article distribution is also another factor which influences link building. This is another way of getting more traffic to your website. Content marketing deals with creating videos and writing blogs. These business articles are not just composed of fancy words but also contain the thirst for getting more traffic and good leads. So you should be able to distribute your content right to the right people via the right medium. Now talking about anchor text which is also used for creating links of a page. Anchor text is a visible and clickable text in a hyperlink. These are the links that you can find in any article when they're linking to another web page. It is often blue and is underlined text guys. So anchor tags look something like this. So these anchor text is used by the search engines to show how the reflection of how your audience view your website. The anchor was used in the previous HTML specifications and now it is used as a, a element. And also you can see this anchor text in our blogs guys. If you closely observe the blogs you'll be able to find a few topics put up in the beginning and we'll be linking those to the position where the topic starts. So these are called the anchor tags on the page and also you have links right. Those links are going to help you to navigate to another web page or another site right. So these are called anchor tags or anchor text. Now moving on we'll take a look at the non link related off page SEO. These factors have a lot more influence on your traffic compared to the ones you've got without SEO or social marketing. The few notable ones among the non link related off page SEO are social media marketing guest blogging linked and unlinked brand mentions influencer marketing and so on. Also do note this guys that the net result of each of the activities on your website is to somehow create a reference to your site from elsewhere on the web. Reference here refers to the link a mention of your brand or your website over the internet. Now focusing on the backlinks part let's understand what exactly backlinks are. Backlinks are also called as inbound links or incoming links. 
These are created when one website is linked to another. The link to an external website is often called as a backlink. Google and other major search engines consider backlinks as votes for a specific web page. It means that the page with a higher number of votes will rank higher on the search engine result pages. Like say for example, if I have liked a post from X on Instagram, I share that corresponding post on my profile and my followers will click on the post that I share. This is actually going to create a backlink to the post from X. It means here I'll not only be including the post from X, but I'll also be getting more views and clicks because I shared one of the top posts from X. It's a win win situation here guys. So why exactly do you need backlinks? Backlinks are important to make sure that the audience know about your business. Also look out for people to find more sources of information on the same or related topics. So how do you create backlink? Write a lot of guest posts, build a good public rapport, also helps in reducing broken links. So what is on-page SEO? On-page SEO is basically a practice of optimizing individual web pages to rank higher on the search engine result pages. This signifies that you will be optimizing both content and the corresponding HTML source code. And the best part about this is it generates effective traffic onto your website. Now talking about the stats related to on-page SEO, in 2019 Google accounted for close to 75% of all search traffic. 67 of all clicks go to the top 5 organic search results. 93% of Google traffic is based on HTTP sites. 36% professionalists think title tags are more important and 42% of SEO practices are carried out by internal and external links. Now, so why exactly do you need off-page SEO? What is the major importance for having on-page SEO? Internet marketing has grown to its peaks in recent days and most of them have shifted their focus from social media, email marketing to SEO practices. Having an SEO team in your organization has become a necessity rather than a requirement. Some people think SEO is dead, but the reality is completely different guys. SEO is more active and also is helping out a lot lately. Until you optimize your content present on the page, you cannot push it to appear on the search engine result pages. The more your website ranks higher, the more is the traffic and also the sales. Also with an estimate of 46 billion reaches across the globe, digital marketing is sliding towards programmatic advertising and more than 85% of ads would be automated. This means time management is sorted and also less workforce. So in order to make your website look appealing and wonderful, on-page SEO is required. What are the on-page ranking factors? No matter how good your content is, it wouldn't rank higher if you don't include the SEO techniques. Ranking your website higher on the SERPs is a task in hand, guys. So let's dive in further to understand the factors that influence the on-page ranking. So firstly, we have title tags. Title tags contribute a lot to your ranking on the SERPs. A title tag is basically an HTML element that simply specifies the title of your website. It is always the text displayed on the SERPs which is a clickable header. So what's the point of having a title tag? Why is it used? Title tags are the first impression of your organization. It is a way a viewer looks at your website. Majorly, title tags are used in SERPs. This is because the audience can view your content on the search engines. Also, it is used in web browsers to save your content from getting more results related to the keyword that you're using and also social media network. It gives you a proper recognition in the social network. So I'll show you guys how exactly title tags look like. So I'm going to search for Edureka. Yeah, so this is a title tag guys. This thing. Yeah, over here. This is a title tag. Even this is a title tag. All right. You can see that how the title tag is visible to the viewers. You can add your corresponding keyword in the title and include the same in your page content as well. So always make sure you have the title tags lens checked. Don't over add the keywords in the SEO title and always have unique title guys. Do not try to copy anybody's title or do not try to implement the same which has worked for your competitors. 
add important keywords at the beginning of the title and branding your business is very much important and always add your company's name or your organization's name at the end of the title okay so let me show you why exactly it is required if i see edureka blog yeah you can see that reviews this goes along with the name of the company it is edureka and if i check or if i click on any of the blogs okay let's say digital marketing itself or if i search for digital marketing tutorial okay if i go in search of this and if i try to find so this is the title tag guys but as a title is a little too lengthy you cannot find the name of the company over here so let me show you another blog i'll go for selenium actions class yeah you can see that uh, this is popping up over here and also you can see the name of the company over here so this is how you can brand yourself and also the second important factor which influences the page ranking factor are using headers headers are used to drive more attention to the topic that you will be discussing so these are basically used to highlight a particular topic like say if i open this blog and if i scroll down these are called the anchor text or anchor tags i come here yeah so these try to get more attention or grasp more attention of your viewers thinking that this is the header so the topic starts from here right now the page content now the third perspective or the third important major factor is the page content creating a very impressive content and adding out of the box ideas to improvise your website is definitely going to help the audience know about your business and the quality of content you create linking another article or website is going to benefit you as well as the external post so even backlinks drive a quite a lot of traffic onto your website and internal and external links also help your page to rank higher so you can see here i've linked selenium web driver over here so if i click it is going to navigate to another web page which is of the same company okay so this is an internal link guys so it is necessary to create content that has your keyword included and also try to include them wherever you can but do not overdo and stuff your keyword add relevant images to include the keyword in the all text okay so you can see that there are images over here like say if i open digital marketing itself you can see i've added related videos and images and also internal and external links see this is exactly how you can include or generate possible attention of your customers also do note this guys a sample template or any of your articles that you're writing should contain a minimum of 300 to 1200 words in the article also try to use more images in the content a minimum of 3 to 10 images can be added highlighting the subheadings is a must try to make it more attentive and grasping and crisp linking is a must so add corresponding internal and external links to your content sort out your content and try to make a table out of it as it drives more attention of your viewers so this was about the three important factors that influences the on page ranking factors now moving on let's take a look at the, uh, the insights about on page seo so the first major factor would be research before building your content try to analyze and build a storyline of what you want to convey then categorize them in a genuine manner and elaborate them look at how other websites that are ranking on crp have pitched in their content and try to implement them in a better way add relevant images and know what images to add and where proper usage of keywords is also pretty important guys so don't try to stuff your keyword until you want to use shortcuts like black hat seo for making your website rank so research a lot about the stats that justify whatever you're working on another important factor or a proper insight would be keyword analysis keywords are the building blocks of your content so so the more you focus on your keyword the more content you can add and more involving the website would be So search on Google for search synonyms so as you can concentrate on the synonyms of your keyword also and do add suggested keywords the more you can get all keywords under a single roof the more you can rank on these keywords 
So on the whole having on page SEO can help you promote your product as well as be socially active on platforms like Facebook Instagram Twitter LinkedIn and so on. So moving on to the next part of the session. Let's take a look at the best tricks and practices of on page SEO. Okay. So on page SEO is a bit tricky and requires a lot of attention. So having some idea about a few easy ways will definitely be your savior. So the first trick would be breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs are the links that help you in tracking the path from the page that the user is currently viewing. These are the ones that appear near the top of the page and reflect the structure of your website. So why do you need breadcrumbs? Why is it important and how do these affect SEO? Let's understand how. Let's talk about the usability first. So breadcrumbs helps users not only trace their path, but also help them giving similar pages. These help in minimizing the negative factors that decrease the bounce rate of your website. It helps the users to understand the layout, enables them to scan through your website and helps provide better understanding of your content. So how to use breadcrumbs to improve on page SEO? Make use of breadcrumbs only when they are necessary. Place them at the top of your web page and always start from the home page and proceed further with the consecutive pages. Try not to link to the current page and style them to make them look appealing, but not the center of attraction. Your breadcrumbs are your secondary navigation guys, so they should never be placed in the primary navigation and do include a full navigation path in your breadcrumbs. Skipping a level can confuse the user, so don't try to do that. Do not try to use breadcrumb in the title as it drives more attention and people can get confused. So the next one would be meta description. A meta description is an HTML tag. This holds an overview of what you want to convey to your customers or prospects. Meta description of any article or any blog which you write looks something like this. Okay, let me show you guys. Yeah, this is a meta description of any website or any article guys. Optimizing this with the target keyword is a task and also should be of a length ranging up to 155 characters. So you can see the characters are more so it is not showing the entire thing over here. All right. Now the next one is images and all text as far as your content matters corresponding images also tend to drive more traffic to your website more specifically add keywords in the alt tags. This will help your images rank on the search engines and all tag is very essential in the name of an image. All images should use appropriate alt tags for the images. Not only are all tags good for search engines, but they are also good for accessibility and also use dash between the words that you're going to be adding onto your alt tag. Try to reduce the usage of an underscore guys. All right. So let me show the images for this as well. If I go search for images here, yeah, you can see that this is ranking over here. So th this also has Edureka in it. So yeah, this is exactly how you can make your images also rank on the search engines. Now talking about the best practices of using on page SEO, add your focus keyword always in the beginning and always have a unique title and a description. Do not try to copy the title or the description of the blog or the article that you're writing. Try to include the keyword in the URL. Always do this guys and optimize your sheet loading page. Try to make it short. Try to make it less and always have corresponding inbound and outbound links. Like I mentioned links play a major role in shaping your website. So do link post long content. Make sure that your content is around 1500 to 2000 words and always add images with all tags. So these are some best notable practices for using on page SEO. Let's understand the parameters to compare these two optimization techniques. So I've noted down a few points or few parameters based on which I'll be comparing both these SEO techniques. Firstly, I'll compare them based on the agenda and then the goal. And then we'll talk about the strategy which they use and which one has more weight. Is it on page or off page? Which one is used the most? Okay. And also finally, I'll compare them based on the result generation. How can you measure the results on both these optimization techniques? So let's compare these both based on the parameters that are mentioned. 
So the main agenda of on-page SEO describes the changes that can be made to your website. This includes the copy, page title, meta description, header tags, and HTML code. Whereas off-page SEO's agenda is relating to any other SEO practices that occur outside your website. It includes link building, social media marketing, and influencer marketing. Now, what is the goal of using on-page and off-page SEO? I can see the common agenda for this is generating traffic and getting noted on the Google search engine. Each technique has a different goal of its own. So on-page SEO mainly deals with driving relevant traffic to your website. It is intended to make it easier for visitors and search engines to understand the nature of your website as well as navigate the content and the structure corresponding to it. Whereas off-page SEO helps to improve your website's overall authority. This off-page SEO is designed to improve the overall authority of your website and help build your reputation as a valuable resource to other users. So this is exactly how they differ based on their goal. Like I mentioned, the common goal is to drive more traffic and generate possible leads. But you can see that the goal of on-page SEO is slightly different to that of off-page SEO. And talking about the strategy which these techniques follow, on-page SEO basically deals with research, best practices, and competitor analysis. It is always driven by researching proper and relevant keyword to your audience and the latest best practices for compliance with the search engine algorithms, as well as using a content gap analysis to see which keywords your competitors are using in order to rank on the search engines. Whereas SEO follows the strategy of backlink research, social media, and influencer marketing. Off-page SEO deals with backlink research tools. It also helps you get the insight of where your audience are present on social media and help find the top writers, bloggers, and publishers onto your field. Okay, so this is a strategy which both of these optimizations follow. Now the next one is which weighs more? Do you think on-page SEO comes in handy or off-page SEO? Let's find this out. On-page SEO should be the first point of focus as it is more controllable and sets a solid foundation for engaging and converting traffic that comes from backlinks and other off-page tactics. Whereas off-page SEO should be prioritized once on-page optimization or on-page SEO takes place and you're confident about your website and also you can please your visitors as well as the search engine. Okay, so this was about which one weighs more. I think on-page has a lot of capacity to drive more traffic onto your website rather than off-page, but also you should not forget about the off-page SEO tactics as well. Just because people get to see what is present on the screen doesn't mean people who don't know about your content should not get to know about it. So backlinking is also necessary. Off-page SEO is also necessary for your business growth. Now talking about the last parameter that is results. How long do the results take to show an effect? On-page SEO takes more time to register with the search engines as new or updated pages must be crawled and indexed again before their impact is felt in the ranking. So this will take a lot of time guys. Uh, even in our case when we write blogs, they just don't show up at the first page as soon as we publish them. It will take its time. You need to push it. You need to promote the product. You need to market your product right. Only when this is done, you're going to get proper results. And talking about off-page SEO, off-page SEO has a lot of potential to move the needle faster as you can leverage the power of domains that already have high authority and influencers with a wide audience. So once you know that the content is created, once you know that your on-page SEO is perfect, you can go for off-page SEO to make this on-page SEO rank. So it is in your hands as to which one you should focus more. Generally, both on and off-page solutions are implemented to improve the search engine placement. But Google ranks your website for search and the two most important signals they use are high quality page content and link building. 
So this reflects the shared value of your on page and off page SEO and the combination of these both in the marketing field would change your career or would change your fate. Okay, so focus on both of these. I would say if you are into digital marketing. So this was the major difference between on page and off page SEO. What exactly is Yoast SEO? Now Yoast SEO is basically a WordPress SEO plugin which helps you basically get more visitors from Google and Bing, attract more visitors from social media and increase your readers engagement on your WordPress site. Just out of the box, WordPress is actually a pretty well optimized content management system. A basic setup can provide a very strong foundation even without any extensive customization, theme optimization and plugins. That said, there are a few things you should do to increase your chances of ranking, refine your workflow and make sure your website is perfectly optimized by putting the right basic settings in place and applying a few simple tools and techniques. You can ensure that you have a strong foundation on which to build upon. But why Yoast SEO to be precise? Yoast SEO improves your website using three perspectives. Firstly, you have your technical features of Yoast SEO. Now, if technical SEO isn't your strong suit, what I'm going to say is not exactly going to make sense to you. But do not worry, Yoast SEO exists to make sure that you don't have to know all of these things. Now, the plugin settings are very sensible by default, and the configuration wizard also guides you through the steps to get your technical SEO settings right. This means that by simply installing the plugin and following the steps in your wizard, you're already fixing a lot of important technical SEO things for your website. That way, you don't have to know about the technical things such as robots.txt, clean permalink URLs, HT access files, and sitemaps. The plugin will take care of these things for you. Furthermore, Yoast SEO also makes sure your site has canonical URLs to avoid duplicate content, a valid schema.org structured data implementation, a no index or non follow option for every page open graph tags for every page or article, etc, etc. Since the 11.0 release, Yoast SEO also builds a full structured data graph for every post or page on your website. By graph, I mean it's a complete piece of structured data with well-defined connections to all the different parts. So search engines now not only know what all the parts mean, but also how they all fit together. If you're a bit more familiar with technical SEO, you might enjoy reading more about Yoast's hidden technical features that secretly level up your SEO. Now the second thing, Yoast SEO improves your content SEO. Once your plugin is installed and configured, it's time to get started with your content. What is important to remember is that the plugin helps you with your rankings, but it still relies on your content. This means that you have to create good content for the right keywords. After you've done your keyword research, you'll have to start optimizing the pages and posts on your sites for the keywords and the key phrases that you want to rank for. To do that, you can set a focus key phrase for an article in Yoast SEO and then the plugin uses your content SEO analysis to determine how your content scores on different ranking factors such as how many times you use your key phrase, the length of your text, whether you used any internal links or not, so on and so forth. With this analysis, the plugin is able to tell you how you can optimize your post or page to rank with that particular key phrase. And it does this by using these red, orange and green bullets to indicate how every factor scores. It also gives you suggestions on how to improve on those factors. This gives you an easy overview of the overall score and what you can still tackle to increase your rankings. And finally, Yoast SEO improves your readability. Now, optimizing your content to rank with the right key phrase is important, but don't forget your reader. Even if you write amazing content for search engines, your audience won't benefit from it if they don't understand it. When a person doesn't understand your content, the chance of them buying something from you is close to zero. The same is true for the odds of them sharing one of your articles with their friends. So you need to make sure that your content is not just accurate, but also easy to understand. 
and that's where readability as a feature comes in. Yoast's SEO readability features are well researched analysis that give you feedback on how to optimize your writing. Now, this may sound strange because the way you write can be extremely personal. Now, let me explain how this works. The plugin uses an algorithm to check your content on different factors that are proven to increase readability. It looks at the use of transition words, use of active passive voice, your sentence and paragraph lengths, bullet points, and much more. Yoast has a carefully crafted algorithm to make sure it's as accurate as possible without being too constrictive and strict. This means you're able to adopt the feedback in a way that suits you and your content. But your blog or your article will still have your own personal tone of voice. So in this section, you basically understand what Yoast SEO can do for your site. To sum it up, it basically improves your technical SEO by taking care of a lot of technical things in the background. Secondly, it helps you improve your content SEO by helping you set a key phrase and telling you exactly how you can optimize your content to rank on this particular key phrase. And lastly, the Yoast SEO plugin helps you improve the readability of your content by providing feedback that you can easily incorporate into your own writing style. I hope now you have some insight about the Yoast plugin and what it can do for you. It also has two versions, which is a free version of the plugin and a premium version of the plugin to make sure you're not missing out on the features that will give you the top position in rankings. So you can have a look at each of them and decide which suits you the best. Moving on, let's look at how can you freshly install and set up the Yoast SEO plugin. And the simplest way to do that is to log into your WordPress website. And when you're logged in and looking at your dashboard, you can click on the plugins on the left hand side and you will see a menu. There you can search for Yoast SEO, install the plugin and activate it and you're done. Now that's the easy part. After the fresh install of the Yoast SEO on your WordPress website, you need to take care of all the little things that you should configure in the Yoast SEO, things that you might forget in your eagerness to get started with your newly set up website. For that, you have the Yoast SEO configuration wizard. Of course, you want to jump right in and configure the plugin using that Yoast SEO configuration wizard. And once you've installed the Yoast SEO plugin, you'll see a notification in your general dashboard. Now, the configuration wizard basically helps you configure your site to have the optimal SEO settings. If it's detected that you have not finished this wizard yet, you would be recommended to start the configuration wizard to configure your Yoast SEO. Now understand that if this isn't the first time you're using your configuration wizard, you'll still find a link to run the wizard again, but the message instead will say, want to make sure your Yoast SEO settings are still okay? Open the configuration wizard again to validate them. All right, so now moving on to the wizard. Once you've opened the wizard, you're going to be guided through the steps via a few questions. If you answer these, you'll implement the right settings for your website based on the specificity of your answers. Now this will be done in eight steps. The first one will ask you, is your site ready to be indexed? The first question determines whether you want your site to be indexed or not. The reason you are asked is that one of the most important checks in your plugin determines whether Google can index your site or not. Google needs to be able to reach your website and index it unless you don't want that. And there could be good reasons why you might not want that. Perhaps you're working on a development site or a staging server or just don't want the public to see your site as yet. If that's the case, no problem. Just set your preference in the first step of the wizard and then click on next to continue. The next question would be what kind of site do you have? In the next step, you will be asked about the type of site you have. It could be a blog or an online shop or might even be a new site or a portfolio. One of the reasons you are asked this question is because it's essential for you to take a moment and think about this. What is your site about? Having a clear idea of this will help you focus on what's important for you and your site. So let's take edureka.co as an example. So you have multiple sections in the website. You have the courses, the community and the blogs, right? In the blogs, we share knowledge about various different technologies. And then you have the community where we help our learners with troubleshooting questions they have. 
and our courses on all the newest trending technologies. Now, all of these parts of the websites are equally important. Sharing knowledge is the main goal. So decide for yourself what your answer to the question should be. That will make it easier for you to configure several features in the Yoast plugin and in fact off your website later. As plugin developers, the information we get from this question is also useful for future improvements. For instance, it can help you prioritize future additions to our plugin for specific types of sites. Third question is, is it for you or an organization? For the right metadata, Yoast asks you to choose between organization and individual here. Is your website about you or an organization you represent? Now, if you're a person, you might want to include your name and if you're a company, you can add the name and the logo. This information will be included in the metadata of your website with the goal to provide Google with the right information for their knowledge graph. The knowledge graph, as I had previously mentioned, is a block of information you see on the right hand side of your search results. For instance, when you do a company search like Sony or Apple, in addition to the name of the company, you are also asked to let Yoast know which social profiles you have. Again, you can provide Google with the right information for their knowledge graph here. Google seems to be keen on delivering answers to their visitors right away. So you'd better make sure your information is on Google. With socials being a part of the knowledge graph and your website being linked on the social profile pages, make sure to fill this out as completely as possible. Step 4. To show or not show posts and pages. Now the description in the image is pretty clear. This is where you can set posts and pages to be hidden or visible for the search engine. If you already know that you don't want posts on your site to show up in your search results, you can set this to no. Question 5 or step 5 would be how many people are publishing content on your site? Basically, do you have multiple authors or not? Basically, what the developers of Yoast SEO want to know here is that if your website has multiple authors. Now, there's a reason for that. When your site only has one author, WordPress will still generate author pages. And if you write all the content on your blogs and articles yourself, your blog page will show the exact same collection of posts as your author page, which indeed is duplicate content. Now, an SEO plugin like Yoast calls something duplicate content when the majority of a page is the same as the content on another page. Google will get confused on this. It won't know what page to rank first and might decide to rank both a bit less. This might cost both of your contents a lot of engagement. You obviously want to prevent that, right? So to guide it, this particular check was added to the Yoast SEO configuration wizard. Now the next part is optimizing your page title. Now in this step, the wizard asks you to think about your branding. The website name you enter here is the name that your default page title template will put at the end of each page title. The default page title template looks like this picture and the last part of the template is a site name and that's what you fill out here. Now be sure to add it, keep it short and make sure that the focus will be on the page or the post title. It's nice to have something of your branding in here so people will recognize your pages in the search result pages and if they already know who you are and your website, they're more likely to click on one of your links. The third party of the template is the separator, which is SCP. A page title that follows this template could be some title of a post. The hyphen in there is the separator you set at the step in the Yoast SEO configuration wizard. And using an uncommon separator might make you stand out from your competitors in the search result pages. You could also choose to pick the smaller separators to squeeze in another character or two. Next and the penultimate step is to boost your SEO efforts even more. In the next step, the good folks at Yoast would like to draw your attention to the newsletter plus some of their awesome products. So go ahead and if you think these are absolutely essential to kickstart your SEO journey, you can try them, else you can just let them be. And finally, step 8 marks your success because you've done all the steps before and have one goal now, which is to prepare you and your website for SEO. But while this wizard helps you get 
the general settings of your plugin right, your job optimizing your content is far from done. To use the Yoast SEO plugin to its full potential, you should definitely understand how it works and which settings are which. Luckily, you have this tutorial to help you with that. So now you know why you should give the Yoast SEO configuration wizard a spin and why it asks certain questions to you. The wizards basically got you covered by setting things correctly under the hood for your website so you can just focus your efforts on optimizing your content without worrying about all these background details. So now that you've set up your Yoast SEO plugin completely, let's move on to using the Yoast SEO sidebar or Metabox. Now, Yoast SEO is most famous for its green, orange and red bullets, giving you feedback on the SEO friendliness of your content. Now, back in the days, you'd just find these in the Yoast SEO meta box below the post editor. Nowadays, you find them as a sidebar as well, if you're using the block editor on WordPress. So basically, there are four essential elements of highlight that you will find in both SEO meta box and the SEO sidebar. One is your focus key phrase, second, your readability analysis, third, your SEO analysis, and finally, the Google preview. When you write a post or a page for your website, checking these four elements should be the bare minimum you do before publishing a post. If you want to fully optimize a post, you can follow the steps that I shall be going over in a while. So first of all, you have your focus key phrase, which is the first field in the Yoast SEO sidebar and the meta box. So this is what my blog looks like. And I'm using the Yoast SEO premium. And the first element we're going to look at is the focus key phrase. As you can see, the top 10 trending technologies in 2021 is my focus key phrase. And it is also the first field in the Yoast SEO sidebar or the meta box. In this field, you can either enter the phrase you like your post to rank in for search engines. You can select a key phrase on a post by post basis, but if you're serious about your rankings, you'd better carry out a keyword research first, right? Now the Yoast SEO premium allows you to set related keywords as well. Bottom here, add related key phrase. Using this option, you can go ahead and add related key phrases to your key phrase. Nowadays, you really need user focused and high quality content rank high in a competitive market and this definitely helps next is your readability analysis now after setting a focus key phrase and writing your text it is best to check the readability of your copy this is the second tab over here and yoast provides you a convenient readability analysis it helps you check whether your paragraphs are too long do you use a lot of passive voice in your text? Do you use enough subheadings? These are all the elements that make or break the readability of your copy. And readability is crucial for SEO. Now, if you are going to write website content, you need to understand that online and offline writing are two different things. While we take the time to sit down and write great stories in books or the articles in magazines, we tend to quickly scan and process and use the things that we read online. So this post isn't a page in a book. You need to understand that very clearly in your head. It's information to you to process like most online pages are, like Wikipedia per se. And Yoast has written its readability analysis with that purpose in mind. If the bullet is green, like you can see here, you're doing great on that subject. If it's orange or red, like it's here, you can follow the instructions that follow the bullet and you can also click on this eye icon which will just highlight places with those mistakes. You can use the eye icon and it will highlight areas which need improvement in purple. Next you have your SEO tab, your SEO analysis. After you've checked the readability of your copy, it's time to look at the SEO friendliness of it. So remember the focus key phrase that you've set the SEO analysis basically evaluates how well your content is optimized to rank for that specific key phrase. For instance, it checks whether you've used the key phrase enough number of times and if you've distributed them evenly. It also checks whether you've used your key phrase in the introduction, your key phrase in meta description and your key phrase in title. 
It should be present in your title, meta description, images, subheadings, so on and so forth. Moreover, this also checks the other SEO aspects of your content that are not related to your key phrase. For example, if you have internal links or not, right? Now, a lot of you might wonder, do all of these bullets need to be green for your post to be well optimized? The answer is no. Not every bullet in your SEO analysis has to be green for your post or page to rank. Similarly, getting your post all green in no way guarantees that it will rank. While it's tempting to simply aim for all green bullets on every post or page without working on other aspects of your SEO, that isn't the best SEO strategy. Proper keyword research and site structure always come before getting these green bullets. So keep that in mind while you're optimizing your work. And the final thing I want to talk about here is the Google preview, as you can see here. Now, in addition to the checks, Yoast also provides you an editable snippet or Google preview in the meta box, right? You can click here on edit snippet and you can change the SEO title, meta description and the slug, right? The snippet preview, which you would have seen before, basically shows you how Yoast plugin displays your page to Google and other search engines. In other words, it basically gives us an idea of how your site would appear in the Google search results page. So here, like I said, you can set an SEO title and meta description. Try and make an effort and write a title and meta description that clearly reflects what your post or page is about, like I have done here. Let people know that they'll find what they're looking for on your site and entice them to visit your site or page. There's no guarantee that Google will display your meta description in the results pages. But if the meta description you add here is very good, it will definitely increase the odds. Now, apart from that, there are a few other items in the sidebar and meta box, but we believe that this is the minimum investment you should make when publishing a post via WordPress. As you can see, there are a few other things here, but we are not going to look at them today. Now, a bit more advanced, I want to talk to you about the Yoast dashboard. Now, of course, there is much more you can do with Yoast SEO. You can access and change many settings of the plugin in the Yoast dashboard, but there's usually no need to change anything at all. Especially if you're an inexperienced user, it's kind of wise to stick to the settings you set in the configuration wizard. But let me just give you a brief look around to give you an idea of what the options are. So this is something I want to talk about, which is the search appearance. Now, if you go to the search appearance option, which is usually on the left hand side navigation in your WordPress dashboard, you can basically adjust how your site appears in search engines. Take the title separator, for instance, in the configuration wizard, you can choose whether you want a dash asterisk pipe or something else. Like you must have noticed most of our YouTube and blog contents have a pipe separator. Some people might have a hyphenated separation and some people might have something else. You can always change it here. In your search appearance, you can change among other things, how your plugins are set up, your titles and metas, your content types where you'll be able to find the default template that you're going to use for your post titles. It's always good to know it's there and realize what you can or cannot configure. It simply means that you're basically going to use the title of your page or the post as the page title and then add the page number if your post is divided over multiple pages. Then you're going to go ahead and add the title separator, which we just discussed, and then the site name you have set while creating your site. So in this setup, the title basically looks like this. Now understand that this example does not include a page number after the page title as this post is just one page. So this is the setup we recommend. It's focused on the page title and has the proper branding at the end, which is Edureka. The reason that I've drawn your attention to this setting is that you should know it's there. So you don't have to look for it in other tools in the future. This is why your titles are shown like this in Google searches. Moving on. Many of us log into our site every day or at least once a week. But if you're managing a small business or a one person blog, you can't always spend a lot of time on your SEO. You have many other things to do. 
Hence, before concluding this session, we are going to discuss several small yet impactful things you should try to work on a daily or weekly basis to keep your SEO on track. Firstly, have a long term SEO strategy. Before we dive in into daily and weekly SEO tasks to work on, we should stress the importance of having a long term SEO strategy. While it's good to have a list of quick SEO tasks, make sure you keep an eye on the bigger picture. You should Base your strategy on extensive keyword research, look at search intent, set goals, and analyze how your site is doing holistically. Now, holistic SEO is a lot of work, but it'll definitely pay off in the end. On days you only have about an hour to spend on your site, consider tackling one of these tasks. First of all, make sure your content always stays fresh. Content is important to rank, which is why you should aim to regularly add new content to keep existing up to date. Either writing and publishing new content or updating existing content is something that should be a part of everyday website optimization. You don't have to publish a new post every day. Just try to stick to a schedule of publishing that's realistic for you. If you publish a new post every Wednesday, for example, your audience will in time look forward to it on Wednesdays. Odds are, you will also have lots of valuable articles lying around that only need a small update before they can be published again. If you don't have the time to write a new article, it's useful to have a list of posts like this and work on those as your daily SEO task. A task that's also related to keeping your content fresh and alive. If you get a lot of comments on your blog post, try to regularly interact with the comments. If you don't reply to their comments, people can feel ignored and it doesn't really look good to have a load of unanswered comments on your content pages either. Work on your internal linking structure. Working on a good internal linking structure is like rolling out the red carpet for Google. But as your site keeps growing, you should also continue improving that internal linking structure. One of the things to keep an eye out for every time you look at your post overview is an orphaned content. It's such a waste having a content that doesn't get any links from your other posts or pages as those contextual links add much value. Have a hard time finding often content? The Yoast plugin is here to help. After installing it, there's no need to open every post to see which internal links you've added already. Simply use the filter in the post overview to locate often content and add relevant links. Another thing to incorporate into your daily SEO efforts is linking to your cornerstone content. Ideally, you should add links to relevant cornerstone content when you're updating or publishing articles. But just to make sure you haven't forgotten any cornerstones, check your most recent posts and make sure they include links to relevant cornerstones. Keep your site maintenance on track. Most of you will agree that it's better to do a bit of a cleaning every day rather than waiting for a house to become a huge dirty mess. It's the same for your website. Don't wait until the number of the pages have become unmanageable. Stay on top of things. And that is a good advice for everything in life in general. One way to do that as a part of your everyday SEO is to look out for cannibalizing your content. Since you're already making sure you regularly publish or republish content, it's only a little bit extra effort to ensure that you're not competing with other existing content on your site. Unfortunately, too much of a good thing such as quality content can still cause problems. So take some time to ensure your content isn't repeating itself. If you come across two articles on a similar topic from a similar point of view, consider combining them into one. You can easily do this using a Yoast duplicate post. It allows you to make a clone of a post so you can easily take your time to merge both the posts in a new draft. Then when you're done, you can copy and paste the new content in the post you'd like to keep and redirect the other one. Similarly, on the same context, don't keep unnecessary pages around. Regularly factor in some time to check for pages that have lost their relevance and can't be updated. Delete the pages properly from your site and you'll thank yourself later. The fourth point is to work on your technical SEO. Now, many technical SEO tasks require time and expertise, but you don't need to be a part of your daily routine. Nevertheless, these are things you need to pay attention to on a regular basis. One of them is keeping the size of your images as small as possible. Having high quality images on your site is a must, but you don't want your handpicked picture to slow down your site, right? 
The loading time is of utmost importance. A quick task to add to your SEO routine. Use tools like ImageOptim or websites like JPEG Mini, JPEG.io or Kraken.io to optimize the size of your images. Another thing to be aware of is duplicate content. You're already on track if you regularly look for cannibalized content. But duplicate content can also be created accidentally. Now you don't have to do a duplicate content check every day, but you should be aware of the possibility. For instance, if you're creating a tag that applies to the exact same group of posts as another tag, or when you add a printer friendly version of your DIY post, make sure to do a duplicate content check. One final thing under this point that could be easily implemented in your routine of publishing content is to add structured data. Not every type of post is suited for rich results, but for many types of content, it can make a huge difference. Yoast SEO is not only automatically adding the most important structured data to almost every page on your site, it also makes it super easy to add structured data for how to's and FAQ pages. So if you regularly post how to's, use Yoast SEO structured data blocks to increase your chances of a rich result. If your site focuses on recipes, products, reviews, or events, you may even want to learn how to add structured data. Keep track of your analytics. Now, Google Analytics has a ton of interesting data that you can use to optimize your website. But mastering every single aspect of the Google Analytics takes a lot of time. If you don't have enough time to dive in and only have a little understanding of the analytics tool, you can spend some time once a week looking at two reports. The first is the source or medium report, which you can find in the acquisition section under the term all traffic. This basically shows you where your site's visitors are coming from. Check if you get organic traffic from search engines like Google and try to understand the data you're seeing. While sources have a high bounce rate, which sources drive the most traffic to your site? And if you look at this data every week, you will start to gather a sense of if your site's doing better than the week before. The second report that's interesting is the landing pages report that you can find in the behavior section under all pages. These pages are the very first pages people visit on your website. This is the one which gives you insight into the things your visitors are interested in. It'll basically tell you if the description of a page on Facebook or in a search result was interesting enough to make people click. Again, try to understand this data, how the bounce rate of landing pages works, it's slightly different though. It shouldn't have a high bounce rate like your homepage, for instance. And if you dare, add a secondary dimension like a source to this report so you can immediately see which pages are visited from Google. Now, if you're not comfortable with Google Analytics, Microsoft also offers a free analytics tool called Clarity. Although it is not yet at the level of Google Analytics when it comes to features, it's still a tool worth trying out and keeping an eye on for future development. Now, you're probably active on one or more social media platforms, so regularly posting updates for your followers is a great idea. Basically, it makes clear that your account is active and kicking. You can share your blog posts, but also pictures you take, events from your daily life, and other articles you find interesting, and so on. You know your audience best, and you know what they like. And while you're at it, also try to regularly interact with people leaving comments on your social media pages so you keep them engaged with your site. Now you can go ahead, give this Yoast SEO plugin a spin and honestly, it'll make a lot of things easier for you. Let's understand first concept of advertisements. I'm sure all of you must have seen uh, various forms of advertisements in several platforms. Let me take a minute here and explain you how advertisements used to work in the pre-internet era. Back before 1990s, when internet uh, was not existing properly, uh, advertisers mostly used television ads, billboards, newspaper ads, uh, radio ads, direct mails, etc. The first three options had very high entry barriers, that is, very high cost involved. And it was difficult for uh, advertisers to know the ROE exactly. For example, uh, Hindustan Unilever, which has amazing brand Lux. So when uh, in the Diwali time, HUL used to come up with TV ads, newspaper ads, several radio ads, uh, billboards, etc. So uh, at the end of the, the end of Diwali, they would 
calculate their bump up in sale sales and then they would like to understand like which which method worked for them better unfortunately there was no direct ways no which uh, which was doing better like newspaper ads did better or uh, the tv ads did better there was no way to understand who is consuming the ads so for example let's say your mom is watching mahabharat uh, back in 1990s and she is seeing a, a cigarette ad so would she relate to it probably no your dad is reading a newspaper and he is seeing a full page lux ad so would he relate to it definitely no but to summarize ads were mostly a game of companies with deep pockets higher you pay the more prime slots or front place search slots you get in the newspapers and the process was the advertisers paid money to tv or newspapers uh, books a prime time slot so next so at this point of time is note here there is no check in quality of the ads payment would depend on how prime the slot is let me quickly move to the era when internet started so the first search engine was found out found by uh, yahoo back in 1994 and it came as a directory search then within a year uh, we got a number of search engines which were competing for user attention they included magellan site infosic tommy alta vista to name a few basically end users could browse the directory also and uh, do a lot of keyword search also google came into existence in 1998 using uh, the technology you some of you might have heard is called page rank the point i am trying to make here is google came point the search engine reserve race right late it rose in prominence in leaps and bounds because of the high quality search results it provided similarly for paid advertisements also google was not the first company to start paid advertisements in search but it mastered the game by providing a amazing interface better quality ads and it also helped creating a level playing field for small and medium companies as well just understand that how Uh, advertising experience changed over the years let me give you an example of josh furniture shop previously what used to what they used to do they used to come up with newspaper pamphlets they used to get a database of people they used to call them and ask them to come to their furniture shop okay so even if they tried they could have never opted for prime in tv or radio or uh, newspaper but what changed after internet came Uh, Josh Furniture created a good website. They can they took care of some basic stuff and started search advertisements. So whenever people were searching for uh, some kind of furnitures online, Josh Furniture came to came in the search results. They came in the paid ads. The game completely changed here. Josh Furniture spent one lakh rupees in the ad in the month of June, and they got four hundred legit enquiries. which resulted in 600000 rupees of sales so roi also is clearly known here uh, please also understand that here the payment will depend on the prime slot as well as how good your ads are it is something called ad quality basically search engine provided the right information at the exact moment when people needed them along with highly related advertisements they also created a level playing field which i will explain with this basics let's move to some facts we all have seen google search right do you know how many searches uh, google processes per second 70000 searches which translates to 5.8 billion searches per day out of that like and google is not the only search engine 76% of the search engine market belongs to google so there are other search engines like bing yahoo and uh, different other search engines around the world so for paid paid search like paid advertisement the corresponding number is 73% for google so whenever people search something in uh, google they get a page which is called crp search engine result page different data says that 46% of the clicks go to the top 3 ads in the search result and 63% of the people agree that they have clicked on google ads 
and lastly google delivers a 8 is to 1 return on investment that is a dollar for every 1 dollar spent so isn't it amazing so no doubt because of all these things google has erosion in prominence let's move to the next slide let's try and understand what happens when there is a search is going on so first and foremost let's try and understand so why are search engines there for so basically search engines are there to return excellent quality and relevant organic search results to the users so search engines what they do is uh, behind the scenes they call uh, millions and millions of sites millions of web pages they crawl the data and uh, various factors into account and they decide that for each and every term that is searched in google what kind of pages are supposed to be returned so they provide an amazing organic search results and above and below the organic search results they also provide paid search so let's understand clearly here that every time uh, we are searching for something there is a paid search option happens it's a fraction of time so let's take the example of josh furniture shop once again uh, as i said first step in this is like advertisers around the world they identify the key relevant terms through research so google has provided some amazing tools like uh, keyword tool etc so the digital marketing person who is sitting in the josh furniture shop he researches a lot of uh, search terms and he decides okay these are the terms which which would get some relevant buyers for me so uh, the terms are like buy dining chairs online cheap garden furniture uh, rubber wood a coffee table buy home furniture online in bangalore so they decide that they decide that these four terms they are going to bid for simplicity of explaining let's say they bid 100 rupees in google and they they create good landing pages for each and each of, each of these uh, terms so basically when uh, an end user searches for that term or a similar term what google does is google reviews all the ads with that keyword or similar keywords and google uh, does a quick just like quality check and google narrows down the, that okay apart from the organic searches there are three good quality advertisers who had bid for this term so google assigns an ad rank to all these three advertisers so ad rank is decided by factors such as uh, bid quality bid quantity bid amount ad quality ad rank th threshold context etc so google quickly decides the ad ranks and based on the ad ranks google uh, throws the search page and uh, just understand here the whole thing takes a fraction of seconds maybe 0.25 seconds or even less so so basically google what it does is like apart from the organic search results google provides a couple of paid search results along with the organic like either above or below the fold of the organic search results i am taking the example of buy dining chairs online keyword here online option happens google calculates all the payment basis on option time quality and ad rank this is a difficult slightly difficult concept so basically let's say competitor number 1 based on the calculation provided by google Uh, competitor number one is supposed to pay 60 rupees for this auction, and remember that Josh Furniture has bid for an amount of 100 rupees. So now, according to Google's algorithms, Josh Furniture will pay just one rupee extra uh, above the competitor number one to be on the top slot. So, is understand here that Josh told Google that the 100 rupees is the maximum amount that I want to pay for this keyword. Josh pay furniture pay 61 rupees and gets the number one slot. And an important thing to understand here is the Josh furniture is not paying anything if the ads are not clicked. The organic results are clicked; they are not paying anything. So Google only charges the advertisers when when an ad is actually clicked. If you understand here correctly, there is clearly a quality factor involved. So an easier way for Google would have been. to go for the maximum bidder 
Google could have said that the one who pays me the maximum would always come in the, the top the search result. Clearly, Google does, never does that. And probably this is the differentiating factor here. Google takes care of the quality at every step. Let's quickly move to the concept of ad rank. We quickly understand uh, getting a high, getting a good ad rank is very important for advertisers. Otherwise, they will not be able to uh, come up in the search results for in front of their target customers. The higher the ad rank, better is the chance of uh, coming in the top uh, results, and hence better is the chance of uh, getting clicks. So let's understand. What are the parameters on which Google takes care of the ad rank? First thing, of course, the, bid set, the amount of bid set by the advertisers. Apart from that, this is not the only uh, thing Google is looking at. So I'll just quickly, uh, quickly uh, try to explain one thing to you all. When two people, uh, when two real people work for a bank, they ask for a home loan. Will the bank provide? Uh, the home loan to these two people at the same interest rate? The answer is no. Uh, banks will look at something like the credit score. You might have, some of you might have heard about civil scores and transunion scores, etc. So, depending on the payment history, etc., uh, there is a score assigned to each and every person on basis of which banks and financial institutions provide loans to individual users. So this is something like that. So apart from the payment part, Google will look at the ad and landing page quality. So uh, let's quickly understand how this works. So remember the search term is uh, furniture online in Bangalore. The ads and the landing page, both of all the three, the keyword, the ad and the landing page, all of them should be on the same page, should all have the same kind of messaging. Landing page should be clear, it should have a clear UI UX, it should have a good uh, page load speed, and it should have uh, clearly stating the advantages that you would have spoken on the ad. For example, if you on the ad, you have mentioned 24x7 support or free shipping for all other orders, the landing page should also speak the same language. So this is ad and landing page quality. Then comes the impact of ad extension. At this point of time, please understand that ad extensions are extra bit of information which advertisers add to complement already provided details in the uh, landing page or ad uh, messages. Then, of course, the third factor is uh, competitiveness of option. It is very clear, right? The higher, higher the number of advertisers are there, the more difficult the option becomes. Here comes the most important two factors. First, the context of search. Let's understand why these terms have come. So these things have come recently in the last few years. Because, because of the advent of various uh, devices, voice-enabled devices, search has completely changed. So Google, Google's AI engines are trying to understand uh, not only the terms that person has provided, but also the context person is in. The context is something beyond the keywords. The benefits of contextual search include helping the users get faster and more accurate results based on their queries. For example, if you are searching for Batman, if you are searching for the term Batman in, October, in the month of October, most likely you will be shown websites selling Halloween costumes because it is the time of Halloween. So, let me give you a better example which you all can relate. So let's say you are already you have already gone to Goa, and you are searching for top Goa restaurants from your mobile phone in your 4G connection. Versus, you are sitting in your home at Gurgaon, uh, Haryana, and you are using your home Wi-Fi laptop and searching for Goa restaurants. These two are completely different contexts, and in all probability, the search page and the ads, all of them would be very different here. The last there is ad rank threshold. So, in clear language ad rank threshold is the reserve price for your ad. In the, in the previous slide, I had explained that Google will charge you just one rupee extra 
uh, in comparison to your previous uh, competitor right that is a ba very basic explanation i gave you the actual calculation is a uh, little bit different so let's understand here like maybe there, there is a situation where uh, only one advertiser is there and that advertiser advertiser does not have a good quality score also on time quality score because of the absence of other competitors he, the, that advertiser is able to show the ads in front of google people so google would not like to do that if your bid is lower than the threshold your ads will not show if your bid is lower than the ad rank threshold so let's say the if the ad rank threshold is 60 rupees and if you have bid for 50 rupees for that particular keyword your ad will never show and if none of your competitors are eligible to show the threshold price that is the reserve price is the price you pay for the click so let me move to the next slide so this is uh, in continuation with the previous slides the advertiser which gets the higher ad rank uh, they are in the number one position competitor one uh, has got a score of 5.6 so they are at number two and competitor two is at number three so let's move to quality score which is one of the most important concepts in google ads so before moving into quality score let me explain you one thing very uh, precisely google has always been very tight-lipped about uh, how is how it uses uh, its auction method Google never gives out the details. So for the first time in 2008, so Google Google Ad system started back in 2001-2002. For the first time in 2008, Google officially told that quality score plays an important factor is an as an important factor for showing Google Ads. So uh, let's understand what is quality score. Quality score is an aggregate estimate of how well a keyword has performed overall the past, past ad options so let me give you a real real life example here so when virat kohli comes to bat so you might have seen on the tv screen there will be like lot of uh, data given like how many matches virat kohli has played how many centuries he has made what is the average uh, score uh, what is the strike rate what is the what are the number of catches so quality score is similar it is a aggregate estimate so whenever a keyword comes into play google would first look at its quality score each keyword gets a quality score on a scale from 1 to 10 where 1 is the lowest score and 10 is the highest score so needless to say advertisers around the world are vying to get higher quality scores so everyone is trying to reach the quality score of 10 which is the pinnacle null quality score so generally when you put a word first like when you start an account or you start an ad quality score would in all probability will start at null quality score so it will take some time for that quality score to gather enough info enough impressions or clicks accurately de determine the quality score so google will take some time and in uh, general cases the quality score starts at number five which is the midi middle number between one to ten and let's understand the most important point here quality score is not the same as auction time ad quality it is not used at auction time to determine ad rank again quality score depends on exact match impressions for now you have to understand that quality score, score the keyword is uh, buy chairs online quality scores would depend on exact match impression and if it does not get a lot of exact match impression it might to null let's quickly understand what are the factors to determine quality score again uh, google has revealed this data so this is on black and white now but if experts are supposed to be believed there are more than 50 to 100 factors on which quality score depends so as per google first the expected click through rate so let's understand what is expected click through rate expected click through rate is a prediction and it is different from the actual click through rate or the CTR column that you will find in your account. So, unlike the actual CTR column, the status eCTR will tell how the keyword will perform both within your account and across all other website advertisers' account. 
So Google will take an aggregate understanding about how this keyword has performed across all the advertisers and provide a score to that. And this status will also be adjusted to eliminate the influence of ad positions and other factors that affect the prominence and visibility of ads, such as ad extension. And again, this will again depend on uh, exact match. So uh, expected click-through rate are given as above average, average and below average. So if you have a expected click-through rate of above average or average, status would mean that there is no major problem with your keywords. And But if you are getting a, a below average status, that means that you, you definitely should consider changing your ad text or other things to uh, improve. The second point is ad relevance. Ad relevance is how closely your ad is related to your keyword. So this is kind of a self-explanatory thing. So if you are bidding on red socks for men, if you're, so your ad should be telling about red socks for men only. You cannot tell that uh, buy socks online. So if you, if you put ad text like that, your ad relevance would be lower. If you if you create proper ad groups and create proper uh, ads for them, definitely your ad relevance will be high. Ad relevance uh, ha will have above average, average, and below average. And again, if there is a below average status, that would mean two things: your ad or keyword may not be specific enough. Your ad group may cover too many topics. So if you get a ad relevance below average. You might have to revisit your uh, Google Ads structure and you might have to create more tightly themed ad groups. Okay, the third is landing page experience. Again, I have explained it. Your keyword, your ad, ad your landing page should be the same page. They, would, they should talk about same messaging. Landing page should have good UI UX. Your landing page should have good navigability should not have a lot of pop-ups, etc., and it should have good speed score. This is how it looks like, a quality score. Uh, so depending on uh, quality score, will get some numbers like six out of 10 or seven out of 10. And uh, whenever you see a below average, uh, uh, like the quality score there is definitely a uh, like need for you to take action. So let me give you all a pro tip here from my experience. So Google AdWords is a game of Google Ads is a game of continuous uh, improvement. So you cannot create a perfect landing page and you cannot create a perfect ad and sit down on your laurels. You need to come like always reevaluate things. You'll need to always reevaluate your ads, your landing page. Always look at options to make it better. Okay. So let's understand what are the types of search queries here. So uh, search queries can be navigational, search queries can be informational and transactional. Let's try and understand what these things are. Navigational query is a search query entered with the intent of finding a particular website or web page. For example, Edureka. Now that you know that Edureka is conducting so many good quality uh, webinars, so you, you do not remember Edureka website Exactly. What you'll do is you go to Google, you will search Edureka, and you will most probably find Edureka website on the top. Similarly, this person has searched for Best Buy. So uh, he's in US, he searched for Best Buy, and he got organic search result uh, at the top. Best Buy is there. The point here to be noted is Best Buy as a company has bid for the term Best Buy because they would not like competitors should show an ad on top of the page so if best buy would not bid for this term best buy uh, a competitor like walmart or a competitor like amazon can bid on the term and come at the top for that particular search results so this is this type of search queries would have decent amount of interest from advertisers let's quickly move to the next type of search queries that is informational search queries Informational search queries are they cover broad topics such as digital marketing or Bangalore 
so there are thousands and millions of uh, websites are returned and these are generally not targeted by paid marketers because the topics are so broad uh, it would be very difficult to uh, get something out of here as marketers we should not leave it completely so what strategies we can do for uh, informational search queries is one we can write blog posts full of tips we can create how to videos we can write detailed step by step guide for example if i write a step by step guide on digital marketing so probably i'll come my page will come on the top of the search results probably design an amazing image or infographic third type and the most important type for marketers is transactional search queries transactional search query is a query that indicates an intent to complete a transaction such as making a purchase here so uh, recently i am facing a lot of problems in my laptop so i am trying to get a good laptop deal here so what i did is i went and i searched in google for buy lenovo laptop online to try and understand before typing the search queries i would have done a lot of informational search queries as well when i searched for buy lenovo laptop online what i can see is like lenovo is already at the top of uh, so here you can see that lenovo is already in the search of organic search results but uh, they wanted to make sure that the ads are also coming so they want do not want to leave the top slots and also the right side of the search result you can see the google, google shopping ads so they have also made sure that their ads are coming here as well so advertisers across the world they are trying to get the top results and top slots in front of their target customers coming back to the transactional search queries so to reiterate uh, advertisers what they do is they do text ads uh, to get above the fold visibility they go for shopping ads which gives them an extra edge because there are images and other information can be provided but the important point to note here is like they cannot neglect the seo and content marketing part so we saw uh, now in number one of the organic search results also so uh, to summarize uh, advertisers should do organic and paid efforts both to get good results in search results so let's quickly move to google ads so with google ads you get access to a broad range of advertising products designed to help you reach your target customers remember this is the important point reach your target customers in the moments that matter right so i have already explained how the moments matter so let's say you are in kurg and you are searching for a restaurant in kurg so this is a very important moment that matters for you so what you do is you do a quick google search you find a good restaurant in google maps or google ads and you visit that place you get some amazing food and you are wowed so you uh, like become a, a fan of google and that restaurant for the rest of your life so what google does is based on your business goals google does a lot of heavy lift, heavy lifting by providing wonderful technology and provide you provides you a list of tools for you and list of campaign types for your uh, goals so let me quickly move to goals so the main business goals that some most of us clearly understand uh, first is drive sales and get leads i don't think i need to explain anything to you guys because you already understand this let me quickly move to the point build awareness so i'll given i'll given a real life example here there is a friend of mine called ratnam he has a company innovative products llc so ratnam has come up with a product called garuda so garuda is a augmented reality sunglass for driving assistance so what it does is like when you wear the sunglass and it is obviously connected through 4g and probably 5g etc etc and it will provide you turn by turn navigation details will give you information about uh, what are the restaurants on the road what are uh, what is the traffic condition it will tell you okay innovative product right the purpose behind build awareness objective is to increase the amount of people that see your ad 
your business might not be a well known brand now but with the build awareness objective you are able to spread your brand across the web and in front of the people so now once you start these kind of ads uh, people will start recognizing your brand your logo and your product I quickly tell you about the theory of 16 impressions you might have probably heard it a brand uh, needs at least 13 to 16 impressions to be registered in a prospective customer's mind we do not this is all happening in subconscious right so we we uh, when we think about laptops we think about apple we think about lenovo but how do these brands have done this how did the brands have done this that is through continuous impressions needless to say uh, these type of campaigns like uh, build awareness type of campaigns will emphasize the number of impressions over the number of clicks so let's understand quickly how it works imagine you are a new business and you have just invented a new great new product for example garuda because this product has never been seen or heard before so no one is searching about it no one is searching for a virtual reality sunglass right uh, your advertisement goals uh, for this new product should be like bring it in front of a lot of people so that people understand okay such kind of product also exists so they should learn about your innovations also so the build awareness objective is a good marketing objective if you are starting a new business or have a new product which is not widely known to the people also it is a good example if you are expanding your business to a new area or introducing customer to what you offer as a new business goal for you another example for it can be let's say there is a popular uh, south indian restaurant called chutneys in hyderabad and it is expanding to the city of amritsar which is popularly the city of parathe and chole kulche so they are going to uh, the city of amritsar they need to create an awareness in front of the people uh, that such kind of food habits can also be there okay let me quickly move to the next uh, next uh, topic that is influence consideration so consider influence consideration as the next step to build awareness now that you have built awareness on the innovative product garuda this is the next step so uh, it is called it is like moving a step ahead in the buyer decision making funnel remember idas i'll not get into details of idas now basically how it works the influence consideration objective includes something called in market audience targeting and engagement ads so in market audience are consumers who are actively researching comparing products across the google display network let me give you an example of my case so as i told you my laptop has started giving problems okay i have started searching to buy a new laptop i do a lot of search on digital marketing i am a tech enthusiast i check out whatever new products are coming in google regular basis i love driving i do online shopping a lot i love driving to new places staying in hotels etc etc also i invest in stock markets and mutual funds so without me knowing google has collected all this data about me and google has put me into 10 different sets of in market audience or i not get into technicals but basically you just need to understand the term audience so does that mean that google has given my name Vijit Panda to these people, to my advertisers across the world. No, so Google has anonymously created list of audiences where these kind of people are there. So imagine uh, I'm Lenovo. Okay, so I need to uh, show my laptop ads to people. So now Lenovo knows that I am the in-market audience of buying a laptop, probably. So Lenovo will start showing me ads in the Google Display Network. So these kind of engagement ads gives customers more information about your business. So basically, uh, through these kind of ads, you can display your uh, product information in front of thousands of people who are target customers. So influence consideration objective is for businesses. who have to differentiate from similar products of their competition this feature allows you to educate your customers about your specific product 
service in order for them to understand why they should be buying from you so you are creating a differentiating factor for yourself to this uh, the fifth business goal is promote your app we are talking about uh, the google the types of google ads here search ads search ads i don't have anything much to explain any more because more, a lot of it has already been covered in the past few slides so google search ads appear on google search network so google search network is not only the google site it is a group of search related websites so your ads can show near the search results when someone searches uh, with comes related to one of your keywords and what are the types of ads in the search network so they are text ads dynamic search ads all only ads shopping ads image and video ads so let me quickly move down to the next slide google search network the google search network comprises of not only google search also google play a store uh, google shopping so it is like if you do not know it is google.com/shopping is then there is google image and google maps also google app google maps app is also there and uh, let's understand about non google sites as well so there are a lot of non google sites also in google search networks who have a search functionality in, embedded in their website so for text ads uh, search partners would include hundreds of non google websites as well as google video and other google sites for product shopping ads search partner sites that display and link products for sale so this is the google ads account structure so uh, we have an account which is a unique combination of email and password inside account we have different campaigns each account each campaign would have different sets of ad groups inside the ad groups there will be ads and keyword specified so this is very important whenever we are planning something we need account structure perfectly okay and then every account will have certain budget specified so last point here is the keywords for text ads keywords are very important uh, the, these are the keyword match types that google provides uh, first is broad match an exact match broad match modifier phrase match and negative keywords so let me quickly explain with example what are they so let let's say i am a seller of red socks for men and women so if i am writing red socks like this this is called an exact match and my ads will only show when someone searches for red socks if someone searches for red socks for men uh, in the case one it will not show uh, so exactly red red socks exact match will show second case red socks for men so again exact match will show when someone searches for red socks for men otherwise it will not show for any other thing then let's come quickly to uh, phrase match if i put red uh, socks like this so if someone searches for red socks for uh, sale red socks to buy red socks for me all these search terms when is there the exact phrase match uh, these ads will show and the fourth type is like a broad match so it is like putting uh, a broad match so it will attract all kind of search terms like red socks for newborn babies are red socks cute can red socks match with black leather shoes red socks which is a team etc etc so the point here is as paid marketers we cannot afford to show ads for these uh, non trivial ars red socks cute so we'll have to do a lot of hard work we'll have to uh, do like, analyze the search terms on a daily basis and we'll have to put uh, newborn uh, negative search terms like newborn babies uh, cute shoes can why etc etc this is how the google ads interface will look like it will show your different forms of ads in the left side for clicks impressions and all the details let's quickly move to display ads let's first understand what is display ad network so uh, previously we tried reaching ad, as market as advertisers we tried reaching our target customers 
with only Google search, right? Now Google Google Display Ad Network is a repository of more than two million sites and apps. It reaches ninety percent of the people on the internet, and so basically your ad either gets matched with the content related to your business, like your keywords or customers interest. So quickly understanding about with Google Display Network, it is much bigger. It provides much bigger reach as compared to search network. As a flip side here, if you do not do proper targeting, there is a high chance of blowing away your budget without achieving anything. So quickly understanding about display ads. So in case of search, there were three different parties. One was first was advertisers. Second was the target customer, and interface was the search network. Right? It was either the Google search website or Google search network website. In case of displays ads, advertisers who are trying to reach to their target customers across the world, and there are publishers. So let me explain quickly what is a publisher. So publishers are any website or app who have a good website or app. For example, I have a fashion website where I write regularly about fashion and uh, give give a lot of information about what is in things, what are trending, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm I'm spending a lot of money in keeping the website up, keeping the blogs, keeping the images, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for publishers, uh, these ad networks provide a way to earn some money by placing ads in their website. So how does this work? Advertiser is the one who pays money to get his advertisement shown, and advertisements are shown in the publisher websites or apps with the help of these ad networks. And advertiser pays money and he makes money by return on investment by selling targeted advertisements, products of and services. Advertiser owns or controls the product or services that is being advertised because. Advert he he is the in the command. Similarly, publishers earn earn money by giving away slots in their existing website or existing apps, and advertiser advertise advertises actual products or services and drives the users to publishers page, fill out the form or make a purchase. Let's quickly understand what are the display ads targeting options. First one is topic targeting. Topics are essentially the category of the page the user is searching on. So, naturally, topics can be very uh, useful for display advertisements. For example, taking the uh, taking the example of Josh Furniture. Let's say Josh Furniture provides mattresses for beds. So, a good topic for Josh Furniture can be home and garden, class bedroom, class ba bedding and linen. So these are topics which are already provided by uh, Google GDN, net, like Google interface. And uh, if I'm trying to sell a mattress, I can quickly select this topic and I can quickly move with my advertisements. Second is interest categories. So there is something called in-market audience. So in-market audience are users who are actively researching or com comparing products services across the Google display network. So Google is collecting all this information through cookies. Google is able to understand that okay, this person, Mr. Abhijit, is actively looking for laptops, or Mr. X is actively looking to buy a car. This audience is very valuable as uh, these guys already have moved further down in the funnel. So they have already uh, like they have a need, skill need. And they are looking for the real product to buy. A good example can be if I'm a Kia car dealer. So all of you might know that Kia is a new brand, which is uh, which has come to Indian market in uh, probably last one or two years. So a Kia car dealer can target folks who have been shopping for Hyundai or Maruti. So it becomes very easy for them to target these people to these audiences. Uh, second is affinity audience. Affinity audience takes a broader view in allowing advertisers target users based on their interests. So unlike in market audience, so in the previous example I have explained in market audience, affinity audience 
are not necessarily in the market to purchase a product at that very moment they are actively searching so in my case will knows that i am a uh, i search a lot on display marketing i search a lot about restaurants uh, hotels i travel a lot i search about cars so probably i am i'm in the affinity market uh, list for all these topics and the best part i love about google is that it gives standard options plus it allows you to mix and match things so uh, then there are placement targeting so for example i am the kia car dealer okay so i have a list of 100 websites 100 top websites which uh, car lovers frequent so what i do is instead of going for topic advertisements or interest categories i just put my ads in these top 100 websites because anyways anyone who is uh, going to research about cars is going to all these top sites and uh, here uh, an idea can be like you can do a lot of research you can make a list of 100 200 300 websites and you start or you can choose to go go slow here you can make a list of 20 30 websites first then keep on adding the fourth one is contextual uh, targeting which is uh, targeting by keywords uh, it works a lot like uh, google text ads so we pick up keywords and google uh, searches for these keywords or in the websites and google uh, this is our ads in the corresponding websites fifth one is demographic targeting so uh, demographic targeting would include age gender and parental status i quickly example ex- explain this with the example of marketing guy at friends adult diaper so if i am selling adult diaper to men so i don't have to do any hard work i'll just pick uh, age category 65 plus and i'll uh, pick the gender as men bingo ads are on it is as simple as that last point is like exclusions so depending on various reasons advertisers would not like to show their ads in different category of uh, websites for example a lot of advertisers do not like to put their ads on gaming sites or casino sites or uh, sites where content is sexually explicit so you can select these categories you can include or exclude you can mix and match things for example if i am working for a company which uh, is not falling under any standard of standard categories or topics or interests i can create my own categories or i can create my own market audience by taking care of topics by adding interests Uh, adding contextual targeting including my uh, competitors so it is team guys it is absolutely amazing so video ads again it is a complete science and there are different forms of ads uh, skippable in stream ads are ones which are can be skipped after 5 seconds and they appear on youtube watch pages and across websites and apps which are in google video partners so please note that there is a google search partner network there is a google display partner network and there is a google video partner net- network as well non skippable in stream ads are the ones which are non skippable so here you get uh, maximum 15 seconds to provide your message ads cannot be skipped and the ads appear across youtube videos and across websites and apps running on google video uh, partners then uh, the third category is video discovery ads only appear on youtube and reach people in places where they are discovering content so for example when you go to youtube and you su- you are searching for something so uh, these kind of ads will come they will help other users to discover your content and they will also appear alongside related youtube videos and on youtube mobile home page as well then there are bumper ads so you can use bumper ads when you want to reach viewers broadly the short memorable message bumper ads are 6 second slots and uh, here you can uh, reach people with a very quick messaging very quick powerful messaging stream ads as a name suggests it only appears on google partner sites it does not appear in youtube 
these ads are available in mobile and tablets are designed to give a better uh, experience in mobile so they help you uh, reach a lot of people who are outside youtube okay guys so let's move to app ads quickly understanding app ads app ads are automated campaign types you don't have to create any campaigns here they are designed to help advertisers to drive app installs and in app conversions across all of google's inventory so so basically we need to understand that there's a lot of app churn goes on and then if you come up with your app it is very important for the right end users to discover your app so uh, google provides google like app ads for this purpose so that you can put your ads directly in front of the target customers they have the like, two different methods one is cost per install so as the name suggests uh, here the advertiser is willing to pay a certain amount for each install for example if i have a budget of 100 dollars i say that i'm willing to pay 2 dollars for each app install per day like and my budget is 100 dollars per day probably i am targeting 50 ad 50 app installs to app similarly cost per action is like promoting users to take specific actions inside the apps probably some revenue generating action or to uh, for gamers Uh, going to the next uh, level this is like that shopping ads works amazing for you if you are a physical or online retail retailer so using shopping ads you can promote your online and local inventory you can boost traffic to your website you can get footfall to your local store and you can find better qualified leads ultimately that's the uh, uh, idea right to get leads so let's quickly understand how shopping ad works it is very important first we'll have to create like create a google merchant center account so it is a free account using merchant center account we can upload our inventory data physical inventory inventory data in google this merchant center will talk to google ads and it will provide the data for example in case of josh furniture josh furniture can provide Uh, the data of like bedroom furnitures it will just upload it will have to upload the data and google will automatically uh, show the right uh, ads with images and other details in front of uh, customers so let's quickly understand like what is uh, the differentiating factor for text, for it, for these kind of ads google text ads are completely text ads there is no display elements there okay but in contrast to text ads shopping ads provide users with a photograph provides a lot of information about the title your price your store name and a lot more okay and it also gives you details like free delivery as we can see uh, in this example so uh, this is how shopping ad works so let me quickly move to metrics for search engine marketing it is very important to understand the metrics when we are talking about google ads these are the metrics that i am looking at their impressions impression share cost clicks cost per click conversions uh, click through rate cost per conversion quality score ad position view through conversions etc etc so let's quickly understand impressions so an impression is counted each time your ad is shown on a search result page or other sites in google search network so it is pretty straight forward so this is the google ad interface where we can see uh, how many impressions are there so the next point is impression share so it is a competitive matrix so impression share is provides us with a comparison like what is the number of impression that an ad receives divided by estimate number of impression that were available so let's take an example of josh furnitures here So let's say uh, my daily budget is like just thousand rupees, okay? And uh, per cost click is like click through rate is like hundred rupees cost per click. Like within uh, very soon, I am exhausting my uh, number of clicks and number of impressions. So if I would have increased my budget, probably throughout the whole day I would have got thousand impressions. But because of various reasons, I only got hundred impressions and ten clicks. so my impression share is 10% impression share it shows the opportunity 
that an advertiser has in terms of reaching out to new audience it also reflects the performance of your ads and it also gives you performance of the competitors ads so you know like josh at josh furniture i know that i'm just getting an impression share of 10% but uh, other competitors share uh, other competitors are getting a 50% impression share so they are in front of uh, the target customers five times more than me this is definitely a point to uh, ponder right it will again it will depend on target settings approval status and quality score if the quality score goes down i uh, as a advertiser can lose on impression share as well, as well. Uh, metrics uh, second this one is pretty straightforward cost cost is shown across various levels it is shown for keywords for ad groups for campaigns and at account level cost you need to look at costs at every single point of time to know how we are doing ideally the cost would have been on the lower side but actually it is a function of how big the campaign reach is so probably uh, the better data to look for is clicks and cost per clicks so what is clicks uh, we all know like we, we all have clicked ads in google ads right so clicks signifies user interest so when a user is seeing something on let's say google text ads or display ads or wherever whenever so they they look they skim through all the data they look at the organic search results they look at the paid search results so the one which applies to them most the one that connects with them most they click that so if a user is clicking on the ad it means the user has found the ad relevant and wanted to know more about the product or service again big data is available at all levels at keyword level ad group level campaign level and account level and it helps advertisers in deciding if the ads are creating required engagement and generally the higher the click is the better it is ctr next uh, metric to look for is click through rate or ctr so click through rate is the ratio that denotes number of users who clicked the ad versus number of users who saw that so in simple terms it is number of clicks divided by number of impression and click ctr is a very important metric to look forward to because it is the ctr which has a direct impact on quality score so the higher the ctr is google will know that your ad is very relevant people are clicking it so it will uh, probably start providing a higher quality score to your ads next metric cost per click very important metric it is calculated by dividing the total cost of campaign by the total number of clicks it re received or uh, if you are looking for a keyword at keyword level it is like total number of uh, total clicks it has received and total amount it has uh, which has been spent on that particular keyword we should understand that cost per click we should as marketers we should always try to optimize the cost per click the so cost per click should gradually go down so a lot of factors such as ads landing page geographic targeting etc etc is used for optimizing and reduce ctr uh, the next factor is convergence it is a predefined action for example if there is an e-commerce site and you are uh, you have put a payment gateway and uh, finally uh, if you want the user to pay at the end of the transaction that is considered as conversion in case of e-commerce probably but in case of normal like product or service website uh, it can be as small as a phone call also it can be as small as a form fill up also we need to define convergence properly and we need to look at convergent data for proper optimization next data is cost per conversion it is uh, the total cost incurred in a campaign by the total number of conversion generated for example if in a campaign which i ran for a week if i got total 150 leads by spending 10000 rupees then cost per conversion would be 150 divided by 10000 which is 66.66 rupees so cost per conversion is very important because finally it will give me the roe of the campaign lower the cost per conversion the better roi is and quality score i have already explained quality score uh, it is it is a aggregate score it comes on a scale of 1 to 10 and 
uh, advertisers are always on the lookout to optimize quality score. It depends on expected click-through rate, ad relevance, and landing page experience. Ad position. So depending on your ad rank, your ad position is calculated. Ad position is available uh, in the keyword level. Now Google has gradually uh, started not giving the ad positions also. Cost per mile, it is a display ad uh, metric. It is like when advertiser is only charged when ads appear in front of prospective user thousand number of times, so thousand impressions. So CPM method of billing is mostly used by an advertiser when objective is brand awareness, which I uh, had already explained. A publisher earns revenue to CPM methods as well. And the visibility here is to improve the visibility. So let's start with uh, Google AdSense. So Google AdSense is an ad network run by Google to which website publishers in the Google ad network of content sites serve different kinds of ads like text ads, image ads, video ads, interactive media ads that are targeted to the target audience of the advertisers. These advertisements are administered, sorted, and maintained by Google. So they can, they can generate revenue on the pay-per-click or pay-per-impression basis. Basically, Google AdSense is an ad network which provides a monetization way for millions of sites in the world. So AdSense is a participant in the Ad Choices program. AdSense ads would typically include a triangle-shaped ad choices icon. So this is how you differentiate like a display ad or a text ads in display network. It would have a triangle with which uh, I and ad choices will be written there. AdSense requires an advertiser to submit a sealed bid. So basically a sealed bid is a bid which is not observable by the competitors. Additionally, for any given click received, advertisers only pay for one bid increment above the second highest bid. So Google has made it made its system so transparent. If you say that max amount that you are willing to pay is 100 rupees, Google will not pay you 100 rupees. So based on a complex calculation, Google will calculate what kind of competitors are there. This is applicable for both for search ads and uh, AdSense as well. And Google will charge you just one increment bid above the second highest bid. Google currently shares 68% of the revenue generated by AdSense with content network partners and 51% of the revenue generated by AdSense with search partners. We'll, we'll understand the details of it. Before moving to the next slide, we have to understand that Google AdSense is not the only ad network in the world. AdSense is the biggest ad network in the world with over, over 11 million websites uh, using AdSense. But then there are a multiple number of websites uh, or ad networks available for the monetization of your websites. Some of the notable names are Infolinks, BlogHer, Revenue Hits, MediaVine, ArtThrive, Media.net, Monumetric, Homo Ads, Popular. So basically, there are a lot of them. And every, every day, new ones keep popping up. So let's understand what are the types of ads. Uh, which Google AdSense provide. First one is content, second is search, third is video, and fourth is link units. So let's proceed to the details. Okay, first let's understand what is content for AdSense. So content-based advertisements can be targeted for users with certain interest or context. All these ads which are shown in the uh, Google Display Network, it is based on majorly two things. Either uh, what content is there in your website based on the keywords of your website, which is called context, and this is called contextual targeting. Second is the user's interest. You might have seen that uh, when you browse the websites, you uh, see a lot of ads in various websites depending on your interest areas. Uh, the targeting can be either cost per click or cost per thousand impression, which is called CPM. Uh, CPC based targeting is most common. This is applicable for Google search ads as well. And uh, this is applicable for the AdSense network as well. The ad uh, can be simple text ads, 
can be image ads, it can be animated images, it can be flash videos, it can be videos, it can be rich media ads. And coming to the number of ads per page, previously Google AdSense had put a restriction. That we can only put P ads in uh, a single page. But over the time, Google has realized that the competition is increasing. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of competitor websites and they provide a lot more percentage of the revenue also and they do not put any restrictions. Sensing that competition, Google removed this uh, previous restrictions of three ads per page. Also, Google allows publishers to receive 68% of the revenue recognized by Google. Next, let's move to search. This one is pretty easy. Uh, this, this is like similar to Google search. But it, this kind of search is happening inside a website. So basically AdSense for search allows publishers to display ads relating to search terms on their websites. So let's, uh, let's take an example of uh, a site, for example, Economic Times. Okay. So Economic Times has thousands and thousands of pages, right? So let's say, let's say you want to see, uh, uh, you want to search for a news on um, some uh, uh, Gujarat flood or something. So you, when you search, there is a probability that if they have opted for these kind of ads, alongside the search results, uh, you will see some ads. Uh, just remember here, the search results will, will provide links from your own website only. It won't, it won't give you a third, third party link. So, you, so basically your users will be inside your website, They're not going anywhere, but they will see ads. So uh, publishers receive 51% of the revenue recognized by Google. So this is like you're not doing anything. You have built a site, you have built your hard work, you have created a lot of good quality content, image and all. Just put a search function in your web, when your website and you start getting an extra income. So uh, if the site has already built in search functionality, a lot of sites have that, right? They already have a built-in search functionality. So Google AdSense provides us a custom search ads, which can be added to show search ads next to your search results. Alternatively, if you do not have a custom search engine, if you do not have a search engine embedded, Google uh, AdSense give you, gives you a custom search engine, which can be added to your site where readers can search the site and see targeted ads. Okay, let's move to the next slides. So here, here uh, it's an example from a good site called parenting.com. So inside parenting.com, one prospective parent or one current parent have searched for baby bottles. So uh, he or she has got, got some organic search result uh, that display below. Uh, uh, and ads by Google is displayed in a box and it is highlighted properly okay let's move to the next uh, ads that is video ads uh, adsense for video allows publishers with video content to generate revenue using ad placement from google's extensive advertisement network you have to remember one point here all the vid like if you are showing a video ad to be displayed that has to be definitely hosted in google uh, YouTube channels. Okay, so let's understand what are the types of ads which are displayed alongside your video content. So it's, it can be video content, it can be overlay ads, it can be full slots ads. So let's understand what kind of video ads can appear inside your video content. Uh, a video ad can appear before, in between, or after a video content. So, uh, like when it comes before, it is called pre-roll. When it comes in the mid, in the middle, it comes it it is called mid-roll. And when it comes at the end of your video, it is called post-roll. Okay. So here we can see the standard non-skippable videos, and they will come in the formats pre-roll, mid-roll, and post-roll. And it then there are preview uh, uh, videos which can be skipped after five seconds. So these kind of videos. Can be shown uh, alongside our existing video content. 
second is overlay ads overlay ad is a text image or a rich media creative that usually appears over the bottom third of the content uh, can you see the image it is pretty clear light i am sure uh, you would have getting these ads on a daily basis fourth this one is a bit tr tricky this is called full slot so full slot ads are text ads image ads or rich media creatives that appear before or on pause or after the content so the trick here is users need to close this ad before continuing to the video content or next video so this there is a difference here so let's let's uh, proceed to the next type of ads that is link units link units are closely targeted to the interest of your users because users directly interact with the ad unit they may be more interested in the ads they were eventually see let me quickly show you what a link unit looks like i'm sure you would have seen these so to also quickly see uh, that there is a ad choices uh, icon here which differentiate an ad from the uh, generic website content so coming back to the link units adsense publishers are paid for clicks on the ads and the ads on the linked page are pay per click google ads similar to those shown in regular adsense ad units so basically this is like uh, a kind of a text ad individual text ads created into a unit and last point link ads are responsive by default they allow you to support a wide range of devices because nowadays uh, ads can come in any devices it can come from Uh, computers and laptops phones tablets and there are multiple screen sizes there are multiple uh, resolutions so by default google has made the ads uh, responsive and we'll have to remember one thing here uh, that google does not disclose how much it is uh, for uh, link units so let's understand how how does google adsense work so it's actually pretty simple i'm sure you would have some of you would have tried installing like like installing google analytics code so basically it is a javascript code which has to be put into the website so webmaster or publisher site that is the site which is willing to participate in adsense program inserts the adsense javascript code into the website and bingo it works uh, start working from that point each time the page is visited by an end user the javascript code is fired and it fetches content uh, like it fetches a right ads based on either context of your website or interest of the users and starts showing ads it is as simple as that so a contextual advertising system scans the text of a website for keywords and returns advertisements to the web page based on these keywords the advertisement may be displayed on the web page or can be also displayed as a pop up ad for example if the user is viewing a website pertaining to sports like i'm sure you must be browsing a lot of cricket websites so uh, so when you are browsing this website you must be seeing a lot of advertisement related to sports related company for example uh, sports goods sellers or other sports websites etc etc contextual advertisement also called in text advertisements or in context technology my personal take here contextual ads are less irritating than traditional advertisements that, that is why it influences users more effectively it shows users the area of expertise of area of interest or expertise of theirs and thus increases the chance of receiving a response so let's understand like how do we get paid how do the publishers get paid using adsense so uh, adsense payment cycle is monthly publishers accrue estimated earnings over the course of a month and then at the beginning of the following month their earnings are finalized and posted as balance on the payment page if the balance exceeds the payment threshold and if there is no payment holds 
publishers will be issued a payment between the 21st and 26th of the month so so let me example let me give you an example so let's say uh, so uh, josh furniture start display ads using google adsense they accrue estimated earnings throughout the month of july okay so let's say the payment threshold for their account is 100 dollars which is kind of default for a lot of parties for the month of july it will all be calculated it will be accrued by august 3rd they will see their july month finalized total earnings credited to their adsense payments page so it is not credited to their account it will be credited to their payments page if that amount has gone more than 100 dollars so it has if it has increased above their threshold amount then they will get uh, josh furniture will get a payment for their july earnings and any other credits as a lump sum payment in and around august 21st also adsense would need information about your tax information your personal identification details and address you also need to select a payment method so these are the different payment methods uh, adsense has been very lenient here depending on different countries and uh, uh, rules uh, of the different countries they, they have they uh, use uh, the various methods like payment electronic fund transfer wire transfer western union quick cash rapida and eft uh, so also we need to remember that depending on what method you select and depending on what method is available in various countries it will it might again take some time uh, in getting these payments so let's understand the do's and don'ts what should we do to maximize our adsense income first point produce good quality content that attracts and engages users and provide good user experience Create and maintain a content calendar around a theme. If your site is into fashion blogging, maintain the theme. Do not add random new topics just for the sake of AdSense profitable keywords or getting guest posts, etc., etc. So stick to your theme. Definitely, it will uh, will get good results over time. So let me move to the next point. Follow Google Webmaster and AdSense guidelines. So. Uh, uh, this point is actually applicable for all the website owners it is just not for adsense users uh, so google webmaster guidelines generally ask you to create uh, create content for people uh, the people not for search engines so uh, ask webmasters to avoid things like uh, using automatically generated content participating in link schemes Creating pages with link, little or no original content. Also, methods like cloaking, sneaky, putting sneaky redirects in the website, putting hidden text or links in the website, using doorway pages, scraped content, and the list goes on. Basically, uh, as website owners, we should always stick to these guidelines. We should never use any unnatural ways to get some traffic. AdSense guidelines also essentially tell all the same thing. They also tell not to tamper with uh, uh, AdSense codes. Keep a SEO checklist ready. So this is again this is important for all the website owners. I like I because I have mentioned that I have a couple of websites on my own. So I have always kept a SEO checklist ready. Some of which points are directly on top of my mind, like setting up. Google Search Console, installing Google Analytics, setting up Bing Webmaster tools. Yeah. One thing here, never forget Bing. Because uh, just remember, Google is only 76% of the search. The rest 24% belongs to different uh, search engines. So never ignore Google. So coming back to SEO checklist, setting up Bing Webmaster tools, submitting XML sitemap to search engines. Prepare your robot.txt file, use rich, rich snippets, keep the URL SEO friendly, write long form content, include primary keywords in the first paragraph, focus on maintaining keyword density, and the list goes on. I don't need to tell all the list uh, to you here. You can easily create one for yourself or search for a good one. 
a lot of uh, sites that are available in the internet which give which can give you a free one fourth point keep an eye on cost per click column while doing a keyword research so it is commonly believed that traffic is directly proportional to money in blogging but this is not accurate in terms of adsense advertisement the reason for this is so many factors which can affect your adsense incomes some of them are your ad placement which is very important your ad types your traffic sources and most importantly the adsense cost per click so if you are using keyword research for your website keep an eye on the cost per click factor i use sem rush as a tool and i would highly recommend using sem rush tool by choosing some keywords which have high cpc i'm not saying that uh, just go around go and choose only high paying cpc keywords cost per click wala keyword but uh, first thing uh, according to the first point it should be as per your theme as per your site theme secondly you should select some of the profitable keywords okay next point mix and match different formats this is also a very important uh, point so many site owners that i have interacted with simply use images because they believe and this is also one of the myths of adsense that image ads work better but from my experience believe me it is not like that i advise the site owners to use all ad types I, like we have covered the different type of ads at types right adsense for search uh, then link based ads and videos so videos are generally out of purview for uh, us but then we can uh, easily use adsense for search and i am a big fan of adsense for search because it not only helps you monetize your content it also helps with user navigation so user can find the right content in your website if you put a search functionality in your website there are some pro tips for wordpress website owners so i'll quickly browse through it this is pro tip and uh, i was re recently sitting down with one of my friends who is a website owner he has very good traffic in his website so we found these points out will recommends using 720x 728 into 90 that is leaderboard image add unit above the fold of home page and below the main navigation bar so depending on the page length so these are for the home page depending on your page length if the page length is good use a vertical add unit of same size as different add units like the 160 cross 600 or 300 cross 250 a uh, medium rectangle in your sidebar or your blog page again wordpress website owners are they thrive on their blogs so it is very important for them this p36 cross 280 large rectangle ad unit at the top of the article use a similar ad unit at the end of post before the comment section similar to the home page is a skyscraper or a medium rectangular ad unit in the sidebar so uh, these are pro tips Are very important for you. It is important to understand don'ts rather than do's. So now that we know the do, do's, we need to understand the don'ts. First, ever ever try to compensate users or third-party players for viewing ads or performing searches. If Google will come to know that you are doing it, then there is a high probability that your site and your account is banned. Encourage never ever encourage users. click the google ads using phrases like click the ads or support us never try to draw user attention to the ads using arrows or some graphical gimmicks never try to place misleading images alongside individual ads basically ad units should be very clear ad units should clearly say that these are ads so to place anything nearby Google is not gonna like it. Never place ads in a floating box script. Google does not like it. Same, this has to be avoided at all costs. Never try to format your ads so that they become indistinguishable from other content on that page. Your site and ads should have some uh, gaps. Like Google sometimes says, says that it, is, it should be at least 15 pixels. 
So never try to mix things. Never try to make them indistinguishable. Never try to format side content so that it is difficult to distinguish it from ads. So it is the reverse way. So any which way you do it, Google will not be liking it. Never try to place misleading labels above Google ad units. Like ad units can only say that they are sponsored ads or they are paid ads. Ad units cannot be labeled as favorite sites or today's top offers or something like that. Don't ever click on your own Google AdSense. A lot of, like, if you go to an AdSense forum, you will see a lot of site owners complaining about this that I am banned from Google AdSense. And, uh, and one of the major reasons is that, that they do not get any uh, revenue. They, they get frustrated, they click their own ads, and you're gone. And believe me, guys, Google is very, very serious about its policies. Once you get banned, it is very difficult to reinstate your account. Even if you recreate the account, uh, it will have a, there's a very high probability that it is going to be banned. And the same applies for Google Ads as well. So uh, never try to fool around with Google Ads or Google AdSense. Do not use automated click and impression generating tools like robots or deceptive software. Believe me, guys, there are a lot of these uh, uh, black hat things available in the market. Do not try to use that. If Google knows, and you know Google is the big daddy, they will definitely know that you are using some of these automated uh, processes and you will be banned forever. Okay, let's move to matrices now. First metric is ad request. Ad request is counted whenever your site requests ad to be displayed. It is the number of ad units that requested ads for content ads or Search queries for search ads. So ad reports an ad request each AdSense reports an ad request each time a request was sent, even if no ads were returned. Let me quickly explain you this. So let's say you have a page. Uh, you have a blog page and you have you have put three ad units there. So uh, three is the number of ad requests. So based on uh, Depend based on different criteria, like based on your content, based on the uh, data Google has about the visitor, Google will uh, return you the number of ads. So it will depend on a lot of things. So if some if you are if the user is browsing your website at 2 a.m. in the night, some people might have put time restrictions also, some advertisers. So depending on a lot of things, you might be able to show three ads can be zero or one as well. Okay. Next point is ad request coverage. Coverage is the percentage of ad requests that returned at least one ad. Generally speaking, coverage can help you identify sites where AdSense is not able to provide targeted ads. Formula for coverage is ad requests that return ads. So in the previous example, if out of the three slots, only one slot uh, displayed an ad so this is 1 divided by 3 uh, to 100 so uh, if two ads are shown uh, on that page uh, out of three slots it is 66.67 percent likewise if you have a search box average of 80 percent would mean that an average of one query out of the five show uh, out of the five did not show any ad i hope i am clear about it Poor coverage is a sign that Google was not able to provide ads suitable for your page and returns did not return any ads. Ad request CTR. As you know, click CTR is click-through rate. So ad request click-through rate is the number of ad clicks divided by the number of ad requests. Very simple. If you received seven clicks out of thousand ad requests, your CTR would be 0.7%. Ad request RPM. It is revenue per thousand impressions. So ad request revenue per thousand impressions is calculated by dividing your estimated earning by the number of ad requests you have made, multiplying it by thousand. So for example, if you earned an estimated sixty dollars from fifteen thousand ad requests, your ad request RPM would be like sixteen sixty dollars 
divided by fifteen thousand uh, in two thousand, which is four dollars. Four dollars. It's pretty simple. The number of times a user clicked on a standard content ad. Cost per click. Again, very simple and important metrics. Amount you earn each time a user clicks on your ad. CPC is calculated by dividing the estimated revenue by the number of clicks received. Earnings again, straightforward number. Estimated earning for a publisher. For that, uh, very recent numbers can be a little problematic, but uh, the, you can uh, in your dashboard you can uh, see your recent earnings up to yesterday. Impressions. So this is this looks like a simple one, but this is an important one. Impression is counted for each ad request where at least one ad had begun to download to the user's device. It is the number of ad units for content ads or search queries for search ads that loaded ads. A very important point here to note is there are, I told you, right, there are a lot of uh, ad networks, they are available. To maintain a standard, uh, th there are standard bodies like the interactive advertisement bureau, which is IAB, or the Media Rating Council, MRC. They do a lot of research on this. They, they do a lot of periodic reviews, update industry standards for impression measurement. They also recommended guide, guidelines. Over time, the standards for counting and ad impression on the web has evolved. From counting an impression when the ad is served, counting an impression when the ad starts to download on the user's device. So there is something called a served impression, there is something called a downloaded information. Impression CTR, the ratio of impression that resulted in a click, uh, straightforward. Okay, uh, let's move to uh, managing Google Ads. So these are the steps for setting up a paid search campaign. So this, this is generally first step uh, for each campaign, not only for paid campaigns, for any campaigns, first step is generally to identify measurable goals. Once we identify measurable goals, we move forward. And in case of SEO and PPC campaigns, we move forward for the keywords. So in case of a paid campaigns, uh, the second step is like identifying keywords, structuring them into proper campaigns and ad groups. This is very important. Then, Create perfect ads for your target customer. The important point is the target customer. And while you are while you are measuring your goals, you need to understand your target customers perfectly. So what kind of searches they are doing, what kind of sites they are browsing. Once you crack all these details, you are good in Google Ads. Fourth point: review the results and make changes if required. Okay, let's move. And to identifying the measurable goals. These are some of the common um, goals that I identify. Goals can be much more trickier, complexers. But let's keep it simple for the discussion. Goals can be like total number of business leads required from a paid search campaign. They can be total number of revenues to be generated from a paid search campaign for e-commerce campaigns. For visibility campaign, goals can be uh, total amount of traffic to be generated. Fourth, for app campaigns, goals can be total number of app downloads or in-app actions. Let me quickly move to the first. First point, as we discussed, is identifying the keywords. So Google has given a wonderful tool for free. It is called Keyword Planner. So in Keyword Planner, once you identify the goals, you start searching. Google gives you uh, the tool. You can put as many searches in the tools. You just have to put your search terms. You can define a uh, geography. So if you are targeting United States, you can put US. If you are targeting uh, India, you can put India. If I am creating a campaign specific for Bangalore, I can put Bangalore. So uh, once you do this, you will be able to see uh, the keyword search volumes, estimated cost per click, and so on. And you'll be able to get an idea like how much approximately you are going to spend. The ad manager at Josh Furniture is searching for terms like uh, buy office furniture online, buy garden furniture online. 
sorry, buy garden furniture, buy furniture online. And what data Google is giving? Uh, he has put location as India. It could have been narrowed down. It could have been Bangalore or Chennai or or uh, narrower also. So yeah, so once they are putting this data, they are getting average monthly searches competition. You can see clearly see the competition is very high and because uh, they are they have already not started the ads. The ad impression shares are not shown. Then you can also see the top of the page bid in the lower range and higher range. So for buy office furniture online, Josh Furniture knows that I have to spend something like two rupees to twenty rupees. And again, what, are, what all details it will depend on? It will probably depend on their quality score and ad rank. Let me move to campaigns. Very important. This is the first structure. Campaign is like I generally take this approach. I create campaigns according to network, geography, device segmentation, product type, and probably many other details. So I'll give an example. Josh uh, Furniture selling chairs and tables in Bangalore and Chennai. So look at the data point. So it's a furniture company. It can it can sell uh, chairs. It can sell tables. It can sell. Uh, garden chairs, it can sell garden furniture, it can sell bedroom furniture, different set of keywords, two different locations, Bangalore and Chennai. They also have like, you can select text ads or display ads. So depending on that, you can select uh, first, first step is to uh, create a good campaign structure for search ad campaign for garden furniture for Bangalore. So choose one keyword theme, choose one location, and choose one network. So search network, one keyword theme, which is garden furniture, one location, Bangalore. Create a, a create a campaign first. Give it a meaningful name. Start working. Start optimizing. Similarly, create a display. Dis, create one for display ads as well. Then, once you master the structure. And for the next campaigns, you just need to load campaign settings. I have highlighted here that uh, no need to add the campaign setting every time. You can just load your campaign settings. Then comes ad groups. Very important point. Ad groups are part of uh, like the ad campaign, and uh, sorry, yeah, they are part of the ad campaign. They help in recognizing the ads by a common theme. So. So if you if you select garden furniture, you can again go granular. So it can be like garden chairs, it can be garden tables, it can be something else. So my advice here: go as granular as possible. Select very tightly themed uh, ad groups. Choose two, three, four words max. Do not go beyond that level. Create targeted ads for those keywords. Uh, at the ad group level, bidding is done to control the ads display. So let's move to the next next point: ad copy creation. Again, probably the most important point for text ads and similarly for display ads. So uh, for time constraints, I have taken the example of text ads. As you can th as, as you can see, a text ad ad copy there is a final URL, there is a headline one which is 30 characters, headline two 30 characters, headline three is 30 characters. Uh, and to be noted here, headline three has been recently introduced. It may or may not show. So headline one and headline two will definitely show. Depending on the devices, depending on uh, various other points, uh, these factors will show. Then there is a display path, which is like your website name slash path one slash path two. So for example, in case of Josh Furniture, it can be joshfurnitureshop.com plus garden furniture. There is description one which is 90 characters and description two would be 90 characters. Then when you type things here, Google will show you two previews, one for desktop, second for mobiles. Effectively reach your potential customers. Text ads should be very specific, relevant, attractive and empowering. Some of the good practices that you can follow. You can highlight the differentiating factor first. Then you can include at least one keyword. So remember, inside your ad group, there are three, four, five, six keywords. You can 
used to go very broad and you can put 20 keywords but do you know do you think that you should create one ad or 20 keywords would you be able to do the justice no right so that is why i told you that keep the things tight keep them tightly themed maximum two three four keywords five keywords per ad group then include your call to action like buy now uh, or call us now visit our store fourth point include prices promotions exclusive self-explained fifth point make sure the ad text matches with the landing page most important point we covered this point whatever is your ad like whatever is the term which is creating your ad so the keyword text and the landing page should all be on the same page they should speak the same language make sure your ad extensions complement your ad copy now you see in the next slide so ad extension are additional pieces of information such as additional links from your website telephone numbers seller reviews that becomes a part of your advertisement on Google search ads. What do they do? They actually uh, grab more real estate. But by adding an ad extension, the size of your ad increases. And you know size does matter, right? So when the size of the ad increases, uh, users would most likely to notice it more and click on these ads. So there are some examples shown to you here point you can use extensions based on your business goals very important point if your goal is to get customers to buy from your business location if you want people to get if you want to direct your direct your prospective customers to your store or restaurant or any other place you can use location extension very important point so this, uh, apart from location extension there is something called affiliate location extension for example, I am Kia company and I am creating my ads for uh, my uh, individual dealers. Okay. So uh, I am just trying to facilitate them. Right. So instead, like I cannot give Kia Motors address there. So I will I'll, I'll create an affiliate location and I will give the address of uh, XYZ Motors, which is a Kia Motors uh, authorized dealer. And I can give their location example. Second point is call out extension. Add additional text to your ads like free delivery, 24x7 customer support, etc. etc. Second type of goal if you want your customers to contact you by phone, simple use call extension. So Google also had a text message uh, option, but it is not there anymore. Third goal, get customers to convert to your website. Basically, if you want people to visit your website, you can use site link extension. So site link is like you can keep two or four uh, site links uh, so that people can come to your website directly. For example, you can give uh, your uh, hours or order now, direct link can be given. Again, call out extension. Add additional text to your ads like free delivery 24x7 customer support etc etc then there's an advanced concept called structured snippets the structured snippet would also give extra information on your product or service category also there are price extensions and this is not available in all the countries if your goal is to get people download your app then pretty simple use app extension then comes ad scheduling. Ad scheduling allows you to set custom times throughout the day when you want your ads to run specific hours for each day. For example, you can use the ad scheduling for specifying certain number of hours or days of the week when you want to show your ads. For example, I am a restaurant and I want to uh, give, uh, I want to attract people near uh, I want to uh, attract office buyers, office goers near my restaurant to my uh, restaurant. So what I will do is like I will provide much more importance during the lunch time or the afternoon time when people go and meet other people. So I'll put my location extension. I'll put my call extension. I 
all these details in the right times only. We can also go a step further and set bid adjustments to increase or decrease your bids for specific days and times. Amazing, right? So by default, Google ad campaigns are set to show ads all day. So when you do not touch your scheduling part, it is set to all day. Conversion tracking, uh, probably one of the most important points. It is again a free tool provided by Google Ads. So uh, you can specify the actions which are important for you. For example, whether they are buying a product or signing up for your newsletter, whether they are calling your business or downloading your app. Depending on, depending on, on your uh, business goal, you can set it up. So uh, when a customer completes an action, uh, that you have defined as a conversion, uh, the, you can see the details of conversions. My suggested method here, use Google Analytics conversion tracking methods. And for that, you need to link your Google Ads with Google Analytics. So let's quickly understand how we do that. Linking Google Ads to Google Analytics. Very important point, probably it's the first step that you should take in order to view Google Ads data inside Google Analytics account and vice versa. Basically, uh, there are two different accounts. One is Google Ads and there is Google Ad Analytics account. We need to link them. Before linking them, first step is to enable auto tagging in Google Ads. Otherwise, the data may not report correctly between two platforms. And remember, the, both the platforms have two different uh, ways to collect this data. So we need to be very careful here. In analytics, uh, as per the screenshot, I think you can see the screenshot. Go to uh, go to your admin view, go to properties, and do your Google Ad links. And next steps are pretty self-explanatory. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. Once you link your Google Analytics account with your Google AdWords account, uh, then you can view ads data inside analytics. So you, you once it is linked, you go to Google Analytics, you go to the overall view, you go to the acquisition part, you go to you browse to the Google Ads part, then you see go to the campaigns. Then you will be see you will be able to see the clicks data, the cost data, cost per click data, how many users, how many sessions, uh, and amazing part, bounce rate, just per session. These are all uh, Google Analytics. Data, right? You cannot see this data in Google AdWords. Once you link both the properties, you will be able to see the all the data inside in one window. Similarly, you can see your shopping data, your display targeting data. I have not shown it here. You can see it. Viewing analytics data in Google Ads. It is the reverse one. Now that you have you are able to see the AdWords data in analytics. Will uh, I want you to know that you can also do the reverse thing. So apart from the usual AdWords data like campaign data, budget, status, clicks, impression, CPR, that is through rate, average CPC, we can also see the analytics details inside your AdWords. So these are average visits, pages for visit, percentage new visits, etc., etc., bounce rate. This is very important. I need your full attention here. Multi-channel funnel report. This is very important. Um, in analytics, conversions and e-commerce transactions are credited to the last campaign. So it is by default attribution in analytics is set to last step that you that a user did while converting. So attribution. So by default, it is attribution is set to the last action. So probably it is the last search or last did add. Uh, so the, by default, it will be shown like that. But what what role did prior website referrals, searches, or ads play in that convergence? We need to understand that. How much time passed between the user's initial interest and his or her purchase? We need to understand the in order, in order to understand the user funnel, how the user move moved from top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. It is very important to understand that we need to see the 
okay first time the user came to my site using a paid ad then probably he or she came directly and converted or probably they uh, came to my website for uh, using paid search then do some display campaign then they converted so in this report i want you all to check this report there are paths given like that so users have come first they have come via paid search like text ads and all then they have come via display ads there are users who have come by via paid search then they have come directly to the website and converted and if you are uh, a e-commerce site and if you have e uh, installed e-commerce data properly you will be able to see that how much conversion value it got for normal users the values will be zero so let's come to the last step of our uh, discussion that is optimization very important google google adwords uh, most important point is like doing continuous optimization and how do we do continuous opti optimization first point is for keywords we need to check the keyword st status always are the keywords are uh, are all of them eligible are all of them performing properly when i say performing properly are all of them getting good through rate ctr is high or not are the bids uh, like are they under bidded like the, the top page bid is much higher the impressions are counted but it is not getting clicks so we need to check all of this then we need to uh, go to the search term reports on a regular basis so whenever we whenever we need we analyze the search term reports we will see a lot of negative keywords coming so we need to keep adding the negative keywords so that our uh, ROI is becomes better. We need to review our max cost per click. So this is very important. Check the cost per click, check the corresponding quality score, and gradually improve. Our idea should be decrease the cost per click gradually. So basically, if our uh, quality scores will improve, our max cost click will go down. Find out new keywords in. Uh, like you, you need to come continuously use uh, the Google tools like keyword tools. Also, from the search um, report, you will see a lot of new keywords which you can use. Last point test out branded keywords. Branded keywords are the keywords which uh, use your brand name, for example, Walmart or Edureka. People, people do not remember Edureka website. You will just type Edureka and they will come to your, uh, they will uh, get a CRP page. We need to uh, uh, bid on these as well. Let's move to the next point. Tighten up campaign structure. Very important point. The ad group should be tightly uh, structured. It should have maximum two, three, four keywords so that we can do a justice to these keywords and put a text which properly caters to all these keywords. So generally what happens when we start our campaigns, we are not that particular. So we create slightly broader ad groups. So in case we had done that, nothing to worry about. There's always room for restructuring. So keep reviewing the campaigns. And also one point here, most of the time, uh, the advertisers are under pressure. But uh, okay. Uh, we need to uh, deliver an ad campaign within one day or two days. So initially, we don't know. We might not get time for a very good ad structuring. I would recommend you to do that. And then, uh, when you get time uh, in the future, you can always go back to the same campaigns, do uh, restructuring, split up ad groups again. If you are ads, you need to whatever good ad you have. Uh, produce you need to return to those ads you need to continuously test new ads the so first thing for any ad group you should at least create three key ad groups at least for each ad group minimum three ads then you need to check how these ads are performing are they getting enough clicks are they getting enough conversions are they getting enough impressions uh, if some of them are not getting any impressions pause them and uh, uh, Add new ones. Message matching. 
message matching is very important. I have told it again and again. Your keyword, your ad text, and your landing page should all match. I dynamic keyword insertion. So Google provides us a way. If your ad group has four keywords, you can or five keywords or whatever number of keywords you can do uh, curly brackets and you can use dynamic keyword insertion. So basically, uh, for all these keywords, your ads will be triggered. So uh, your headline will show or your body will show whenever there is an insert, dynamic insertion. Good practice. I always do that. I would also recommend you to do that. Do that. But never do that if you use a lot of broad keywords because that can kill your ad also. Utilize the display URL. Uh, on a low lying fruit, a lot of advertisers forget. A display URL. Also, you can use your keyword and you can use important point in the display URL. Remember, it is after your after your website. It is like there are two uh, different fields of 15 characters each. Use call to action. I have already uh, explained this point before. Uh, stand out from crowd. You have to do that by continuous experimenting and continuous A/B testing. Highlight your USPs again. Explained it before. Have attention with an amazing headline. So headlines are like generally boldened, so you need to write an amazing piece of headline. And the practice which I generally follow is I try to include the keyword in the headline. I would also recommend you to do that. Next point: optimizing your website and landing page. Again, constantly test new landing pages. One very important point here. Google puts a lot of importance on page speed and Google always improves the quality of page speed. So the, like uh, Google also gives a lot of importance for mobile page speed as well. You need to do that. You need to put importance on page speed. You need to constantly test new landing page. You need to take care of UI UX issues. Make sure there are no UI UX issues. Google does not like that. Keep language and cultural aspects aspects in mind a lot of time what happens is we do a lot of multi uh, targeting like uh, i have also done this in the past i have done the mistake i created a campaign for us and uk so i created a, like same i used the same landing page blindly i used the same text blindly strict no no both the country uh, people speak english but Way they speak English and the way they pick words are different. You need to take care of these uh, small aspects in mind. Most important point: do the on-page fixing of uh, landing pages. So do the SEO fixing of your landing pages properly, like assigning uh, proper headline tag, title tag, proper meta descriptions, assigning proper uh, image alt tags, etc., etc. Optimize your ad extensions. Ad extensions, very example, I explained to you in detail. Use ad exten extensions as per your goals. Uh, use whenever appropriate. Consider scheduling ad extensions as per your office timing or as per your uh, store timing or uh, as per your customer's convenience. You can measure your ad extension performance. So you need to do that periodically. Define your search. Uh, review your location settings important sometimes like people create an uh, ad campaign for us so let's remember that us has 50 states and us the east coast has a lot of search volumes the west coast has a lot of search volumes central part of us does not have a lot of search volume from my experience i'm telling this so you need to uh, further go down further uh, go uh, more detailed you can break down your uh, Locations from overall US to New York, probably New York State, New York City, California, Cal like different cities of California. And you can also try out specific location targeted landing page. Believe me, they work amazing. Save money by scheduling. Schedule your ad only to appear during business hours. I explained this. Increase or decrease your bids depending on the results. Increase quality score. Quality score is the most important factor. And it depends a lot on click through rate. The click through rate of your ads can only be increased when you experiment a lot on the text. So you need to put 
right uh, keywords you know to do a lot of experimentation or to write good ad text optimizing landing pages optimizing ad text pages uh, explained before test out skags very important concept skags is like single keyword ad group so uh, recently a lot of uh, adwords experts have been like, advising this i have also tried myself believe me it works wonders you take a single keyword based on the search volumes or probably which the one which is most important for your uh, target customers create story around it so out of that single keyword you create a landing page you create that ad group and then keep optimizing i'm sure ad your quality score will increase like anything i tried this my quality score increased from 5 to 8 it reached 10 you'll understand how much impact it will have on the cost so probably you will have to pay less than half of what you used to pay before or even even lesser important point keep optimization as a process you need to implement it as a process you need to be doing it so your your cpc and maintain value for money in for high quality scores use cags use tightly themed uh, ad groups and so ask question like do i need to aim for first position because a lot of time first position like the cost per click is very high you can lower your cost per bid you can still be on second and third position uh, so you are still on top of the fold but you are paying much lesser so you need to think about things like that then reallocating budget from underperforming campaigns like remove underperforming campaign or cost them reallocate that same budget do search term reports last point review competitors bid on the competitors names uh, so if i am walmart i would probably bid on my competitor uh, best buy's name so you can also do that get ideas from your competitors how would you do that you can use some innovative tools i have used a tool called spyfu it is an amazing tool it will give you Uh, within a few clicks it will give you all the data about what your competitors are doing you can check out some some of the best practices they are doing remember be different let's take a look at content marketing so it is you know create the content publish or promote it and then distribute it on relevant channels and this this has to be relevant content uh, with which your target audience is looking for and is searching for on the net and this this can be achieved through different marketing channels like uh, you have various social media channels you have your blog uh, there are different channels where you can you know put 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 across your content and this once once you are able to do this i mean it's easier said than done but once if you are able to do this it will help you in increasing the engagement uh, overall Uh, with your brand through this content and it will uh, actually drive a lot of business results but uh, the one thing that we need to really make sure in content marketing is the target audience is actually looking out for the content that we are putting out i mean it should on uh, it should either uh, satisfy a need or a want which your target audience has or it should be some information which they are seeking uh, so so that would be considered relevant content to your target audience okay okay so let's let's take a look at you know what what are the what are the building blocks essentially of content marketing so i think we we went uh, through this in the agenda but so it, it's basically you know this is a this is a process flow which we have so we it all starts with you know defining your goals and mission then taking a look at the target audiences and then taking a call on you know the, uh, which types of content would be helpful to them at various st- stages of the purchase cycle where they are and then brainstorming and using various methods to come up with content ideas which gets fed into a well defined content calendar uh, and then uh, basically you can you know start your publishing creation promotion of content and then measure how it is helping you move towards your business goals and adding value to your business so these are the this is the the process flow which content marketing typically follows okay so let's let's dive into the first sub topic which we have so it says defining goals and mission so any any uh, 
marketing initiative which a business takes it it has goals and missions we have clearly uh, well defined goals and missions behind it and this is a, a very important step to be done because if uh, content um, if a content marketing activity does not have clearly defined goals and missions you might end up creating content but it will be difficult to quantify at the end of your marketing efforts that you know what exactly is is it helping your business achieve so let's take a look at some of the goals typically which you might have so one might be brand engagement so in in the in the age of online uh, marketing brand engagement has grown in, increasingly important and if if your content is able to you know in, engage the audience with your brand it creates a top of a mind recall and uh, over a period of time they might recall your brand when they are making a purchase decision in in the same industry so it is really helpful uh, for brand engagement next is thought leadership so you are uh, you might you might want to establish a uh, thought leadership uh, via your content so you see uh, you might have seen uh, on linkedin there are so many people now who are kind of publishing their their own posts so the reason is that you know they want to publish themselves as thought leaders in a particular uh, industry in which they operate and that is one of the ways of doing it they they are putting out content over there and people come and read it they engage with with the author uh, and that's how over a period of time the author is seen or perceived as a thought leader in that industry so content leadership similarly can help a brand achieve thought leadership in its space then we have new customer acquisition uh, this is a, a very common business goal uh, because it adds directly to your bottom line so the, you would want to acquire uh, new customers via content marketing and the way content marketing kind of helps is you know it it helps Uh, push people down the purchase funnel so maybe uh, i will uh, talk about it uh, later in in the webinar but yeah content marketing uh, can help out uh, if your goal is acquiring new customers then uh, the other thing might be customer loyalty might be one of the potential goals that if you already have your customers uh, and uh, say you ha- you have a call center dedicated to uh, answering their queries you can use content marketing and put out you know faq pages or uh, or a lot of content basically which they might w- potentially want to seek information after they have become your customer so that you know it helps them also uh, acts uh, it helps give them access to information 24/7 and as a business it helps save your money which is spent on call centers which can be you know uh, spent on creating really good content which can be accessed from anywhere 24/7 so yeah so these are like some of the goals which uh, content uh, marketing campaign might have and uh, the takeaway is that it it really makes a lot of sense to define your goals up front so that you can you know uh, have a well defined and targeted content marketing strategy as you go along okay so so you have your goals defined so what do you do next so you would definitely want to have a, a look at the audience which you want to target with your content marketing so you, we say that you know we need to create relevant content through our content marketing efforts but you can't the content cannot be relevant unless you know the audience for whom you want to make the content relevant to so that's the entire purpose of this exercise that you want to define your target audience and uh, there there are uh, various uh, ways of doing this so let's take a look at the potential customers that your business might have so how can how can you uh, how can you define the target audience maybe you can take a look at the way you can segment them by the demographics right where they lie in typically right uh, so by demographics it uh, refers to you know maybe the the age groups in which they lie in or maybe the location from Uh, where they are based out of or gender so these are some of the characteristics by which you can segment your potential customers you can take a look at their interests which we generally call as psychographics so what kind of interest do they have so uh, so how how does this help say uh, for example you 
you have a uh, you have a, a segment of your customers created which you know uh, shows a lot of interest in uh, say cricket so you might want to connect cricket uh, you might want to have content on your site which connects cricket to your uh, product services or talk about them in an interesting manner so this might not be relevant in all the cases but if you can do that then definitely it might you know help in uh, engaging such kind of customers so you you might also uh, want to look at the buying behavior uh, which your customers typically exhibit are they impulsive buyers or uh, they are early adopters or you know they, they are late adopters you can segment uh, uh, by this method the other things you can look at is the digital behavior that you know uh, what other what are the digital touch points do your uh, target audience exhibit where do they uh, spend their time typically on is it you know various social media channels or uh, is it various devices which they use like mobiles or tablets uh, are they pre are they present more on the mobile phones and tablets or they use desktop or or uh, many many other channels i mean what do, do you know, like do your customers typically originate from organic search or uh, is paid search helping your uh, marketing effort so you can take a look at you know the behavior which your target audience typically exhibits in the space uh, then uh, this, this is really important the purchase life cycle stage so uh, essentially you can uh, take take a look at you know what is the decision journey which uh, your target audience typically exhibits so when we talk about decision journey it could be uh, it is typically segmented into you know awareness consideration and purchase so at an awareness stage uh, a potential customer is just aware of the need so uh, say uh, you're selling a credit card so so he he uh, typically would not you know directly uh, zone in on a credit card as his need he pro probably he wants to understand you know how to manage his expenses better so that might be one of the things that he, he searches when he recognizes the need. So what are the kind of touch points that he has digitally when he has recognized that need? And then how does he do the research part of it? I mean, uh, when he's searching for, you know, the best credit, so, so once he has identified he needs a credit card, so queries like, you know, best credit cards or, you know, compare credit cards. So what are the kind of content which he goes through or which other type of content which kind of influences his decision to purchase so that is the, uh, so that's there and then uh, at the purchase uh, stage you know uh, what is the content which is uh, actually uh, helping him make a final decision so uh, if i talk about credit cards uh, it might be uh, you end up on uh, a brand site and then you see a list of credit cards and then you try and uh, fit one of those credit cards to your particular needs like you might want to uh, have a credit card which gives you more air miles or which helps you in shopping so i mean do you have a proper content created on your site which educates the target audience about this or helps helps uh, make them make that decision so that's why understanding all 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 these uh, things are really important but doing your content marketing and the the other this is for the potential customers for the existing customers you can uh, segment them uh, because uh, you have uh, access to the analytics data and you can uh, do a lot more with that you can segment them to the life cycle stage or you can segment them by revenue that the, that segment particular segment brings in or you can uh, look at the past content consumption behavior etc or you can take a look at the engagement metrics so there are, there are various, various methods of uh, segmenting your uh, existing customers so, so this is a, uh, an important uh, aspect of actually, you know, creating these segments, what we call as uh, buyer buyer personas. So personas are uh, nothing but uh, something which represents a particular category of customers. It's not it's not uh, an individual customer, but the information laid out with will you know typically represent a category uh, of customers. And it captures a lot of uh, psychographic and demographic information about that particular customer segment, which the persona is trying to represent. And this includes, uh, you know, their interests, their needs, wants, as we discussed, their desire, desires, or their influences, etc. So, 
So, so let's uh, uh, take a look at an example. Let's uh, assume that uh, we are a company that sells a digital digital marketing product. So this is a typical persona that we might have. So let's take a look at it. So it says name Rohan. Though this does not mean mean anything in our context because you know it's representing a particular category. But just to represent it, we have uh, put a name over there. It says uh, he's a marketer by profession. He works at a large company, so he might be a marketing manager at a large company. Typically, leads a team of five people, right? So we get a clue over there. So uh, suppose uh, this person is trying to make a, a, a purchase decision. So th there might be someone in his team who might be the influencer for it. So he is 40, uh, married, two kids. Typical. Uh, at, at, uh, typical at, at uh, that position then it says the professional goal is increase sales by making sure the prospect pipeline is full so uh, he's basically uh, a person who is maybe responsible for lead gen for his company and uh, he uh, works in an uh, uncertain environment because it keeps on changing all the time and he needs to understand the landscape better to chalk out a better marketing strategy maybe overall it might be a digital strategy and uh, since he's new he wants to improve digital marketing skills and better better the performance reporting which is currently going on in the company so if I'm a digital uh, marketing product company so definitely uh, this is a very important segment to me and uh, I would uh, uh, this is like a sample of the information which we have but uh, I would like to you know fill in more information about this about such segment by you know doing both primary and secondary research. By primary research, uh, we will deep dive into that going for uh, going ahead with the webinar. But that means you know conducting interviews with such kind of people or taking a look at uh, you know what conversation our sales team is having with such kind of people, or or secondary research by you know going on the net and finding out more about them. How this would help us? Uh, let's take uh, he works in an uncertain environment. And say we are a digital marketing product company, and we put put in a, a very good content on our site or, or on other channels about you know how our digital marketing product actually kind of helps uh, marketing managers come up with a better digital marketing strategy to cope up with an uncertain environment. Like ten ways it helps us in doing this. So this would be like something which uh, Rohan might be searching on and might end up uh, uh, interacting with our content and that increases our brand credibility in front of Rohan. This is useful content which actually helps him and then our uh, digital marketing product will be will definitely be in his consideration set the next time you know he's trying to make a decision on uh, going with a digital marketing product. So yeah that's uh, one of the ways which buyer persona would definitely help us in our overall content marketing efforts. Okay, so now uh, we would uh, we take a look at distributing content uh, based on the purchase cycle. So the purchase cycle, uh, as I explained, so it's been uh, split into four stages over here. So I talked about the awareness stage where a person you know is aware about the need, and then we have a research stage where he kind of uh, does research about solving his problem. And then there's a comparison stage where he's trying to get uh, a product which basically uh, satisfies the criteria which he's going after. And then there's a purchase stage where he actually goes ahead and makes the purchase decision. So, so these are uh, like some content types which typically help in this various stages. So if you look at uh, awareness, you know, uh, you have blog posts, so uh, or you have social media updates. So this is an example of a content type which at this stage might help uh, in uh, making the user or the visitor aware about you know that okay that this 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 is one of the ways that uh, my my need can my need can be satisfied or you know even making him aware of the need altogether. So somebody searching for how to manage my my business expenses. So he might get uh, uh, like five to ten ideas and he might not have heard about two or three of them. So. So basically, it helps make him aware about what's there out in the market, and uh, that might lead him to, you know, do further research on his end, and 
research typically he would uh, do on the net or he would want to say attend a webinar or look at industry reports or you know in general do research maybe uh, look at some YouTube videos then uh, then he would uh, then once he's done his research and he's figured out how he's going to solve this problem then he would do a comparison of uh, the top products or the top brands which are available in that space and there are a variety of ways of doing that some of the content which he might use might, might be case studies or he might have a look at customer reviews and testimonials about their experience which uh, typically every one of us does before making a purchase decision or take a look at demos and figure out you know whether it's uh, satisfying his criteria for making the purchase and then uh, when he's in the purchase stage definitely he would want to take a look at you know more detailed product pages or uh, other uh, detailed product reviews which would actually give him an indication of how that product is going to ultimately solve his need and uh, whether it uh, caters to all the criteria that he's going after and that would help him make the final purchase decision. So yeah, this slide in a sense gives us some of the different types of content that you might want to look for while guiding your prospects from the awareness to the purchase stage. Okay, so yeah, so now uh, we have our goals, our target audience and as we said we took a look at you know how we can map the content types to the buying cycle stage so here we have listed uh, some of the content types that we can produce so there are there are a, a lot of content types that can that can be produced so this is just to make everyone aware that you know it's not just a blog entry that we can put or share something on social media there are a lot of engaging content types present it's just that we need to uh, narrow down our goals and target audience and then it will be very easy to figure out which which uh, which of the content types uh, might be useful uh, depending on our products and services so yeah we have you know case studies we can uh, put out white papers there's email newsletters how to's we have webinars videos so videos uh, we uh, have shown a, a, a increase in user engagement so typically if you put a video on a page we see that people tend to engage a lot more with your page and might be interested in the product uh, and we have pdf guides ebooks tools blogs podcast games games can be a good way of engaging you can put quizzes so if i take a, a, the same example of credit card which i had taken earlier so you can have a quiz on your page right so a person comes in and there are five questions which are asked that you know what what is it that uh, your what is the type of rewards that you're looking for so there might be two three options air miles etc etc uh, what is the type of spend that you do etc etc and once he has quickly clicked on these two three questions it will suggest the top three cards which might be relevant to him so it it makes the, the decision that much easier so such kind of content uh, you really have to narrow down you know what your goals are what are the kind of products and services you offer and then it it uh, really becomes much more easy to make a choice of you know which content type would satisfy your uh, the need of your target audience so yeah so these are some of the product types okay so so let's uh, let's take a look at uh, what we uh, call as the content marketing pyramid so yeah so content marketing uh, uh, is a lot to do with quantity as well as quality but increasingly over the years uh, it has been proved that you know uh, really high quality content is the one which actually engages the user a lot more gets shared a lot gets linked to a lot and actually you know helps bring in tangible benefits to the brand and its goals so what it what it means over here is the the more the more efforts you put into your content creation process the the more unique and uh, the more value it will add to users and ultimately the business will benefit a lot more so if you look at the lower end of the pyramid the first and the second levels so you have social media posts and tweets so uh, essentially uh, it's very easy to create a social media post or you know just tweet about something which is happening and typically uh, a brand uh, in today's time tweets you know say 50 to 70 times per day 
So yeah, it, it, it requires uh, comparatively less efforts. Even uh, curated content, which is curated content is nothing but content which is picked up from various sources or you have uh, blog posts or contributed content. So these these type of content are typically uh, require lesser effort, but if you uh, start, you know, taking time out and uh, trying to build quality content, then you can come up with things like infographics or a, a presentation which you can probably share on SlideShare or a webinar which you can have for your customers, or you create an ebook or, or a white paper which uh, actually helps, uh, you know, solve some uh, problem of your target audience or. Uh, adds uh, value to them in their research. So the, these type of content typically cannot be created, you know, in a span of say uh, a week or uh, a week. It typically will require a lot more effort, say 15 to 20 days on an average. Uh, that would well depend on your team, but it would definitely take a lot more effort and it would add a lot more value and it, you will see a lot of visitors over a period of time benefiting from this content would bring in increased engagement. So yeah, so that's what this uh, content pyramid is essentially talking about. That the more efforts you put in to your content uh, marketing, the the uh, your the content that you create will be of higher quality and it will add a lot more value to your target audience and the, and ultimately to your business. So uh, now let's take a look at how you can develop content ideas, right? So you have your target audience, you have your goals, you have your content type figured out. So now you would typically want to figure out, you know, okay, so now what kind of, uh, like what 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 theme or what, what should be the theme of the content or what should the content talk about? So there are uh, like various ways that you can use to do this. So uh, the first box talks about consult. So you can consult subject matter experts in, in that industry it will be these are the other types of content which you know are, would be really helpful to, to somebody who is uh, looking for information in this industry or trying to make a purchase. You can do a brainstorm session with your colleagues that okay, so what what are the type of content they feel you know was uh, requested by your customers or would, would add value to your customers. Or you can talk to your sales team because your sales team is typically having a lot of conversation with your customers and there are many leads they close or do not close, but they do have an idea of what the customers are looking out for. Or you can directly talk to your customers, have a feedback or a survey which you can plan and then get a lot, lot many ideas about which content or information your customers are after. You can uh, do secondary research, uh, you can look, uh, search on the net, take a look at, you know, what kind of content your competitors are developing. Uh, or you can, uh, you know, take up some really uh, good keywords which are being searched in the industry and see, you know, which are the top results Google is throwing up, what kind of content is being shown as relevant to the keywords which are, you know, being searched in your industry. So uh, you can uh, uh, also use uh, content research tools like there's one mentioned over here, ideas.contentfile.com. So later in the webinar, we also take a look at one of the tools. Uh, called Basumo. So that will give you an, uh, it is a, basically a database of content and it can tell you, you know, what kind of content is popular for a subject or is getting shared a lot on social media networks and you would want to take that content idea and, you know, add, uh, uh, modify it a little and add your unique brand voice and want to put it out. So. Yeah, that's one one method. Then you would want to review your existing content. There might be uh, already content on your blog or what you've shared on your social media site, which was really helpful to people and it brought in a lot of engagement. And you can repurpose that content, add uh, add a spin on it so that you know it adds it adds value and also uses the course theme. And uh, you can republish it, or you can, as we said. You know, leverage there in our subject matter experts. Then uh, by, uh, we need to definitely plan ahead. We need to have a content plan and we need to have a content calendar because uh, uh, you know it's very difficult to, without planning it would be very difficult to come up with content marketing ideas close to the publishing date for the content. So you need to definitely have a solid content plan and a strategy in place for content marketing. Okay. So 
so yeah this slide uh, is uh, this is a very good graphic it actually uh, tells you where your content should lie basically you have taken a look at the customer interest and their needs which we have done through the process till now and uh, your uh, and there is uh, like a need for your content to satisfy your business goals and it needs to communicate your brand expertise and value and uh, so typically uh, there is something which the customer wants there is something which your business or your brand wants and you want to have your content in the sweet spot which actually lies at an intersection of you know what the customer wants or what his needs are and what your uh, unique uh, uh, like brand proposition is what a unique brand value is and that is the type of content which will also add value to the customer while making uh, your customer aware of your brand and what you offer and you know uh, get them interested in your product services and help them make a buying decision in the favor of your brand so yeah so that's what this slide essentially communicates now let's take a look at typically what you would want to uh, include in in your content calendar and why you would want to actually have this content calendar so as we said first of all it helps in having a clear plan that okay these are the types of content that you're going to publish say over the next three months and these are the type of content types so uh, once we have the plan this can be distributed among all the different parties that are going to be involved in the various processes like content creation and uh, like content writers who are going to actually write the content or the uh, the SEO team uh, they, they might want to have uh, you know certain keywords inserted in the content so that it will become relevant to keywords which are actually getting searched for or content editors who know that you know they are expecting this content to go live at this date and this is when they need to make sure that the copy is done so it is very very important to have the content calendar in place so that uh, there is a set uh, schedule and everybody who's uh, uh, a part of it knows you know when to play their role and uh, when when they need to essentially uh, contribute to that so these are the some of the things uh, which can be included so in the content calendar we did see an example in the in the last slide we'll just take you through so we can take a look at the theme which is which it is addressing so theme can be like a content theme so like how, how to set up a twitter profile was one of the examples which we saw so uh, so so anything related to twitter profile uh, can be like one theme so what different kind kind of content we are going to create to tackle this theme can be included as part of this then we have the plant post date when we know we are planned to post this content what is the title of the content like we saw how how to post a twitter profile for the creator uh, twitter profile so that can be the title we can add a short description uh, about the content so we can uh, put in the content publication channels the different channels or the different social media channels or the different blogs where we who want our content to go live on we can put the tags so tags can be uh, related to the seo elements like what keywords we want to uh, target what uh, if we have a blog so what category this content should fall under all this can be captured over here so if there's a cta right if it's a blog entry what is the cta which we should have on it or if there are uh, uh, so what what kind of behavior it, it, it is meant to drive like some content would you know uh, drive uh, a newsletter sign up some kind of content would drive a purchase on your site so it makes sense to identify that and that can that can become the intended goal of the content piece so it makes sense to like these are some of the attributes you can definitely as you go along you can add to this list but capturing all 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 these basic elements would uh, really make your content calendar very robust so what what do we need to execute a typical content marketing campaign so you as we talked about we need first of all we need the content definitely so we need it in all the various formats which we have mapped to our target audience so it might be ebooks videos articles but we need to have a, a content calendar in place and we need to have content created uh, as per the content calendar then we need a place to host that content the content that we have created 
so it would also depend on the content type and you know our strategy of where we would want it to reside on so if it's something like a blog post maybe it will reside on our own website or if it's uh, to do with our paid search landing page the content will uh, land uh, will uh, lie on our landing page or if it's a video that we have created then we would want to include it on one of our pages on the site and also maybe host it on youtube because youtube is the second uh, uh, largest search engine in the world and when we can when we can discover the video through youtube itself so yeah we would uh, want to take a call based on the type of content and the strategy that we have in place on where we would want to host that content then we have channels to distribute the content as we said it can be the way social media channels which work for a business or where our target audience typically hangs out or it can be if it's a landing page it is an SEM channel or if it's a newsletter that we have created content for a newsletter then it, it will tie into our email campaign and ultimately then uh, we will talk about the measurement tools so yeah we have the content in place uh, we have done the promotion we the users have engaged so then you would want to essentially know okay so how how is, is how I mean how how is the content marketing essentially move the needle on the performance right did it, uh, what were my engagement metrics before and what are they now like which kind of content is actually resonating with my target audience you know which kind of content they actually are finding a lot of value in which can also feed into my uh, future content calendar uh, if my goal is to you know increase conversions then you would want to take a look at okay so these are the number of conversions how has my content actually contributed in getting these conversions it might not be direct but you can use various attribution techniques to you know uh, say okay so this content has actually played a role in, in in the conversion so it was a part of the customer journey so such kind of measurement uh, tools you would require to actually say uh, back up with data that's okay this is how your content marketing uh, has helped you so what according to you is social media marketing there are nearly 3 billion active social media users across the globe and this constitutes up to 40 percent of the entire world's population and around 90 percent of social media users across the globe access social networks through mobile. Also, the sector is way faster in terms of reaching your customers irrespective of their location status. It mainly refers to the process of obtaining more traffic through social media sites. So this is the major agenda of using social media marketing guys. It is a vast field where you can find evergreen job opportunities for freshers as well as experienced professionals. Some major social media platforms include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and so on. So now that you guys have got a clear idea about what is social media marketing, let's understand its benefit. How exactly social media is going to benefit you or your business. Let's have a look. Social media can help you out in a lot of ways guys. It helps you increase your website traffic, also helps you raising your brand's awareness, helps you in creating your brand identity and also help you in improvising your communication with customers or prospects. So this is exactly how social media is helping you out in delivering your content to your customers or prospects. So moving on, let's understand what keeps social media intact and so much more life. So let's understand how. So we'll mainly discuss about the five pillars in the field of social media marketing. So let's see what are they. So there are five pillars, like I mentioned, which helps in keeping social media marketing alive. So the five major pillars of social media marketing are is the strategy, planning, engagement, analytics and advertising. So let's understand how they help social media marketing. First, we'll discuss about the strategy. So this phase is considered as the major part that drives the growth of your company. It lets you analyze, set relevant goals and also helps you in planning your business. The more effective your strategy is, the more are your chances to being successful. So talking about the strategy, it encompasses everything related to planning, setting goals, how to meet the desired goals, analyzing, how to engage with your audience and so on. And also another major feature I would say about strategizing your social media campaign would be it lets you know what kind of conversation you should have with what kind of uh, intellectual person or so on, something like that. So 
this is exactly how strategy helps in social media marketing now talking about planning a large part of your success in business depends on how well you plan your social media campaigns also before you start posting on social media you need to have an amazing plan guys research about your current market trends and define your target audience and identify which social platform is suitable for your business okay in order to create a good plan having an objective is more likely to help you with that as long as you stick to your plan and work on improvising it you'll be in safe hand guys now moving on to the next important pillar of social media marketing we have the engagement factor as your business grows the reach also eventually increases you'll have a lot of things to take care starting with maintaining a good social profile to interacting with customers on any of the social media platforms you'll be on the edge of your marketing campaign so having good engagement ratio is going to help you with that now the best part is you can track your engagement ratio by using engagement tools like buffer slack and so on it aggregates all your social media mentions also the posts that didn't tag your business's social media profile including a few messages now this was about engagement now talking about analytics social media is a very vast platform where you can promote any of your product analyzing its roots can give you enough kickstart your business growth so analyzing your leads from social media tracking them and converting them is very important you can make use of a few analytics tool like google analytics kismetrics and many more which helps you analyze your website's performance on the ser piece now talking about the fifth and the most important pillar of social media marketing we have the advertising factor have you ever seen some ads which pop up every now and then while you're watching a video these are nothing but the advertisements that are up for promotions social media is so damn powerful that you can manage the status of who can view your advertisement you can always make use of platforms like google ads linkedin ads instagram sponsored ads and so on so this is exactly how you can promote your product by pushing it so advertising is one of the major factors or the major reason for you to even create content in the first place as long as you promote your content or promote your work it will be useful for you as well as the customer or whoever it is on the receiver end so these were the five major pillars of social media marketing now moving ahead let's take a look at the different tools which are used so in this video i'm going to be talking about only two major social media marketing tools so let's understand them in detail so i'm going to be focusing mainly on two tools that are namely buffer and hootsuite so let's understand them in detail firstly we'll talk about buffer so buffer is a software application which is mainly designed for web and mobile it can manage your social accounts by helping you schedule posts on facebook instagram and so on and also the best part about this is it lets you analyze your results and provide means to communicate and engage with your customers this is an extension guys and also this browser extension is one of the latest productive hacks i've tried to list down a few notable features of this so let's have a look it is easy to share your posts faster using buffer's browser extensions it is free of cost guys and you can share your tweets at the right time if you get any tweets or retweets you can just tweet back or you can just retweet at the right time and also it is easy to track top performing contents if you're going to be working on a keyword like say digital marketing for example if you're going to be working on digital marketing you want to know the top performing content right so this tool helps you give you the insights about the top performing content and also you can easily customize your scheduling process for each platform you can also make use of the chrome extension like i mentioned to add articles and contents from web to your buffer queue or share the content on the go now moving on to the next tool that is hootsuite hootsuite is one among the most widely used social media marketing platforms and it was created by ryan holmes in 2008 this social media marketing platform lets you build smarter workflows scales across your organization and delivers demonstrable roi this amazing tool allows you to collaborate with your team member alongside the major benefit of seeing your comments and mentions in one place you can also assign tasks plot a social media calendar and schedule your updates over there 
So this was about the two major tools which are used for social media management. Now moving on to the next part of the session. Let's take a look at the different tips that I'm going to be giving you related to social media marketing. A few tips from my end to help you out with social media marketing guys. So the first thing you should do is identify your market goals. Set a proper goal and try to work towards it and create unique and specific strategy for each social media platforms. If you're working on Facebook, you need to have a different strategy. If you're working on Instagram, you need to be very unique and different. Always be consistent guys and always choose the right platform that is the right social media platform for promotion. See you need to know how to analyze your website guys. Once you know that you're getting traffic from one of the marketing channels, you should focus on that. And if you're not getting more traffic from one of the channels, you should try focusing on a different channel and try to you know elaborate or try to be more interactive with your customers and try to create more good content. So this is exactly how you can get more traffic. Also focus on your messaging part because it has a greater impact on your website as well as your business. Always be up to date with the latest technology trends. This is a must guys. If you're working on social media platforms, you need to be very up to date with the technology trends. Also know how to analyze your results and focus on the part which needs more attention. So this is how any company grows. This is exactly how anybody comes to the first position in the SARBs. So know how to analyze your results. Okay, so these were a few tips from my end guys. Now coming to the last part or the final part of this session. Let's understand how to choose the best social media platform. Knowing what to market and how to market plays a vital role in choosing the right social media platform. So here are a few points that you should consider before selecting any social media platform. Seek out your target audience guys focus on what your customers are looking for and try to deliver accurate results. Also define a good set of goals and build a good business strategy. Always concentrate on what your customers want and delivering good content requires a lot of research and also you should be good at social media management tools and also distributing your content is a must guys. If you're working in an e-commerce site, you should know how to handle posts. You should know how to analyze your results. You should know how to track them and so on, right? So these are a few factors which you should consider before selecting any social media platform. Now let's get into the first topic of the day, which is understanding affiliate marketing. And how we're going to do that is we're going to do that by an example. We all know about car deco. Now Priya, an imaginary character in this particular case, is planning to buy a new car. Now she is confused between two different models. And what she does is she goes to cardeco.com, maybe compare it and get some guidance. That is how a usual consumer goes and researches about a product. Now, moving ahead, she made check all the details and reviewed all of the details of the two or three options, whichever she was looking for on Cardeco, and she made her choice. Now, she checks all the offers which are available, selects her nearest dealer, and fills out a form with her contact info. What is the business model for Cardeco then? I mean, they just simply took the lead and passed it on to the next company which was in this particular case Maruti. Now, during the entire process, Kardeko did not charge Priya anything for the service. She was able to check reviews. She was able to check the features. She was able to compare all the cars. All of this was free of cost. So what is Kardeko actually doing? Why are they doing this for free? And, and the biggest question is how do they make their money? Now, the answer lies in the next Slide, which is they earn their money through affiliate marketing. Now let's go step by step into this and see that how it works. Now the first of all, the seller strikes a deal with Cardeco.com. Now about this deal, we're going to talk about it. Second, Cardeco.com places the seller's offer on the website. Now Priya sees these offers and then she fills out a particular form. Now Cardeco, what it does is either automatically or manually sends the lead to the nearest seller. Now it could be a showroom as well. Now 
seller receives the lead and makes a contact with priya and let's assume the purchase is made and even if the purchase is not made carmeco.com earns a commission for a lead the seller gives the carmeco commission for a lead or for a sale now that is how carmeco.com makes its money now that brings us to the definition of affiliate marketing in simple terms affiliate marketing is promoting a product in return for a commission on the sale now think of affiliates as commission agents or just think about affiliates as one of your brokers and just like any real estate broker gets some money whenever there's a sale done for a particular house the same way affiliates also get their commissions now affiliate marketing is an extension of performance marketing performance marketing happens within a particular company and affiliate marketing is dependent upon the people who are outside of your company moving ahead let's look at some of the key terminologies which are used in affiliate marketing number 1 it is a merchant now merchant also known as advertiser or a seller is the product owner whose product is being promoted and who sells the product now in case of let's say amazon dabur for example is not a product owner the product owner at this particular point of time because it is displayed on amazon amazon is the merchant or an advertiser or a seller moving ahead now why merchant needs affiliate marketing large e-commerce players lack a critical piece of organic traffic or engaging content let's take a very simple example of camera and let's take it as a product which has been displayed on a large e-commerce company for example an amazon or a flipkart now the amazons and the flipkarts have a difficulty in targeting the non commercial early stage search traffic now the reason why i'm telling you that is let's say you search for best cameras of 2021 and in that particular case assuming amazon's search result do not come up at the top but an affiliate website or a youtube video or anything of that sort comes up there and then you find the links and that is how they get more traffic onto their own website now affiliates with high quality relevant seo friendly content can actually fill in the gap exactly how it happened or in the case of the camera now small merchants lack the resources and the market reach and when you are talking about resources it could be the internal team or it could be the lack of marketing budget now affiliates provide the market access the reach and the branding as well now in this particular case affiliates are an extension of a marketing team and they start keeping the marketing cost in check now the merchants because they do not have a unlimited amount of money like how large e-commerce is have they can always make sure that their marketing cost is in check moving ahead how affiliate marketing benefits the merchant number 1 they get a extra set of traffic without spending any money because traffic is not monetized secondly there is no risk advertising that means you have to pay only when someone buys the product number 3 build the brand especially for the new businesses now assuming i am a small time t-shirt maker and somebody who's very famous a fashion model or somebody just posts about that and posts through our affiliate link then in that particular case you will be able to get the business from us and they can build the brand for me now again one of the great things about affiliate marketing is that you get a lot of backlinks without doing any effort and the only thing which you will have to do is that you have to pay once the sale is done which is pretty much okay with almost any entrepreneur moving ahead now let's talk about the affiliate affiliate or a publisher is either a site or a company or an individual that is promoting the product and gets a commission for each sale they usually have a niche audience as i told you about the example of camera is the best example here 
let's say there's a assuming there's a photography.com and then they tell you about the best cameras for 2020 or 2021 they have a very niche audience of just those photographers and that is what is the best part about being a publisher or an affiliate now why affiliates need affiliate marketing because of that actually there are millions of sites that receive heavy traffic but they do not have any product to sell now also in the same scenario some of them might not have large enough traffic but have really really loyal visitors now ads is an effective monetization option when the page is views in millions now any blog let's say you start any blog tomorrow and if you have 200 people or 500 people coming onto your website on a daily basis and if you try to put in ads there it is not going to give you a lot of income but again let's assume that you own photography.com and again 500 people only are coming through it but one of them decided to buy a product from your website now in that particular case you're going to get a very decent cut out of the sale which eventually is going to help you monetize your visitors and also this gives you a source that your information on the website whatever you are promoting is actually making sense moving ahead how affiliate marketing benefits the affiliates first of all you can monetize your traffic because if a person comes over to your website clicks on that camera link goes ahead and buy that camera in that particular case, you're going to be monetizing yourself. Secondly, it is more profitable than running ads. Now, the reason why it is more profitable than running ads is, first of all, we know that there are ad blocker pop-ups. There are ad blocking browsers which are available now. So, ads actually on third-party websites are going down as we can already see it then affiliate becomes a better option in order to start making money on your website now third thing is that you should have a better control of what visitors see and buy whenever we are talking about better control over what visitors see and buy that means you are putting the direct links of the products you're giving a proper photo shoot and you're doing all of those efforts and you have a better control of it because in cases of ads, you do not have a very good control that who will be advertising on your platform. That is where affiliate makes more sense. Now, number four is that ability to offer custom deals to promote sales. That is also one benefit which affiliates get. Moving on, there are a lot of affiliate websites which are available. Now, if you want to see a review comparison website, we've already talked about cardeco.com. But if you are into mobiles, you must have always heard about GSM Arena. Secondly, now there are some loyalty and reward websites as well. Because it just doesn't make sense for them. So they want a more loyal customers coming onto their website. So every time somebody buys anything from their website, they provide some sort of a loyalty points as well to those. So that they keep on visiting their websites, buy again from their affiliate links and so forth and so on. Now, number three are your coupon websites, Coupon Dunya. Now, what they do is that they provide you with a coupon code, which might be available somewhere else as well. But once they give you that coupon code, they redirect you to the merchant website. Number four, large media websites. It could be Hindustan Times, it could be Wall Street Journal or anybody of those sort. So they are also doing the same thing because again, you have more control and you get a lot of money coming out of by doing the affiliate marketing. And the last and not least are like blogs. Again, as I told you about, let's assume you own photography.com and you are making those blogs and forums. Moving ahead, we're going to talk about the customer. Now, this is the end point of the cycle. Now, customers are drivers of any affiliate marketing program. So basically, when a consumer buys a product or service via an affiliate, the affiliate also gets a cut and the merchant shares the profits and he gets the same. Now, this is how the affiliate network or a platform works. An affiliate network or platform is a third-party platform that acts 
as an intermediary between the merchant and the affiliates. They charge a fee for being a middleman. Now think of it as one more layer in the graphs which we saw before and these are the people who actually manage your affiliates. So if there's a merchant, there's an affiliate network and there would be multiple affiliate which would be there within a affiliate network. Now here are some of the examples of affiliate network or a platform. Now first of all is commission. Then we also have Comly, we have share a sale and we have Qlux. Now let's talk about affiliate program. Affiliate programs are a type of an affiliate network. These are the programs which are set by large companies who want to get their affiliates on board and to get more traffic to their website by reaching non-commercial or early stage search traffic. Now just to give you an example, affiliate program is something which has the fee structure that how much are you is an affiliate going to get if he sells a particular product or a particular type of product or a product in a certain category it could also include the basic operating procedure that how do you go ahead and make your own custom links and share it on your blog or a website and it does include the payouts when the payouts are going to happen now how it works is that affiliate program generates the traffic for the website and in turn gives the commission on the sale. Moving along, some of the affiliate program examples are as follows. Now, Amazon Associates is probably one of the most popular affiliate program. eBay Partner Network is also there. Shopify and Flipkart also owns a affiliate program. There are some other key terminologies which you should be knowing about the affiliate market. Number one is fee. A percentage of sale or a fixed amount which is paid to an affiliate. Now fee as I told you previously could be different for each and every company and could be different for each of the categories within a particular company or even to a certain level to a product as well. Now link views is that how many times the product link was viewed on an affiliate site or a network. For example, assuming you are an affiliate and you put up a link for Amazon on your website. Now, how many times a person has clicked on that link and went over to the website? That is what is considered as link views. Moving on, clicks. How many people went to the merchant's site by clicking the affiliate link? Number four is our average order value. Now, size of the average order in INR or any applicable currency. Earning per click, which is your total commission, how much you have got within a time frame and total number of clicks generated by an affiliate in a given period. Moving along, we're going to talk about how it works, how affiliate marketing works. Now, first of all, in the first step, affiliate obtains a merchant's product details and creatives, sometimes directly from the merchant or from the affiliate network. Number two, affiliate uploads the products or creatives with a special link. It is also known as parameterized link that contains your affiliate ID so that the consumer visits an affiliate site and clicks on merchant's product or a creative or a link, anything. Now, a cookie or a code is sent on consumer's browser which identifies the merchant affiliate which is you in this particular case and the link. Moving on, consumer is redirected to the merchant's website. Now, whenever he goes to the website, then affiliate identity is captured by the merchant URL. Moving on, the consumer purchases from the merchant website and Cookie information is sent to an affiliate or affiliate network. Now, merchant auto transmits the sales information to the affiliate network, which includes the affiliate ID. Now, affiliate network tracks the sales and the transactions with matching to that affiliate ID. Now, affiliate and merchant reconcile the transaction and merchant pays the affiliate directly. Now, if you are a company who wants to set up their own affiliate marketing. How are you going to do that? We're going to be talking about the same thing now. 
what are the basic requirements of a merchant if you want to set up your affiliate network now number one is that you should have a product to sell then secondly you need an affiliate platform number three you need to have an offer or a fee that you will pay to the affiliates number four you should have a very compelling product description Number five, you should have the creatives such as banners or images or something of that sort or a video even to make sure that whenever you're sending it out to an affiliate network, it actually gets clicked. And the last is a sales pitch that why should an affiliate work for you? Because assuming if you're pitching out to a lot of affiliates, then you need to lure them with something. It could be a high fee or it could be an instant payout or it could be anything of that sort. Now, moving on, the second thing which you have to do if you want to set up your affiliate network is that you need to find your right affiliates. Now, as a merchant, it is very critical to find the affiliates that are in line with your brand. Now, what affiliates to have audiences that need your product? But this audience should not be the same as your current set of customers. Why is that? The reason behind that is that you're going to be giving the same a fee to those people who would have any way come over to your website and bought it from you. Number three, you want the affiliates to have an in-depth understanding of your industry. However, they should also not be your direct competitor. Affiliates should get you sales. but they should not be pushy. Now, the third thing which you need to do is that you have to decide the fee. First of all, affiliates take a share of your profits, which is true. Therefore, it is important to determine the amount of revenue you want to share with the affiliate. Now, it depends upon if you already have a certain amount of affiliates or if you're just trying to set up an affiliate. And that is how it's going to work out. It should be substantial enough to motivate an affiliate and leave you with your decent margins as well. Number four, the pricing model can be chosen depending upon your business goals. Now, you might pay out a lot of money in the very start if you're a very small company because they're saving you on your marketing budget. But let's say you're a big company and you have the upper hand then in that particular case, your pricing model could be a little cheaper. You could pay a little lesser fee or you could pay it in after a couple of months. So you have to decide on those particular fee processes. Now, there are multiple pricing models. Now, the first of them is pay per sale, which is the percentage of the sale price of the product, which you pass it on to an affiliate. Then the second one is pay per click. This is not very much used now but based on the clicks and traffic generated on the merchant's website. Number three, you have pay per lead. Remember the first example which you saw, cardeco.com? That could actually work out as a pay per lead. Number four is pay per performance, which is based on your pre-decided consumer action. Now, it could be a download, it could be a referral, or it could be anything else. Now, let's talk about the affiliate platform demo. Whenever you have a website of your own and you want to set up your own affiliate program, you can easily go to sharesale.com and follow the steps to set up your merchant account. Now, in this particular step, what you can do is like set up the rules, set up the processes, set up the fees, set up the payout mechanism and all of those details to start your own affiliate program. And Share a Sale is a platform just for that. Now, moving ahead, setting up affiliate marketing as an affiliate, that is what we are going to start to learn. What do affiliates actually need? They first of all need a website with good content. Now, in some cases, this could be also a good account of a social media which has a lot of following. Now, you need a large loyal audience. Now, this again could be a social media audience or could be a website audience as well. Number three, the most important step which you need to pass is the merchant approval in order to become their affiliate. Now, these approvals are based on multiple things. It could be on your social media following. It could be about what type of a website do you have? Is it secure? Is it mobile optimized? Yes, no. So all of these things merchant makes and keeps the guidelines of in order to give you an approval to become an affiliate. Now. 
moving ahead let's assume that you have gotten the approval from the affiliate from the merchant then in that particular case your first big thing would be getting visitors on your website first of all you need to think very carefully that where can you compete now this could be a niche you might be good at or this could be a niche which is a market gap now once you do that research you make a website on that you start putting content into that and then you start doing those affiliate links now moving ahead you need to leverage social media to promote and build a community number 3 you need to use your referral links which are there on the related blogs and the website now how that happens is that once you become an affiliate you are given an access and then you can create your own special links and you need to use those special referral links on your blogs number 4 you need to join forums and start promoting your products there number 5 you need to generate the referral traffic to this website but do not randomly push the affiliate links it will be considered as a spam it's always a good idea in terms of content marketing you have already learned about it that it's always better to help the person rather than starting to push a person to do a certain action number 6 use ads if it is allowed or for your own brand but only after testing the conversions number 7 catch people early in their buying stage before they have decided to buy using your seo again this brings me back to the topic of photography.com if you have a blog which says the best cameras of 2020 there are chances that you're going to be ranking on the seo and once you're ranking on the seo you will be getting a lot of traffic and in turn a lot of sale and in turns a lot of fee coming to you moving ahead seo and engagements are the key consider your blog again as i say photography.com you need to target the informational searches now when i talk about informational searches is again bringing back to the same example then you need to focus on the long tail keywords This is again which you've already learned in SEO, but this is a snapshot of how you should be doing it for an affiliate marketer. Number three is that you create useful, in-depth content like tips, reviews, and resources. And number four, you need to use lead magnets such as free trials or samples or something of that sort. Number five, you need to create email list using forms and social media. so that you can target them later again whenever you write a new blog with your affiliate links in those moving on you need to start promoting the right products again which is going to keep one example as i've already talked about it multiple times you need to search and find the products that fits your niche you could be a photographer you could be a videographer you could be a fashionista you could be anybody just focus on your niche so that it does not sound like spamming assuming you're a makeup artist and you suddenly see that there's a lot of interest on the photography then in that particular case it's ideal that you should not put your photography cameras on your makeup website now number 2 keep the product portfolio small enough to stay on top of the updates and the changes now when i say product portfolio that means again the products which are fitting in your niche and you need to keep them there so that you can keep on regularly make changes on it until unless you have a really large team now number 3 never keep all of your eggs in one basket now when i say that that means don't just join one affiliate program don't leave all your money on the table with one table itself join multiple affiliate programs Number 4 you need to research the merchant before signing up some of those you know might be extremely new they might not pay you out or something of that sort and on the other hand you can always go with the most popular ones something like amazon number 5 prioritize high selling products automated scripts and programs can be used for it now when you say prioritize high selling products it could be high selling in a certain time assuming you are in a situation of covid and you think that selling these masks would be a good idea at this particular point of time you can go ahead and start doing that because there are high selling products right now or hand sanitizers or anything on that sort 
So what you can do is create a share a sale affiliate account. Now we have already talked about the merchant account on share a sale. You can also create a affiliate account on share a sale. Now for that you need to visit shareasale.com and create an affiliate account. Then you will need a live website to create an account. Share a sale usually takes one business day to review your application and then they're going to come back to you telling you that if your website is good enough to be a part of share a sale affiliate account. So whenever you do that, you will see a dashboard preview and those dashboard previews will have all of your details of all the merchants you're working for. What are you earning from where are you earning? And you will get a sample reports which are there here in this particular slide. The other one which is extremely popular is Amazon Associates. Because Amazon being the largest e-commerce in the world, you could always go ahead to affiliateprogram.amazon.in and log in with your Amazon ID. Now what you need to do is like follow these steps to create your account and your application will be reviewed after your website drives a minimum of three valid sales within the 180 days of registering. Now, what you need to do is to make sure that you are not using any sort of a bad IDs. Your website is properly secure. It has the SSL certificate on it. It should have enough content on it and it should not be a spammy website. And that is when you get a green signal from Amazon. Now, once you do that, you're going to see a dashboard from where you could actually create the links and also look at your earning review. Now, in order to create a link on Amazon Affiliate, you need to find something which is known as the ASIN number of a product. Now, once you do that, you need to copy paste into the bar and click on go. And then after that, you could get multiple set of structures of your link. So it could be a short link, it could be a preview along with the image, without the image, etc, etc. So you can go ahead and customize that literally copy paste that code or the link onto your website and you're good to go. On the other hand, you also get to see your fees, bounties and clicks. Now fees is something is what you earn. Bounties is what you get when you sign up somebody for let's say Amazon Prime and clicks are the number of clicks which you actually got onto the website for the Amazon. Moving on, affiliate marketing since it comes with a lot of upside, it also comes with a lot of downside as well. Now, affiliate marketing has a lot of frauds as well. So the first fraud which is there is fake conversions. That means that you're deploying bots or using click farms to generate a fake conversion. Number two is the content duplication, which means that copying content from genuine affiliate websites to create a shadow website of your own. Number three is cookie stuffing. That means generating malicious cookies that provide a fake tracking code which trigger fake sales. Number four is your load time fraud. Loading destination page in the background to fudge the clicks and time spent on the website. Number five is your type of frauds. Buying a domain that is almost as same as the official website. Some amazing facts about email marketing uh, which I have for you. One very important point is that during consumer surveys, whether in US or in India, most of the uh, consumers, they have always been willing to connect with the brands on email. So uh, let's say you called a, a motor company and you inquired for a car. Like, okay, I want to buy a new car. This is the new model. Can you tell me something more about it? And or what are your costs, etc.? What do you charge upon the showroom price? Those kind of things. Now, receiving an email with the entire details makes things easier for you, right? So uh, a lot of people think that interacting on email makes the entire purchase journey more fruitful for them. So that's the reason most of the people ask for their email correspondence. Now let's uh, shift our focus to a very important fact that again, Facebook is over 1 billion users. You have to Twitter around 340 million users as well. But email in terms of customers 
it has three times more customers than Twitter and Facebook combined. So that's a very important fact which, which gets neglected. And again, a lot of people say that uh, in email, uh, even if the number of customers are more, the engagement is higher on Facebook and Twitter. I agree to some extent, yes, you can engage with your customer on Facebook and Twitter, but there are different uh, resources for it. So for example, for example, uh, Facebook and Twitter, they have their own idea for uh, like Facebook, you, you won't go to, you don't go to Facebook to uh, see ads or buy a product, right? It's something like TV. When you uh, watch television, you're looking forward to a show. Ads, etc., are targeted to you depending upon your customer profile, depending upon what kind of show you are watching. So those kind of things happen. This happen along with the content. But in email, if uh, the slight difference is that in email, actually you are looking for something. That's the reason you have subscribed to a particular, you have given your email ID to a particular website or a company because you want something from them. That is one a very important reason. So. Moving on, so why it should matter to you as a business person or as a marketer or a, let's say a student, why a email marketing should be an important field for you, right? So I just, I think I have a question, just a second. So we have two questions from uh, Kiran Aryan. Right, so how far it is profitable? Yes, uh, we will discuss some stats on profitability as well. And there's one more question, how can we make a short and effective email that may not make the recipient bored to read? Yes, uh, in fact, not in this presentation, but uh, definitely in our email marketing course, we have almost an entire module dedicated to how to write an effective email and how to make it more, how to make it more engaging and how to make it more action oriented for the customer. So uh, as I was talking about why it should matter to you. So email adds value to both your sales and service. So if let, let's, let's discuss a sales cycle. So what happens in a sales cycle is that you reach out to a customer. It can be an inbound lead. For example, it can be a lead which uh, the customer came to your website. Uh, he gave you his email ID and phone number or it can be you have a telesales network where you are calling prospective customers and getting details from them for the interested customers or it can be pure referrals. So in each of these, once you have started the sales cycle, an email becomes an integral part of it. We, be it sharing details uh, with the customer, be it giving more inputs to the customer. Let's say I have, I want to buy a product and I am convinced with two features of it, of the product. Let's say insurance. I am convinced that, okay, the sum is short is right for me. The premium is right for me. I just want to know more about the policy in a very simple term, which I'm not able to, let's say, understand from the website. So, so in that case, email plays a very important role, the way you nurture your lead. Same with the service. Now take a scenario. Again, uh, let's take uh, insurance as an example. So there's a customer who has bought a policy from you, right? And he has made a payment. Now he's expecting his uh, next step for the policy. And in an insurance policy, the steps, there are a number of steps after the policy as well. From insurance to let's say, uh, sorry, from uh, booking to issuance. So from booking to issuance, it's a whole uh, cycle. And there are a number of steps. So let's say if the customer has bought a health insurance policy, so next step would be Insurer will check whether there is any additional document required uh, from the customer, whether there is any additional med medical required for the customer, and then it will go to the underwriter and then so and so forth. You will send a communication to the customer, your policy has been issued, you will send a soft copy and then you will send a hard copy. So in all these uh, communications, email is not only very uh, relevant, is also the cheapest option. So giving a customer a call for every minor detail might not be very feasible for an organization, especially when you have, let's say, thousands of customers and you have almost 30, 40,000 policies being sold on a daily basis. So that in that perspective, email becomes a very important tool. And whatever be your goal in your organization, 
it can be email can play a very important role in every every uh, goal of your organization and in fact in our course uh, that we have uh, going forward we'll see the different cycles different kind of business goals that are there for a company that can be there for the company and how email fits into every uh, every role basically so it's very important that you align your business strategy in the email strategy it cannot function as a stand alone uh, function of your uh, organization it has to be what you are what you want to achieve as a business should reflect in your email strategy and one important bit i want to break that email is only transaction nature it's not in fact email like these days twitter is being used to promote let's say your initial launch or you want to generate hype around something twitter is a very important tool and yes it is it draws engagement it reaches to a certain people people talk about it yes but email also plays a very important role especially if you want to test a campaign you want to reach out to a set of targeted audience who and you want some response so you can share your campaign you can include a feedback form into it and get some uh, thoughts or if you want to see let's say you just want to promote your teaser so there's a again even if you have a teaser on youtube or any other tool you can share those things on email and see the response from the customer so in all these thing email can play a very important role so let's see how email performs on three very important r's one is uh, reach relevance and roi so uh, let's see what are the industries where email makes more sense so as i discussed uh, about the examples of uh, finance and insurance it makes maximum sense for them because this is a uh, one industry you can take banking you can take insurance even something like credit card loans any business so this is one industry where sales and service are very highly dependent on email to reach out to their customers so that's the reason they are the top email senders and there should be no surprise uh, about this in fact if we do a similar breakup for overall marketing still finance and insurance will uh, will top this chart reason being as an industry finance and insurance they have the maximum margin compared to other industries on their products and they have the biggest marketing uh, marketing budgets in their uh, in compared to other industries the reason being that these guys uh, they uh, they have to the competition they are in plus the kind of uh, misgivings customers usually have about the financial products they have to really spend more and reach out to the audience engage more with the audience to get their point across and then uh, going down further you can see telecom is the next best advertising industry itself uses almost uh, 12.10% uh, of the total and that is third on the list next comes your healthcare entertainment retail etc even social media to an extent uses emails so there is a small 4.50% which is being used by social media let's start the comparison game with email for a moment so let's see how the numbers stack up which is discuss that email has thrice the number of account, account uh, compared to facebook and twitter now let's compare with the search engine search engines get the maximum amount of traffic it is widely understood that and it includes all in uh, search engines it includes a google it includes a bing yahoo everyone but compared to email on a daily basis this traffic is only one out of 100 of the total email traffic so that as minute as you can see even in terms of bandwidth what uh, email consumes across the world all pages view on the web in a day all pages means all websites everything across the world it just makes up to it just consumes only one fourth of the bandwidth consumed by email you can see uh, the kind of power email has still when the when people think that okay it's, it's not going to do it's not going to work well email will be no more very soon so let's see how it compares with their offline counterparts let's talk about some major uh, measurability of different mediums for example television television is a mass medium no doubt about it it is a very important medium to reach out to a very large audience at a time it also requires a lot of money but the shortfall for an uh, 
TV is there is no view for who is watching your ad and everything is decided based on a comparative rating system to evaluate how much how many people it reached so it can be in terms of your uh, TV rating system like per thousand or just comparison ratio like 3.9 4.9 compared to others so it doesn't give a very clear picture to what actually happened to your campaigns now the second uh, very important is direct mail so through direct mail you know who is receiving your mails that is that is for sure because you are mailing them to your customers with your with their addresses and phone numbers etc but you have no view if the mail has been delivered or has been read by the receiver whether it ha it has reached the mailbox it is just lying in the mailbox or it has just found the dustbin as it reads the as it reads the customer it has opened or not no idea so this is a one shortcoming that direct mail has coming on to the email the kind of technologies we have uh, as of now you can view who all received your email you have the list you have customer profiles based on your segmentation you can view how many people opened it clicked it and within the email what they did with the, with your email so let's say you have uh, four links in your email uh, let's say you are a, a electronics company and you have sent a mail to a customer with four different mobile phones and four links so you can actually see which in which phone the customer was interested in you can actually get the data on that okay there's a particular uh, iphone which customer clicked on and reached the landing page and you can then do a back analysis that i sent mail to 100 people with the same uh, four mobile phones most of the customers were interested in this and reach to the reach the website using this uh, particular uh, phone and then you can have a strategy based on that uh, just before we move on we have a uh, i just like to take a question so there's a question that from i think from aryan uh, kiran aryan is there any proper format that to uh, convert an email into a lead yes there it's a there's a whole uh, sales cycle which involves converting a lead to a conversion so again uh, we'll be discussing we'll be we'll be having more discussions on it uh, on the uh, lead to conversion cycle in our course uh, which which will be begin very shortly and there moving on so now let's do the bigger comparison email marketing versus social media marketing and purely numbers so we have discussed some theoretical things about uh, what how email can be more efficient than social mar media marketing in theory we have discussed but now let's get on some numbers and see what what exactly is happening in different mediums so ctr is a click click through rate so click through rate is something like for example let's say uh, i have sent 100 emails or 100 advertising messages on facebook twitter or anywhere to a to, uh, to a customer to different customers now out of those 100 let's say uh, five click on that message so ctr for that particular engagement for that model will be 5 out of 100 that's the ctr so higher ctr means your campaigns are doing well you are performing well so on facebook with the latest data that we have average ctr on facebook is 1.49% and that's a pretty decent uh, ctr for a social media platform on twitter the ctr is slightly higher because the customers are slightly more engaged on twitter so it's 1.64 but nothing in comparison to email where the average ctr on email is around 5.2% so it's almost uh, like triple of what you have on facebook or twitter that's the kind of ctr that you get and ctr is a very important metrics when you are tracking your campaign on online so be it your search engines be it your social media campaigns even your youtube campaigns companies target CTR is a very important, very very important medium. Now look at the conversion rate. So what what is the conversion rate? Conversion rate is something that uh, let's say you uh, re reach out to hundred people, five of them clicked on your ad. Now when they click on your ad, they will reach to your website. Once they have reached your website, there will be certain consumer action. Some uh, let's say for you a conversion is if user gives his phone number and email ID. 
and let's say registers for a newsletter. So for a company that can be a conversion. For a credit card company it can be an application. Customer went to the website and filled up the entire information which is required for a credit card and submits it so that's a conversion. So if we compare the conversion rates of different mediums like search engine, social media or email. Search engine has a very healthy conversion rate which is 2.5 percent. Social media is slightly low on conversions for obvious reason because it's, it gives you more engagement rather than conversions. And email again shines through with the highest conversion rate of 4.25 percent. Let me explain you a bit about search engine while I compare it with email. So in search engine what happens is let's say when you go on Google you type something and then results are displayed. So basically there is a user intent let's say I want to buy shoes I will type buy shoes and then I will get to see two ads on the top and then the organic results. So the top two ads are based on my query. So I have typed buy shoes so those, those ads will talk about shoes. They will not talk about bags or shirts or jeans etc. So there is a user intent which in turns if you give the right kind of ad to a user he will click on it and maybe what he wants he will get it. So, uh, so that why, that, that's the reason this 2.50 figure becomes very important because that is derived from a user intent. Now email is still beating the user intent and getting a conversion rate of 4.25 percent and that shows how effective the medium is. So whether as we discussed whether it's your initial reach, you're creating buzz, you're uh, engaging with the customer and finally the most important thing for a company conversion email still stands very very uh, strong ground on that as well. Moving on uh, see all mediums are important in their own way. So we cannot just say that email is uh, doing everything for us so we'll ignore all your Twitter and Facebooks and everyone. So these mediums have different purposes. So let's analyze the purpose of Twitter and Facebook before we get into the purpose of email. So generally uh, as far as Twitter is concerned people use Twitter to find interesting things. So when you follow somebody on Twitter you follow that somebody because you want to hear something from that somebody. It can be your uh, prime minister of the country, it can be your favorite uh, actor, actress, your favorite sports star or any other channel that you want to uh, explore. So you want to hear from some somebody uh, you like their views and you want to hear more from them. So that is one one way. So how do brands use the medium? Brands use the medium to engage with their customers. So one very important uh, engagement uh, feature of Twitter is that for most brands it has become a grievance redressal mechanism. So basically uh, let's say if I uh, if I bought an Airtel connection and there is some problem in it. I'm not very happy with that connection. Now I can either write a uh, email to them or I can maybe call them on their customer care which will uh, loop me into IVR and I'll take a lot more time to reach out to the agent and explain into uh, explaining to them my problem. Or I can write on Twitter, I can write, I can just uh, write a post on the Twitter handle of Ayrton and ask them okay uh, what's going on. So on Twitter now ATL has to respond pretty quickly because that tweet is, is visible to your followers as well. So a lot of people can see that this person is facing a problem with ATL, right? So when you, uh, so it becomes the onus is on the company to respond pretty quickly. So that's the reason Twitter becomes very important for these kind of conversation. Also if you want to run a contest on Twitter, so you can do that. So if you are able to trend your hashtag pretty well during a day or for a whatever time your promotional activity is going, then you can engage your users by giving some decent contests, they'll participate in it and that will spread the word. So these are the kind of things that Twitter can be used for. Now coming on to uh, Facebook, Facebook is generally uh, people used to finally interact with their friends and share their stuff. So you go to Facebook to see what your connections are doing, what all places they have visited, uh, what was what what was the recent uh, review that they wrote, something like that. So what other people are doing, mainly your friend, uh, 
your friends and your family etc now as far as facebook ads are concerned brands have been using it lately for the past one year or so to put relevant ads to attract user attention so over a period of time based on your data they figure out okay what kind of uh, what kind of user behavior you have what what kind of things you like based on your posts etc so based on that behavior they try and give you relevant ads on the right hand side or or in the middle so that is a uh, so as a medium it helps in getting attraction but again the sole purpose of a of a facebook ad should not be to convert that user and make him purchase something it should be to reach out to your users and tell them what they are doing what you are doing to communicate with the customers rather than put put them under a bracket that okay now you it's time for you to buy so those that kind of behavior should be discouraged now uh, compared to the social media uh, counterparts email is more transactional in this it's a one on one kind of a conversation happening between me and the brand so let's say i have subscribed to a website i subscribe to let's say uh, a website which gives me very handy newsletters on what is happening in the email world so instead of and i let's say i i uh, respect the views on the website which i respect the content i just like the content and see and the people who uh, uh, create that content so for me that becomes a one stop shop for my uh, for my engagement with uh, with that company and knowing more about email marketing so maybe i if if i am religiously uh, following uh, the post that they are sending to me maybe i i won't even go to uh, google to search okay email marketing and more or what is happening latest if they keep on serving me so i become a very very long time customer for them if i am getting the right information from them so that kind of conversation is here and the transaction is happening between me and the brand and again in the sales life cycle you can send a very appropriate message to a customer depending upon where the customer lie at a particular stage so a customer can be just a lead from a uh, and the lead can be just without any information it can be a nurtured lead now by nurtured lead i mean that you have certain uh, communication that has gone in customer knows about your brand he knows about what kind of product you are you are offering so he is at a certain level so then you can reach out to with a very appropriate message so this kind of again this helps in the one on one transaction that we spoke about so depending upon the sales cycle you can explore these options so now let's see uh, how it impacts the overall sales process like somebody asked a question about how to convert a lead into a conversion so how how do you create leads basically the first question is that so what are the different ways that lead is created you can have a telecalling network you might be reaching your, out to your customers through video conferencing that is uh, primarily b2b you can be setting up meeting in person which which is a very common thing in uh, uh, banking and insurance so wherein uh, a personal touch is required because products sometimes are very complex for the customers they are not able to understand what is happening with the product so setting up a meeting helps and that's that's how you get a a, a lead and uh, staying in touch to nurture the lead so basically once you have got the lead so you need to be you need to be very constantly in touch but at the same time not overburden the customer uh, consumer at, at any point of time so too much communication should be avoided but you should be in touch with the customer so that should that when the customer is finally is in the decision making mode so and you never know when the customer will will be can be in a decision making mode and you cannot afford to go off the hook when that particular thing is happening so we discussed about uh, how uh, how you set up a meeting how you how you nurture a lead etc but before uh, i mean as we discussed about the service part it it gives you a wholesome picture so let me give you a, a, a very very relevant example let's say uh, you have entire communication stored for your customer from starting from lead to conversion to post service to post sale service etc let's say you have the entire conversation with the customer so next time when you are reaching out to the customer or a similar customer with a similar background 
you know what were the hurdles that you had to cross to convert this customer. Because you have all these uh, conversation or communication documented with you at your back end and you are using your churning data, you are using the data to come out with a very relevant information which can help you in making business decisions. So these kind of uh, customer specific profiling and then reaching out to the similar customers who will fit those profiles can boost your sales which you cannot even imagine the, the kind of scale it has. So when we talk about big data and all these, these are the things that constitute the big data and, and then the decision making. So uh, nurturing a lead, a bit more on how to nurture a lead. So currently what happens is that uh, whatever leads that enter your CRM through different resources, whatever you have employed, telecalling or whatever, uh, personal mailers or uh, visits, etc. These leads are not qualified. There has to be something, there has to be a process to make these leads qualified. Because unless it is qualified, unless the leads are qualified, there is no point wasting your resources, your major resources, let's say your best uh, salesperson or your uh, premier uh, pitching uh, frameworks on such customers who are not yet qualified. So here in the part of email comes into play when you, you can use it uh, to nurture a lead. And it has been proven that if you have nurtured a lead over a period of time through emails, those kind of leads result in 40% more sales than those that aren't. So if, if a non-nurtured lead or a just a, uh, let's say a, a fresh lead, if you put a burden on that lead, to convert as soon as possible by bombarding that lead with calls, etc., trying to get up, uh, get as many meetings as possible, then it's very, it, it, it becomes very unlikely that a customer will convert in a reasonable time. But if you have nurtured the lead over time, it will not only give you a sale, but it will also result in a long-term customer, uh, long-term customer for you. That's the place where uh, nurturing becomes very important. These marketers are worried. Why are these marketers worried? Because marketer number one has a different problem. He says that we spent a lot of money and resources to create an SEO friendly and user friendly website with great content. We received a good number of visitors after a few weeks of the website update, but now the website traffic has become stagnant. What are we missing out on? Let's talk about marketer number two. He says that we have a presence on all major social media platforms. We recently launched a campaign to promote our new product using organic and paid advertising on social media. It generated a lot of traffic on our website, but the problem is that the conversion rates were very low. So what could be the reason for that? Moving on, let's talk about one more marketer, marketer number three who has a good website and a social media presence. Their sale numbers have been good too, but they have a very huge problem of the number of return customers is not as high as they would like. So what should they be doing in this particular case? Now, whenever we are talking about these three examples, we'll be solving these examples from an integrated digital marketing campaign view. Now, digital marketing is actually like a machine. Different parts must work in tandem to ensure peak performance. Integrated digital marketing campaigns combine several marketing channels, which we have already learned about, to promote a consistent message to the target audience. These channels could be SEO, these can be SEM, these could be email marketing, affiliate marketing, or even social media marketing, or as per as whatever is required for your business. Moving on, the definitions of integrated digital marketing. The first definition comes from the Data and Marketing Association. They say that a method of engaging consumers with your company or brand that combines all parts of marketing communications to work together and assist the customer along their journey of awareness to loyalty and advocacy. Second, which is given by HubSpot, it says that integrated marketing is a process of arranging your different marketing channels to work in tandem to promote your products or services, typically through a strategic campaign. So these were the definitions of IDM. Now, what is the need of IDM? 
the first need is that customers need various touch points before they decide to purchase think about it on your side you went over to amazon you looked at a product and then you probably forgot about it or you got busy with something so your entry into amazon was organic but after that you made the purchase once you saw their remarketing ads on instagram so that is how various touch points are used in order to make a purchase now customers also continuously look out for fresh content in some of the cases where you have a product which is very complicated which cannot be buy without a consultancy or something of that sort then they are looking for a different sort of content as well every time now number 3 is online traffic comes from diverse sources now obvious reason taking amazon into this picture here again as we've already learned about it they have affiliate marketers they have done their seo they are doing their google ads as well and they are doing their remarketing ads as well and multiple things like that even email marketing there are certain strategies which brings visitors to a website ideal campaigns generate higher conversion rates the reason behind that is very very simple first of all you do not have to get the same target audience again and again over to your website you can get just a few percentage of those target audience and you can take it up with them and go ahead and provide them with a better conversion rate number 5 the customer engaged through idm actually spends more the reason behind that is about branding so if you have just one source of traffic coming on to your website but they don't see you about any on maybe let's say on social media channels or maybe any sort of a partnership with other brands then the brand in itself becomes weak so you don't buy from a new e-commerce website but you know that you can buy the product from amazon and even if the product quality is not good but you trust amazon now digital marketing channels continuously evolve this was a very good example when this happened in 2016 if i'm not wrong that the seo algorithms actually changed and a lot of rankings went down but nothing changed in the social media space so it's all about keeping all of your eggs in different different baskets going ahead the worried marketers the three marketers which we had a conversation about what would it be the advice which we would be giving it to them so the three marketers just a quick re- recap one the traffic has become stagnant the second marketer has a problem which was conversion rate was very low and the third one was that the return customers were not enough so this is a very basic exercise when it comes to about integrated digital marketing let's say if your traffic has become stagnant using seo you need to go ahead and start putting in more channels into the picture could be social media could be email marketing could be anything else number 2 if the conversion rate was very low then you have to again integrate multiple channels so that your all of the channels combined provide a better conversion rate to you and whenever you are talking about return customers are not enough then in that particular case i believe they are not doing the email marketing properly because if somebody is buying from your website i'm assuming that they are giving you their email id and if they are not giving and if they are not running promotions on the emails then in that particular case i think the return customers are not coming because of that now what are the challenges in a integrated digital marketing campaign the first challenge is that how to select the right channel and the tactics for each of these channel now this is based upon the different type of businesses let's again assume you are running an e-commerce again which is selling cameras and high end camera stuff so you know that these people are going to be there on instagram first being a pictorial platform that is something which a lot of people use a lot of photographers use instagram so finding these channels understanding about these channels in tandem with your business is a big problem number 2 what will be the flow of launching a campaign let's say you found somebody for your website for your photography or videography website via instagram then after that what are you going to do let's say a person showed an interest in buying a certain camera then what so after that it could be remarketing ads it could be email marketing or anything of that sort number 3 how to ensure that the communication is consistent and when i'm saying communication is consistent that means it's not overpowering at several places that no please buy 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 and the communication if you're going via helping people of the content marketing side of the things 
then that is how you make your communication very consistent. Number four, how to tailor the communication for each medium. Now this comes down to either copywriting or content writing again, because if one of the medium is Instagram, then you could use stickers on it. You could use other type of stuff on it. Use it on the Instagram reels or maybe on a story or anything of that sort. The same way, it's very hard. And these are the four challenges which are a major challenge when it comes to launching an integrated digital marketing campaign. Moving on, we're going to talk about the example which was like by Nike. They were making a breaking two campaign. So let's see what channels did they use when they were making a breaking two campaign. Now, the first of all, just to give you a little bit of background, Nike, obviously, you should be knowing that Nike is in the business of athletic wear and equipment. It uses marketing strategies very efficiently to promote their products to the target demographics. Number three, Nike promoted their shoe line, the Zoom Vaporfly Elite, by live streaming athletes wearing those shoes while attempting to complete a marathon in under two hours making that they will break the world record now the channels which were used first was relevant and niche influencers they found out that there are three long distance marathon runners who are going to be a influencer for them and secondly there was a live event which was live streamed on facebook and twitter as an event so you could actually watch it so get more excited about the product or cheer the athletes on while they're wearing those shoes then there was obviously social media marketing which leveraged twitter facebook instagram to promote the event using the hashtag breaking two now number four was a well-produced content which is like they teamed up with national geographic to document this particular race now here are the results the campaign's message of unlocking the human potential tapped into a very broad audience. With the campaign, Nike garnered 87% of positive comments, which is huge in era of Twitter. 584,000 mentions on social media. Hashtag was used more than 400,000 times. 2 trillion impressions and 5.2x of the digital content engagement. Now, even drew congratulations from Nike's rival, which was on the left. You could see that Adidas running actually gave a congratulation to one of the marathon runners. Again, let's go into another example, which is of Microsoft integrated marketing communication approach. Now, Microsoft and Carlsberg got into a partnership. Microsoft has been continuously taking up various artificial intelligence based projects and has placed AI high up its in its product portfolio. Now, to promote its AI offerings, Microsoft teamed up with Carlsberg to use AI to speed up the process of brewing new flavors of the beer. Now, moving on, what they did was Microsoft marketed this project using the integrated marketing approach using a multitude of channels. So as you can see on this screen, there are micro blogs on Twitter. There were a lot of press releases in Financial Times. And then there was also video promotions across Facebook and YouTube as well. Now, how do we actually create an integrated digital marketing strategy? Now, step one is knowing your target audience, which has been a step always. Now, first sub-step of that is that who are your target customers? What are their motivations? How do they like to get in touch with? Which publishers do they read? Which websites do they visit regularly? And which channels are they using? What are they talking about right now? Step number two is to design clear and consistent content that can easily be adapted or used on different media or channels. So using both visual logos and slogans and brand cues, which was voiceovers and music consistently all across channels. So communication such as messaging and offers must be clear and not be filled with confusing words and phrases. You don't have to be too fancy whenever you're writing a line. That's what it means. The messages and offers must be compelling to the receiver. Obviously, if you're providing something, if you're spending a lot of money on something, then you need to make sure that it's actually needed. And we learned that in this step one as well. Number three is your message should be consistent across channels website it could be phone it could be in store or it could be in mobile just so that you create that brand for you 
Step number three is invest only in those channels that have a clear role in the campaign. Understand what each channel can deliver in terms of reach and cost. As attitude towards as vary by channel and format, different media have innate strengths in different regions. To give you an example, if somebody is coming into India to start its own business, the first thing they do is go with Facebook ads. Why? And why not Twitter ads? Facebook ads has a very defined targeting of digital marketing. Whereas Twitter ads, it's a little bleak on that front. And Twitter being Twitter costs a lot more compared to Facebook. So coming back to the slide, which channels do my customers use the most? So whatever channels you are using, that is what you have to do. Number two is what are the channels strength and gaps? So according to your target audience, Let's say you're not able to reach that very definite pinpoint audience, but could reach to a relevant audience. Do we want to go ahead with that or not? That is the decision which you have to make. How will these channels are going to help me attain my business goals? Now, you could use Google for lead generation and you could use Facebook and YouTube for brand awareness. Just to give you an example. Moving on, step number four. Tailor your content for each channel while communicating the same message. Understand the nuances of each of the selected channels and develop creatives that matters to the users on that particular channel. Make sure each channel of your marketing campaign is set up to drive traffic to your ultimate goal. For example, social networks such as Twitter or Facebook could be used for engagement. Websites for email newsletter subscriptions, purchases and reservation. Keep your URLs and usernames uniform. That's a basic hygiene practice. And use the same keywords and phrases throughout your integrated marketing campaigns. Now, step number five, you have to plan the flow of launching the campaign. Now, the factors influencing the launch flow are, first of all, the campaign objective. So it could be different for different companies. It could be different for a different product as well. We need to know that what will be the plan to actually launch a campaign. So user behavior on the channels used in the campaign needs to be checked. For example, there is a peak time. There's usually a peak time on Facebook at around 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. Indian time. And so you know that, okay, if you want to go ahead and start off with a blast, then you need to run your campaign at like 7 or 8. Now, the third factor is the funnel stage. Awareness, consideration and conversion. It's an integrated approach. The content and creatives are created for each of these stages. Now, each stage is planned differently, but interlinked finally to convert a user. So here's a tip. Prepare your social blog post calendar in advance. A good campaign features multiple ads. Prepare an ad and schedule it. Moving on. Step number six. Make sure your marketing team agencies are working in sync. Now, this is obviously communication which needs to be happening within the team. If working with several agencies, ensure that there's an in-house team member to monitor and coordinate with them. Facilitate team meeting with members working on different projects within the same integrated marketing campaign too. Keep all the members on the same page. Keep the message of the campaign consistent and maintain company brand standard across the campaign. Since I've worked with a lot of agencies, I've had an agency of my own, I can tell you that this is the real, real big problem where agencies are not working in sync. So assume there's an agency which creates your images, but there's an agency which is creating your video. They both need to be in the sync in order to provide a consistent brand message. Step number seven, you need to track your campaigns. In an integrated marketing campaign, it is vital to utilize the proper analytics and attribution methods that help understand how conversions and results are achieved. Now, you need the analytics for your website, for your social media, for your email, for your search ads, and for your display ads, and anything else, whichever you are doing. Now, here are some of the key metrics which you should be tracking. So, website, site visits, maybe traffic by source or channels, Number of new visitors versus the number of return visitors, bounce rate, exit rate, interactions per visit. All of these you can find in Google Analytics. Social media marketing, you need to figure out the likes, comments, shares, clicks, impressions, reach, conversions. Or maybe you could just bunch it up into an engagement, which is for the likes and the comments and the shares are all engagements. So you can bunch that up also. 
email marketing you need to figure out the sends the open rate the ctr the conversion rate from there the bounce rate the number of people who unsubscribed and the revenue per email which you send number four research and display ads impressions reach cost obviously engagement rate ctr cpc and conversion rate all of these we have already learned in search engine marketing that what do they mean and now you have to start tracking them when you're making an integrated digital marketing campaign moving on with an example of linkedin's in it together campaign so this was a campaign which was run during the golden globes award so most people viewed linkedin platform as platform only for white collar professionals with this campaign linkedin wanted to break a stereotype and connect with a global audience while highlighting the power of the community in finding a job now the channels used obviously it was linkedin then we had videos as well and there was a lot of digital display as well now in in it together it featured people from professions such as musician martial arts culinary arts bankers teachers entrepreneurs and more campaign featured the real stories of real members across career stages and how they are adapting innovating and learning on their networks to push forward in this new world of work the black and white documentary style videos made them stand out from the commercial ones showcasing their authenticity now let's move on to another example which was of levi's it's your word campaign now levi's launched a campaign it's your word before the voter registration day in the us the main goal was to encourage its user base to register for voting and cast their votes on election day now the channels used were several video spots alongside in store registration booths for votes second was social media to share images of celebrities and vote branded apparel number 3 was a micro site which was used to further promote the campaign now the results were that 60% of users who discovered products on instagram got involved in the campaign 75% of users took action after seeing the instagram post now video spot was also shared on facebook 64% of consumers stated that after watching their video consumers were motivated to buy the products now another example spotify 2018 wrapped campaign spotify launched a personalized 2018 wrapped campaign to celebrate each subscriber's listening habits so what they did was that once the 18 year was over they said that this year you listen to 6207 different songs on spotify so they actually gave you a stat which is not required but it just opens up the eyes in front of the consumers saying that this is how much actually i used my spotify membership or the free trial whatever so channels used was a personalized music playlist so what they did because they already knew about the browsing habits on spotify they engaged with subscribers and gained their interest through data of their personal listening habits number 2 was that there were customized emails So subscribers received a personalized email with listening data from 2018 and a CTA to access the Spotify's data-driven microsite. Now the data-driven microsite gave a story-like overview of the subscribers' listening habits in a similar fashion to a billboard advertising campaign. Now fans were prompted to share their musical snapshot, which made it Twitter's top global trending topic on launch day. Moving on here were the results for the Spotify campaign over 34 million fan visits over 400000 artist visits over 5 million social shares and over 3 billion streams which were driven now as you can see that even for one tweet of Spotify they got 172 retweets with 724 comments and 3.1k likes which was for the wrapped 2018 campaign now let's go into another example where we are talking about uber's beyond 5 star campaign now uber launched a promotional beyond 5 stars campaign to spotlight some of the tremendous works its drivers are doing uber presents each featured driver with a short vacation trip as an acknowledgement of their hard work now the channels which were used the campaign serves as an extension of the brand's in app complimenting feature the micro site which was speaking about the cabs drivers and customers experiences the video ads which were featuring 
several drivers who were bombarded with in-app compliments and the images which were shared on social media platforms. Now, talking about the results, the campaign images were also shared via Facebook, whereas they have accounted for 75% to 90% of advertising effectiveness. Through this campaign, Uber not only attracted more customers, but it also attracted an extra number of drivers through the platform. So you can see the tweet on the left side where Uber reads, when your driver goes beyond five stars, share a compliment, share some love. It only takes a few seconds, but you can go further than you think. Now, let's move into another example of Taco Bell's integrated marketing approach, which was Taco Bell is, you already probably know about it, is a Mexican cuisine inspired fast food chain. After a recession in 2011, Taco Bell experienced a slump. Now, Draft FCB, Taco Bell's advertising agency, designed an integrated marketing campaign to position Taco Bell as a multicultural food experience. Now, they launched a campaign named Live Mas. Mas is Spanish for more, so that makes it Live More, to make the brand appealing to youth oriented and cross cultural consumers. Now, they rolled out new products and an upscaled menu to penetrate the market of health conscious customers. Now, they also co branded with Doritos to launch the famous DLTs, which was Doritos Locos Tacos. Now, the channels which were used was YouTube ad of a customer who drove 900 miles to try the DLTs and the montage of Instagram post of customers was trying out the DLTs for the first time. Now, influencers among fans tried the DLTs and spread the word about through their social media channels. Now, the short video ad on the Live Mask theme featuring a bunch of senior citizens sneaking out of their retirement home to a party. A mobile ordering and payment app was also launched and Periscope to live stream the launch of new products to catch Generation Z's attention. Now the results were the integrated marketing efforts created a huge buzz and contributed to nearly a quarter of the taco sales. A short video ad featuring senior citizens grabbed a lot of attention on social media and drove a lot of traffic towards the brand. Now they reported an 8% increase in sales. What exactly is data-driven marketing? Data-driven marketing is a strategy of using customer information for optimal and targeted media buying and creative messaging. It is one of the most transformational changes in the digital advertising that has ever occurred. The rising quality and quantity of marketing data have been followed by explosive growth in the technologies for creative production and automation. These expanding marketing tech and ad tech sectors now enable personalization of every aspect of marketing experience. Data-driven marketing is taking the answers to questions like who, when, where, what message and making those answers actionable. Usage and activation of data, often in automated or semi-automated manner, allows for a significantly more optimized media and creative strategy. This people-first marketing strategy is more personalized. It has also been responsible for driving considerable ROIs in the markets. Now with this, we shall move ahead and understand the major benefits of data-driven marketing. The benefits of data-driven marketing and especially data-driven advertising are highly significant. The first one is the more efficient media buying. Data-driven marketing is probably the most advanced and pragmatic marketing sector. By leveraging algorithms and machine learning, ad agencies and marketers are removing a lot of guesswork from media planning and buying. This in turn enhances customer search experience and brings in advanced marketing capabilities to sellers and improves their business. The second one is targeting the right customers. Ad spends and marketing messages are optimized to be shown only to the appropriate targets for the marketing campaign. Here, the customer's search history is tracked and he or she is targeted with only the relevant ads that help them to find exactly what they are looking for and improvises customer experience. The next one is messaging audience with relevant messages. The age of generic one-size-fits-all marketing messages is over. There is still room for these big ideas for some brands, but for most companies, marketing messages must get more granular in order to be relevant enough to resonate with customers. To put it down in simple terms, all customers are not convinced with the same message. 
marketing teams should understand that what exactly a customer is looking for and target him or her with only relevant information. So now that we understand why exactly we need data driven marketing, let us move into the next part where we shall discuss where exactly data driven marketing is leading us to. Data driven marketing has led us to the introduction of many ideas of marketing and reaching out to the customer in the best possible way. It also led to the introduction of many softwares. One out of them is the CRM. CRM or customer relation management allows marketers to track who individual customers are including the name and contact information. CRMs enable direct mailing and therefore direct marketing campaigns. Batches of customers may receive different types of messages based on whether the marketer thought the segment was good fit and what the customer cares about. The CRM gained new prominence in digital marketing with Salesforce innovation to bring it to the cloud. This in turn started the age of sales and marketing automation. Digital data driven marketing came out of the CRM, gave birth to new category marketing automation software. Example leaders in this space include marketing automation companies like Marketo and Eloka. They pioneered building individual marketing profiles built on customer interaction, tracking on the website and email. This profiling of customers enabled automated emailing based on certain triggers and activities as well as scoring and prospects into segments. Thus began a new age of marketing automation. As marketers began segmenting their customers using marketing data, they ran into a new problem around the amount of data on tracked users being accumulated. Customers were now being tracked not only on own media on marketer websites and emails, but also increasingly in paid media where ads were running. What's now known as programmatic advertising. Solutions like Crux and Newstar arose to help marketers aggregate the data in more manageable manner and produce new insights for new targeting and creative plans. Thus began the age of data management platforms. Today, marketers are spending over 6 billions on an year on data-driven targeting solutions like data management platforms and demand site platforms. However, the majority of marketing teams are not yet fully activating their data. They have so far been mostly limited to optimizing media with their data. The next stage is activating marketing data to creative and not just media. Now we will have a briefing about creative data and media. First up, creative. Creative is just a message what you create. Followed by that, the data. Data is who will see the message and what do we know about the people as far as characteristics and their past interactions. The next is media. Media is where the messages appear and which is also to dictate their creative requirements. With data-driven digital marketing, you must combine all these three elements depending on media channel, you can either combine creative and data into a dynamic creative unit which operates independently of the media or combine creative data and media within the confines of the media platform into a campaign that targets. Before data, creative was produced once with one version for everyone. Traditionally, you only needed one final file or ad. This file was self-contained. It could run on any publisher in the media channel. Designers essentially produced a creative file and controlled its rendering. Once the file was passed along, its destiny was set in stone. Flashy ad formats like rich media ads were used to get consumer attention. In recent times, some publishers like Facebook have created new formats that require multiple separate assets to be loaded for the publisher itself to render the final ad. This became known as publishing a native ad or creative. The message is a combination of creative assets presented to the customer in the context of the medium it is running in. Native ads rose just a new depth of customer data was being generated on social media. Social media quickly surpassed other types of customer data in quality. Now with creative media and data coming in together, marketers want to personalize the messages based on who is seeing it and where they are seeing it. Intrusive rich media ads are dying giving way to new trends in more consumer-friendly formats that use message personalization, not intrusion, to gain attention. Social media isn't the only channel where all of this is possible anymore. With programmatic advertising and marketing automation, nearly every aspect of the customer journey can be personalized. 
Keep in mind that data-driven advertising doesn't necessarily require individualized one-to-one -one messaging like with someone's name appearing in the ad. Marketers must be careful to balance the customer's experience or the creep factor in the ad marketing message. Instead, it means knowing what we know about the targeted person who may belong in larger audience segments of shared characteristics. What would we do differently in the creator? But data-driven marketing does mean creative needs to be personalized based on some data attributes of the viewer. This may be a large shift in mindset of some agencies and advertisers. Now we will move ahead and understand how to approach data-driven marketing. Whether you're getting started or looking to improvise your existing marketing strategy, there are certain elements that you should be considering. These include the following four stages. Automate and integrate collaboration across teams, monitor industry changes, continued measurement. Now we will understand each one of them. Firstly, automate and integrate. Integrating new tools and technology into your marketing strategy can be overwhelming at times. By creating an automated process that still allows for presentation, you will stay true to your objectives and avoid complicating results. Followed by that, you have collaboration across teams. Because data is something that needs to be managed across the entire organization, marketers must ensure information is being shared across departments and teams. The next important thing is monitor industry changes. Keep a close eye on the competition so that you can either follow suit or learn from their mistakes. Like every other area in the industry, data-driven marketing is constantly changing. Staying up to date on the latest trends will only help you with your own brand strategy. Continued measurement. Data-driven marketing is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It should be constantly monitored and adjusted based on the results that you're seeing. This will help identify with tactics that are working and encourage buy-in from organizational leader. Now we shall move ahead and understand some of the real-time examples of data-driven marketing. If you're still unsure how data-driven marketing might fit into your business strategy, here are a few examples that you should offer some inspiration. Retargeting. Retargeting is important for all digital marketers. If someone has previously purchased from your e-commerce site or shown some significant interest, why not look for them again? Let's pretend that a member of your target audience is a travel enthusiast who has recently booked a vacation trip. From this data, you could automatically offer relevant deals based on traveling and lodging, airfare, and similar other vacation ideas that would be appealing to your target audience. Next is dynamic advertising. Use social media to your advantage by creating ads across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Connect your audience by allowing them to sign up and receive more information with one click. By turning your social media outlets into two-way communication channels, you have now obtained valuable information that feeds directly into your database. Followed by that, optimized paid search. Analyze your preferred customers based on types of keywords they search for and consider what the competition is targeting as well. Leverage this data to position yourself at the top of the most relevant search results and drive valuable traffic to your website. The next one is targeted email campaigns. Is email marketing a part of your existing strategy? Take a data-driven approach to email campaigns by grouping together your desired target audiences. While this data will allow for automation, you will also be able to easily personalize messages to make one-to-one -one connections with each and every customer. Now we will enter the next phase where we will understand some of the major challenges faced in data-driven marketing. Like most valuable business strategies, there are also challenges to successful data-driven marketing. Let's take a look on some of the most common struggles. They are the right team. Due to the complicated nature of the job and analytic skills required, it can be challenging to attract the right type of staff that specializes in predictive analysis or audience amplification. Learning more about data-driven or becoming a data scientist may benefit you and your team. Followed by that, the next important challenge is departmental silos. The success of data-driven marketing is largely dependent on having high-quality and integrated data, which is not easy task to obtain. Frequently, different departments will acquire data with goals that contradict one another. Followed by that, you can see commitment. It would seem foolish to incorporate a data-driven marketing strategy if you aren't completely committed to it. Yet, there are some companies that continue to make that mistake. 
even though they might possess a defined strategy, it won't mean much if they are not assimilated with the tools needed to succeed. Finally, integration. In 2019, brands on average are using 15 different data sources to run their operations and campaigns. But data usage is growing exponentially. Though our state of marketing reports, Salesforce has been tracking brand data usage for past three years, we found that the data is increasing exponentially. The massive amount of data we've been collecting and will collect in future is creating a massive data glut. Making sense of it all is for artificial intelligence. All of this data can be analyzed by AI and leveraged in real time to create personalized customer journeys. It's necessary for all brands to move towards future where every interaction with customers is customized to them. If data is like the natural or then applying AI to it is like applying some refinement to it and bringing out steel. Hence, this is the reason why we see widespread of adoption of AI by major brands. Now, moving ahead, the next important stage of the future of data-driven marketing is data management platform. More than 55% of marketing leaders are currently using data management platform and an additional 35% plan to adapt one within the next two years. Although many marketers only see DMPs as useful for solving basic issues like content personalization and frequency caps on ads, high performance have begun to unlock an additional DMP feature. The next important stage for data-driven marketing is find a balance between personalization and privacy. Today's consumers are increasingly empowered by technology and by government privacy regulations it's now the first order of business for brands to obtain permission to use consumer data. Without this permission, you cannot use to create personalized customer experiences. Last but not the least is to hire a chief data officer. One third of the marketers say about difficult to meet current data regulations like the EU GDPR and data regulations are only going to get stricter in the future. That is why today's leading organizations have started putting someone in charge of managing customers' data, that is, the chief data officer. So hiring a chief data officer would be crucial to have a bright future of data-driven marketing. So what exactly influence mean in the area of digital marketing? It's basically the ability to create an effect drive outcomes, outcomes which are discerning, outcomes which are distinct and which can actually influence consumer behavior online and which can change consumer behavior online. It's a mix of trust and reach. It, it's a combination of what we call relevance, reach and resonance. So influencer marketing is a form of collaboration. What we see is that a brand or a business collaborates with an influential person to promote a product, a service, or an idea. So how do, exactly does it work? Now, social content creators with niche audience can offer more value to brands. These people have dedicated and engaged groups of followers on different channels. So yeah, where do you find these digital marketing influencers? This is a question for you. Where do you find these digital marketing influencers? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. You find a lot of them on social media. Okay. Celebrity endorsement was the earliest form of using a per person's popularity to reach a broader audience. Now, the early forms of digital influencers were found on blogs and forums. And uh, people used to follow them, people used to follow their advice, people used to look up to them for uh, fixing some of their issues, etc. Now, an influencer today is someone who, one, has the power to affect the purchasing decisions of others because of his or her authority or knowledge or position or relationship with the audience. Also, an influencer is someone who has a distinct following in, in a particular niche with whom he or she engages. Now, the size of the following would be a factor of the kind of topics or the area that that uh, influencer is interested in or the influencer endorses. So what is the difference between a celebrity endorser and an influencer? Okay, so yeah, a celebrity influencer is more of a person who 
kind of endorses your brand, promotes your brand for a certain amount of money. All right. It's important to note that these individuals, the influencers, are not merely marketing tools, but they are social relationship assets. And brands can collaborate with them to achieve some of their marketing objectives. And these are not people who work with you just for the money part alone, just for a short duration, as long as the money is coming. They can be people who can work with you for a longer duration, and it can really be a long term association. All right. So the question is who has the largest number of Instagram followers? Who or what or whom? Uh, which brand? or which person has the largest number of followers? Well, it's a tricky question. Instagram has the largest number of followers at about 370 million. And if you look at the number of top influencers or top people with followers on Instagram, you would find a mix of sports person. Cristiano Ronaldo is big and a mix of musicians, actors, reality stars. And also there are some brands which are there, which is very interesting. Brands like Nat Geo and Nike, they are amongst the top 20 brands which are interested, which have the largest number of followers on Instagram. Can you guess the, the profile or the person who has the largest number of followers in India? Again, I see that in India as well, it's a mix of sports person and movie stars and of course, Mr. Modi, right? So that is what the uh, largest uh, profiles or the biggest influencers look like on Instagram in India, okay? So people do look up to influencers in social media to guide them with their decision-making process. And uh, influencers in social media, people who have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific topic. They make regular posts about that topic on their preferred social media channels and generate large followings of enthusiastic, engaged people who pay close attention to their views. So that's what an influencer is, or that's who an influencer is, and that's what they do. So let's look at some of the influencer marketing trends that's happening across the globe today. Okay, some stats. Okay, influencer marketing is set to make about 31.7 billion by 2025. And this is almost three times of what it is today. So that's the kind of growth that's going to happen in this space. Now, let us look at, let's look a bit more closely at the different aspects of influencer marketing, starting with what are the different types of digital uh, influencer marketing. So influencer marketing can be classified based on the number of followers. So there is mega influencers. Mega influencers are people with a vast number of followers on their social networks. Although there are no fixed rules on the boundaries between different types of followers, a common view is that mega influencers are people who have more than 1 million followers on at least one social platform. Many mega influencers, if you notice, like Mr. Modi and Priyanka Chopra and Virat Kohli and uh, Ariana Grande and Kim Kardashian, etc., have gained their fame offline. So they could be movie stars, they could be sports people, musicians, uh, even as you saw in the case of the Kardashians and Jenners, Reality television stars, you know, most of the Kardashian Jenner family is actually one of the biggest, some of the biggest uh, Instagram influencers. Some mega influencers have gained their vast following through their online and social activities as well. Now, the thing for brands to take away is that only major brands should approach mega influencers for influencer marketing. The service cost is high. Some of them charge up to, you know, 1 million per post kind of a thing. And also they're likely to be more fussy about the brand they would choose to partner with. And in virtually every case, mega influencers will be working through an agency. They are not likely to be working directly with you. And also it means you have to jump through lots of hoops to reach them. 
Macro influencers, on the other hand, are about a level below the mega influencers and may be more accessible as influencer marketers. You can consider a people with followers in the range of about 500,000 to 1 million as mega influencers. Now, this group tends to consist of two types of people. They are either B grade celebrities who are yet to make it big, or they're successful online experts who have built a significant following than the other type of influencers like micro or mid tire, etc. Now, this kind of macro influencers, basically people who are online experts, they are likely to be very useful for firms for engaging in influencer marketing. They have a very high profile and are excellent at raising awareness. And also, there are more macro influencers than mega influencers. So it is relatively easier for a brand to find someone who matches with their requirements, who has the same kind of target segment, and hence, and hence then collaborate with them. Micro influencers are ordinary everyday people who become known for their knowledge about a particular niche area. As such, they have usually gained a sizable social media following amongst devotees of that niche. And you know, it's not just about the followers that indicates a level of influence. It's the relationship and interaction that a micro influencer has with his or her followers. Now, although views differ, you can consider a micro influencer as somebody having between 10,000 to 50,000 followers on a single social platform. A micro influencer at times may not even be aware of the existence of a company, you know. So in that case, the company has to first convince the influencer of what the collaboration is worth. Micro influencers have built up specialist followings and they will not harm their relationships with their fans just for the sake of promoting a product which um, does not align with their values or their image. The requirement for the relationship between micro influencers and brands to align uh, with the target audience means that influencers are often picky about with whom they work. Some micro influencers are fairly happy to promote a brand for free. Others will expect some form of payment. Regardless of the price, any influencer is unlikely to want involvement in an inappropriate brand of, for their audience. Now, the nature of influence is changing. Micro influencers are becoming more common and more famous. In fact, some of them have risen from virtual obscurity to being nearly as known as some of the traditional um, celebrities. Now, this is particularly the case for Generation Z or Generation Z, who spent more time on the internet than watching television or going to movies or going to sporting um, uh, related event. In all reality, micro influencers are going to be the influencers of the future. The internet has actually led to fragmentation of media into many small niche areas. And it is these niche groups and boards that micro influencers establish themselves as genuine influencers. A mid tire influencer is somebody who has followings between a micro influencer and a micro influencer. All right, so that will be about uh, 50,000 to about 500,000 followers. In addition to this, the newest influencer type to gain recognition is the nano influencer. These people only have a very small number of followers, but they tend to be experts in some obscure or highly specialized field. You can think of a nano influencer as being, you know, uh, the big fish in a small pound kind of person. In many cases, they may have anywhere between 1,000 to about 10,000 followers, but they are very keen, very interested followers, willing to engage with the nano influencer and listen to her or his opinions. You know, while many brands would consider nano influencers as being inconsequential, they can be of extreme importance to firms which make highly specialized or niche products or niche services. For most firms, however, nano influencers lack sufficient influence to be of much use. They may be cheap and carry tremendous sway with small number of people, 
but it's in small niches. So as a brand, you might have to work with hundreds of nano influencers to reach a broad audience, particularly mass brands uh, like Levers, PNG, etc., might not be very open to that kind of a tie up where you really need to work with a lot of large number of small influencers. They would prefer to work probably with one mega influencer uh, who has a much broader reach of the target audience. Now, this was actually one way of uh, classifying influencers. The other ways include based on type of content. So it can be bloggers, it can be YouTubers, it can be podcasters or social media influencers. You can tag them based on the content. You can also classify influencers based on the level of influence. So that would mean step one is, of course, celebrities. Now, celebrities were the original influencers, if you look at the journey of influencer marketing, and they still have a role to play. Although their importance as influencers is on a wane, it's, it's waning actually. Now, influencer marketing grew out of celebrity endorsement. Businesses had found for many years that their sales usually rise when a celebrity promotes or endorses their product. There are still many cases of companies, particularly high-end brands, using celebrities as influencers. You might probably have noticed brands like Patek Philippe and um, the Oriental Mandarin who use celebrities, movie stars, etc. to promote their product. At times, you might also have seen um, a different kind in the sense like um, where brands will work with people who are already in that space. Now, the problem for most brands is that there are not so many traditional celebrities willing to participate in this kind of influencer campaign, and they are unlikely to come cheap. Now, the exception will be if a firm makes a product that a celebrity already likes or uses. In that situation, the celebrity may be prepared to use his or her influence and say how good she believes the product to be, product or service. You would have noticed that a lot of celebrities, movie stars, etc., actually campaign for um, UN-related activities. So there is the World Food Program, which Liam Nesson endorses. Uh, the Priyanka Chopra, in fact, works for some of the UNICEF programs. So that is one area how brands can actually work with celebrities, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do and it's not a very uh, common and prevalent thing to do. Also, many musical instrument producers do that kind of an association because many musicians use some of the brands and hence they are used for promoting as well. Now, one common problem that is there with celebrities as influencers is that they lack credibility. They lack credibility with the target audience. Now, do you recollect the brand of car that Shah Rukh Khan used to endorse. Yeah, do you guys remember that brand? Yes, he used to endorse a Hyundai brand. Yeah, I-10, I think, yeah. So do you really think he rode that car in his daily life? Did he really run his errands in that car? Did he go to Pune or Goa in that car? Extremely unlikely, right? So there is a question of credibility when it comes to celebrity endorsement. So in addition to celebrities, there's also key opinion leaders who can be influencers. Industry experts and thought leaders can also be considered as influencers, and at times they hold important position for brands. Industry leaders and thought leaders gain respect because of their qualification, their position, their experience about a particular area, and often this Respect is actually earned more because of the reputation of where they work. Now, these experts include journalists, academicians, industry experts, and professional advisors. You would have noticed that uh, bloggers and content creators often work with industry leaders and thought leaders. And it is not uncommon to see them quoted in blog posts and even used in social media campaigns. One of the developing things is that the line between traditional media and the social media is blurring. The best influencers at times have also built their 
reputation for being expert in some particular niche area online. Now, they are similar to key opinion leaders, but usually have gained their reputation more informally through their online activity. And they have created that reputation through the quality of the social posts they make, the blog posts they write, the podcasts they speak, and the videos they craft and post on the YouTube channels. Now, there's an agency in the UK which has come out with the term called Chromo Influencers. Now, these are basically the top 10% influencers of a particular brand. And they have scored all these influencers based on some 46 crucial factors that impact consumer behavior. That's a very interesting way of putting influencer out there and using influencer marketing and measuring it to see how effective it is. So let us look at some of the other trends. Now, the thing that comes to everybody's mind is, so what exactly do they do? What does an influencer do? So what do you think an influencer does? Right, so contrary to the popular belief that some of us have, an influencer is not somebody who spends all their time on social media, taking selfies and uh, trying in, gen in general trying to sound important. They make regular posts about specialized topics which are of interest to them. Now, these postings are on their preferred social media channels. They engage with their followers and pay close attention to their views. Now, the storytelling part must be carried out in a simple way that the audience can relate to, understand, and is incited enough to share it with their network. Let's talk a bit about content. Okay. Now, content that an influencer uses can be in the form of text, it can be in the form of images or videos. Now, videos are growing as the largest category of content across the digital media. It's growing at about 30 plus percentage per annum. So it's, it's really a very important type of content that social media influencers look at. Let's explore some of these platforms which are good for videos. For short format videos, there of course is Instagram and Snapchat and uh, TikTok. And for long forms, there is definitely Instagram TV, YouTube, and Facebook. Now, once TikTok has been banned, there's quite a bit of movement of influencers, TikTok influencers from TikTok to Instagram, because Instagram has also come out with Instagram Reels, which is a short video format, which is quite useful for those small videos that used to uh, run on TikTok. Videos have maximum engagement rate on social media and uh, live videos of brand products get the highest ROI. So that's something brands really love about it. In addition to videos, there's also motion contents like um, GIFs, which are on high demand and which is actually growing. What's also seen is that um, in terms of performances, videos get a very good lift of 135% over other formats, other types of content. And in general, we seem to be spending three times more uh, amount of time watching live videos than other forms of content. Now you would be wondering how exactly does influencers get paid? So brands can engage with influencers for sponsored posts, images, videos, and of course, brand campaigns. Now, this depends on the social platforms where the influencer operates, right? Now, some of the common ways that um, influencers get paid are in terms of products. So there can be free products. For example, in the case of beauty products, Let's say L'Oreal has identified an influencer and there is a new product launch that has happened. L'Oreal can send a set of the new range to the influencer and the influencer can do a demo, create a video, talk about the product, etc. There can also be co-created products where I have seen it in the quilting space where a lot of quilters collaborate with brands, sewing machine brands, long arm machine brands, and there are new features and new additions 
added to sewing machines. At times, there are small, small tools that get added or introduced based on a feedback from the quilting community. So this is an opportunity how uh, brands can collaborate and what the influencer can get in exchange. There can also be sub brands. Again, I'm going to give you the example of uh, the sewing machine brand. So there is the Swiss machine called Bernina, which works with a quilter slash designer called Tula. And they have come out with this entire sub brand called Bernina Tula Pink. So it is a pink colored machine, uh, which um, is promoted by Tula. And uh, yeah, that is the sub brand that the leading Swiss uh, sewing machine came out with. There's also a merch merchandising opportunity that comes out at times where um, the brand or the influencer can have merchandise, uh, merchandise items and they can sell it and they can co-brand it and reach out to their fan base. So that's about how products can be used in exchange for the content that the influencer is creating. It can also be based on fees, of course. Fees can be your good old transfer it to my bank kind of a thing, or it can even be payments to Patreon account. I don't know if you have heard of Patreon. Patreon is a website, patreon.com is a website which actually helps creators and fans come together on one particular platform. So you can pay and you can see some of the very exclusive content that would have got created. It can also be in fees can also be in terms of payments to a charity that an influencer supports or likes or works with. Payments can also be in terms of revenue share arrangement. If you would have followed NatGeo, you would see that a lot of photographers actually collaborate with NatGeo. And uh, maybe whenever you make a sale in terms of a photograph or a video, there can be a rev share which can be planned between the brand and the influencer. Now, talking about the rates, the hard cash kind of a thing, an influencer who has over 500,000 followers, the rate per post on Instagram can be around 7 lakh per post. That's a decent good amount of money, actually. For a nano influencer, it will be about 8,000 rupees per post and for a macro micro influencer it can be up to about 18,000 rupees per post. Now the interesting thing I want to call out here is the fact the way it has grown. Now that is the most interesting takeaway from this. It's not the absolute value but the rate of change that's happening. Basically, it's an indication of how important in, uh, influencer marketing is be beginning to look for brands. Now, we talked about in the previous slide, we talked about influencers with over 500,000 followers. So do you remember what's the term for this influencer? What do we call these kind of influencers who have more than 500,000 followers? This is the pop quiz, okay? Yes, it is a macro influencer, right? You are right. So what do brands gain from this collaboration with influencers? Why do they work with influencers? What's in it for them? Let's look at some of the reasons why brands want to collaborate with influencers. Influencers have both reach and influence on their audience. That, that makes it an ideal situation for brands which need the same kind of target audience. Brands love social media influencers because they can create trends. Uh, they are creative and also they encourage their followers to buy products that they promote. So for a brand, it's about brand visibility. It's about generating leads. It's about increased product sales. And let's admit it. Some of these influencers are very creative in terms of product usage, in terms of the content they are putting it up, and in terms of the other collaborations they do. Also, it brings certain amount of loyalty by virtue of the loyalty that the audience has towards the influencer. And sometimes, you know, rarely, but sometimes, the brand might be going through a battle in terms of a scandal, in terms of some 
environmental issue, a political issue, and they can also use an influencer to create certain amount of positivity around the brand by trying to talk to the audience and telling them it's a reliable brand, it's a good brand kind of a thing. And there are a couple of other reasons. Other reasons could be word of mouth, it could be referral programs, it could be running contests, it could be uh, giveaways that the brand is planning, etc. So if you are a brand, if you are a brand manager, if you're running a brand, how will you go about the entire influencer marketing part? How would you get started with it? How will you get going? So step one is often about having a strategy. Your influencer strategy should align with your social media strategy, which in turn should align with your digital marketing, your overall marketing, and your entire business strategy. Step two is plan your budget. Plan how much you are going to spend on your traditional marketing channels and your online marketing channels and what share of your online marketing should be your influencer marketing. Step three, spend time on research. Find out more about the industry. Find out more about the topics that matter in the industry. Find out about influencers and find, about, find out about areas that's common between you and the influencer. Step four, how to approach your influencer? Will you find them organically or are you planning to work through an agency, right? Are you going to use some kind of a tool, look at data that's coming in and then go and choose your influencer or you will hire an agency and ask them to find an influencer for you. Step five is of course, shortlisting your influencer and engaging with them and finding common grounds to work on all right then discuss the modalities the type of content the frequency of post etc step seven will be integrating with the rest of your marketing calendar this is very important step in fact so you need to make sure that your um, influencer strategy aligns with the rest of your marketing calendar in terms of your product launches your public relations your other social media activities etc step eight is of course discuss the financial part if there is any the do's and don'ts that the influencer should be aware of and the terms and conditions of the engagement now remember to do a periodic review of the association from time to time so that can be every month or every th three months um, a quarterly review or a half yearly review and see where you stand in terms of the engagement, where you stand in terms of your metrics and how you want to proceed from there. And if there are learnings that needs to be brought into both your strategy as well as that of the content plan that the influencer has. You need to remember that the influencer marketing isn't about, isn't just about finding someone with an audience and offering them money or exposure so that they can say good things. That's what celebrities are for. That's what celebrity endorsement is for. Influencers are people who have spent time and energy building their own brand and cultivating their audience. So they are going to be quite protective about their reputation and the people who trust them. So that's what's there for the brand. Now, the thing that comes to one's mind is, what does it take to be a digital marketing influencer? Let's look at the other side of it. All right. So the thumb rule is to ensure that you know your area of expertise well. So one is, one is that you need to know it as of now. Two is that you need to be passionate about it, to know more about it, to dig more about it, and to continuously keep improving yourself. So what are those steps involved in becoming a digital marketing influencer? It all begins with creating content. Step one, create content. Step two, promote your content. Share your content and be consistent in your postings. Be consistent with your topics. Research on other influencers. Keep an eye on the following versus follower ratio and 
be careful about your hashtags. We will look into each of these areas a little bit more in detail as we proceed in the next proceed to the next couple of slides. Let's start with content. Step one is definitely about identifying your niche area. You cannot be a jack of all trades if you want to be an influencer. Select an area which plays to your strengths and your passion. That way, you will constantly be adding to your knowledge and you will be looking for newer creative ways for reaching out to your audience. Now, your topic or your area can be anything from travel, lifestyle, fashion, food, beauty, sports, gaming, entertainment, technology, health and fitness. It can be any of these things. And you don't necessarily have to stick to, stick to just these established and uh, fairly well-known niches. You can move into something really obscure as well. For example, vegan travel. Or you can combine some of these topics like um, um, gaming and technology, beauty and lifestyle, travel and food. So these are some of the ways in which you can find your niche area. Step two is, of course, decide on your audience. Determine who is your audience and develop a unique persona for that audience. Today, there are enough and more tools available which will help you to get an, an understanding of the bonds, the needs, the challenges and goals of your ideal follower so that you can use that to help solve and address some of their challenges and it, it will also point you to the right niche area where you should establish yourself as a as an influencer. Promoting your content, plan your channel. It's important to pick the right social platform where audience with interests that align with your areas of interest are present and are willing to engage with you. So question, which are the biggest social media networks for influencers? Okay, right. So two of the most prominent social networks where influencers are really thriving today are, of course, Instagram and LinkedIn, right? However, you need to choose a platform based on where your ideal audience is. Your ideal audience may not be spending most of their time on LinkedIn or Insta. They might be spending it on YouTube. So YouTube is what you should be choosing. Let's look at sharing content, okay? Now your area of interest and your audience profile will influence your content plan. If you want to quickly grow your following and establish yourself as a social media influencer, you need to make sure that you choose the right social media channel based on your niche and ideal audience. For example, although LinkedIn is gaining more traction with lifestyle content, influencers can succeed on this platform when they focus on career or academic tips or job related content. While LinkedIn does offer video posting options, influencers can also embrace text more heavily on this platform by publishing either blog style posts or regular text posts. Now, what I would suggest is stick to using two or three networks. Otherwise, you will be spreading yourself too thin and you will find it difficult to build your credibility and your following. Follow the 80-20 rule, spend 80% of your time in marketing your content and 20% in creating it. Push your content on various social media platforms first and encourage your followers to share it in their network and spread the news. Now, content can be a mix of text, images, videos, infographics, tutorials, etc. You can use a combination of curated content where you can find the best content available on the uh, platform or on the internet and share it with your followers. And of course, you need to do the attribution from wherever you have sourced that. You can also create your own educational and informative content. And also you can add a few posts about yourself. So that could be behind the scene post, or it could be a bit about what you did on Saturday kind of a thing which basically helps in building up relationship and making it look as if, no, you're not into it just like another corporate brand. 
you should also check out for some of the other best practices. This include looking out for the best days and times when to distribute content for each of the most popular social media networks. Preferably stick to one theme per social media channel. More importantly, it helps you to categorize the different types of content you publish and helps you keep organized. Customize your messages. If your if your channels are Instagram and YouTube, make sure that they are distinct. There is a certain amount of difference between them. Probably you can use a short video format on Insta and a longer duration format on YouTube so that if there is somebody who is common to both the channels feels it convenient, feels it good, feels it um, useful in coming to both these profiles and checking out your content. Make sure to optimize posts for mobile. This is very important because most of us access our social media profiles on mobile and um, it's extremely critical right now. Question. So how many hours do you spend on the mobile? On a day, on an average, how many hours do you spend on the mobile? OK, here's some trivia. An average person spends over three hours on his or her device. And 80% of it is actually spent on social media. So you have seen it, how important it is to reach the watering hole. So the watering hole is basically where your customers, your consumers uh, congregate. So you need to reach your customers or, or your consumers or your prospective consumers where they like to be at. And yes, of course, maintain your content. So these are the three R's of influencer marketing, the reach, the repetition and the reaction. All right, so reach is about the number of people. So it could be the number of people who are following you. Or it could be the number of people your content reached. Repetition is the act of creating content regularly so that you are consistent in your content post on a particular platform. For example, if you're a vegan advocate, you can start a series for vegans combine it with travel and tourism and you need to constantly keep posting about places to travel, description of food to eat, local cuisine, local culture, etc. Reaction, reaction is, of course, the engagement that you have with your audience. Now, bigger isn't always better. A huge follower count is meaningless if those followers aren't interested in what you have got to say. And a smaller follower count can be very powerful if it is a niche area. Niche influencers can have very dedicated and engaged followers. OK, it has been found that the engagement rates are often higher for micro influencers and for nano influencers. So basically they have fewer followers, but their words are, you know, as good as gold for their fans or followers. Research on existing influencers. It helps you to understand the areas of improvement. It also helps you in finding key areas that are not covered by influencers and hence what you can work on. So you should not only see the topics that the influencers have managed. You should also look out for where they are sharing these pieces of content. So it basically shows you the social media channel that you should be focusing on and probably use it for growing your following. The following and the follower ratio. OK, so try keeping your following below your follower count, particularly if you're working with brands that matter a lot. In case if these numbers, the number of your following somebody is much higher, brands will really question your credibility as an influencer. But you, you should always follow accounts of uh, fellow influencers who inspire you, add value to you in terms of exploring content, in terms of exploring ideas, etc. And uh, grow your network. While you're still in the process of establishing your credibility and your expertise as a social media influencer, you will need to actively grow your follower base. One of the most effective ways of doing this is through blogging. Even though more internet users are turning to social media networks for information, the fact remains that you don't entirely own your space there. One misstep and you can easily have your account taken down. 
look at what has happened to TikTok. People just lost the, all their content and followers, right? Blogging can also help you kickstart your follower base by helping you get discovered. By including social media sharing buttons on each of your posts, your visitors can share your content with their respective networks, of course. And remember to engage with your followers. When your followers leave a question or comment on your post, take the time to acknowledge and respond to them. That can make them feel like you know they are valued and you sincerely want to associate with them. And it, it brings a sense of loyalty amongst your followers. Now, of course, not all comments and questions will be positive. As an influencer, expect that. And you will have your fair share of negative comments and criticisms. Make it a point to keep your cool and address them professionally. All right. Hashtags. Now, Instagram hashtags can make or break your Instagram strategy. Okay. Use them correctly and you will get your posts seen by more people who are likely to be interested in your products or your brand. But use the wrong one and you can actually damage from annoying potential followers to getting penalized by Instagram's algorithm. Use hashtag to ensure your content is discovered by the interested audience. Don't use hashtag which you feel can work. Back it up with data. There are many tools available, some free, some paid, which will help you to generate the trending hashtags. So there is Hootsuite, there is Sprout Social, etc., which will help you to identify the um, uh, trending hashtags, which will analyze your pages, and you can use that data to decide on your hashtags. And it's not just the trending hashtags that you can work on. You can also look at the related hashtags. So people can also choose to follow hashtags. You might be already knowing that, which means they could see your content or your post in their feed, even if they don't really follow you yet. OK, now um, let's look at some of the types of hashtags that's available. So it can be about product or service like, you know, hashtag handbag or hashtag chocolate bar etc there can also be niche hashtags now these get a little bit more specific showing where you fit in the con uh, in the context of your industry like travel blogger food blogger vegan baker etc now industry in instagram community hashtags these are basically uh, there are communities which exist on instagram and these hashtags can help you find and join them. So think of uh, hashtags like um, gardeners of Instagram, artists of Instagram, painters of Instagram, etc. There can also be special event or seasonal hashtags, right? You can also use location hashtags. So even if you geotag your Instagram post, it can still be a good idea to include a hashtag that refers to your location. For example, uh, Delhi Dabas or uh, Vancouver craft beer or um, Mumbai Eats, etc. Daily hashtags are other way of putting it up. Monday blues, Monday morning blues. Yes, Sunday fun day is very popular. Absolutely. OK. There can also be relevant phrase hashtags. These hashtags combine elements of product hashtags. Um, niche hashtags, community hashtags. So this would include hashtags like I am a writer. She who wanders. Solo women bikers. Some of these are hashtags which are um, phrase hashtags, what we call as phrase hashtags. There's also acronym hashtags. Can you think of an acronym hashtag which is popular with you? Yes, there is TBT, the throwback Thursday, or there is FBF, the flashback Friday. And you all know about YOLO. Yes, everybody knows about YOLO. You only live once. And there's also quite a bit of OOTD that I see at times, which is the outfit of the day kind of a hashtag. Many people also use emoji hashtags, like, you know, hashtag a couple of question marks kind of a thing. So the question now is how many hashtags can you use on Insta? You can use up to 30, but it's not really recommended to use so many of it. 
you can use up to 30 hashtags on a regular post and maybe up to 10 on a story if you add more your comment or your caption will not get posted and it's better to avoid even 30 is not recommended maybe about 5 to 10 is what would be recommended a word of caution or rather words of caution avoid banned hashtags okay using banned hashtags can cause a drop in engagement as your use of legitimate hashtags might also become affected because you will be dropped in the algorithm you'll be penalized in the algorithm right avoid hashtags that are shamelessly uh, soliciting likes and followers like for example uh, like for like follow for follow follow me like me that kind of hashtags avoid them and third one is of course do not use irrelevant or repetitive hashtags so if you use the same set of hashtags for every post you are likely to get penalized by the algorithm that insta uses now a couple of other things that you should keep in mind evaluate your progress most social media channels give you insights and analytics to monitor your progress things like some give demographics some give reach some give engagement rate that will help you to estimate how quickly you are growing and how, how what is the kind of scale that you can achieve it also tells you what kind of content actually brings in the largest amount of engagement and hence what you should do more kind of a thing and also if you're planning to collaborate with brands brands definitely look for data and, uh, read data and draw insights out of it their algorithms as it comes to postings particularly sponsored postings etc your base and you can get a instant now if there is one thing that surpass and deliver quality yeah they will stop following you as i mentioned this hootsuit there is sprout social etc which will enable you to schedule your post without manually having to do it every day so these are some of the tips for being an influencer one way is definitely a particular apparel or when they are giving a lifestyle tip. so have noticed if you're on insta you would have noticed that lots of photographers collaborate with Na national geographic with their work good amount of cross so explore programs like uh, amazon's influencer program uh, which is an extension of their existing online associates program for social media influencers so basically you will have a page on the amazon site and you can promote some of the products etc it's easier to promote your business online groceries think domain so this video will guide your digital marketer record and managing marketing campaigns that promote your qualify and evaluate new digital and so many other things to better optimize marketing campaigns so in worldwide jobs in the very first quarter of 2019 and also the jobs in the year 2019 are willing to offer a high salary to get a certified candidate thing and then boom it's highly rewarding for you during this hiring process so please take up digital marketing because so being more entities join the online bandwagon for a wider market reach the job opportunities in the field of digital marketing is ever growing unlike other sectors of employment this ability to turn a blind eye like i mentioned people actually prefer vacation course marketing right so 60% of professionals consider that certification led them to get a new job. Hence, it's ideal to have a digital marketing cert and also have a grasp over the marketing tools and techniques of the expert. So this helps you get in touch with the industry experts. Also get recognized in the field of digital marketing. So as a digital marketer, you'll be having a lot of response you need to be taking up. So why exactly do you need a career in the field of digital marketing? Why not other field? Why not buy big data? Why not you manage your work? Now, why do low cost invest like the most important part of having a career in the field of digital marketing? It is that field which has plenty of room for tech and creative thinking, creative of customizing your strategy, right? So here are a few reasons why you should shift your focus towards digital marketing right now. So firstly, I would say digital marketing is more to worry about the money market right now because audience play a vital role in shaping your business. So having a good interaction or have will definitely marketing also provides a better ROI for your marketing investments. What is this ROI? Why is it used? So ROI is on investment. This is someone a marketing plan. Don't get a better ROI. 
but when you talk about digital mark which in turn increases the productivity of your company and revenues so this is like a change and then a new for your company quite a lot of money so these people actually make a lot of and also is why you should definitely digital marketing also talk right and fulfilling the needs of the customer on the internet so people and the marketers are really going bonkers over this in order to transform which focuses on trying of basic requirement are not only really available in metro cities everything is going to be digital these days so if we talk about digital marketing career in india it's going to be a hit and also another digital marketing you know, their product are given more importance here so this graph clearly shows everything in detail people using internet between 2015 to 2020 259 million which goes up to 331 million in 2017 and also it is predicted that the internet users across the globe would be doubled by 2022 this is because the rate in which the country is growing in terms of even to a recent report it is said that the digital economy is growing 10 times faster than the traditional economy and the firms that engage in online trading are twice as likely to be creating jobs as firms that they aren't this is exactly why you need to cope up with the current technology trends and also choose digital marketing to have a better future in this field so now that you've understood why should you take up digital marketing as your career option now talking about the certification you should consider to bag yourself a promising job under this digital marketing umbrella we have google adwords certification social media certification google analytics certification and content marketing certification so these are the few certified courses that you should take up to become a digital marketer and edureka's post graduate program covers everything from scratch So all these certified courses fall under this expertly curated program. You'll be learning about content marketing, social media marketing, email marketing, mobile marketing, SEO and digital campaigns. Also at the end of each module, you have assignments that will increase your chances of being practical and will help you get hired. Next up we'll see what are the skills that are required in order to become a successful digital marketer. So here are the top skills that are required in order to become a successful digital marketer. So the first and the major skill that you need to possess is you have to be good with the digital marketing channels like SEO that is search engine optimization, email marketing, social media marketing and so many other channels. So you need to be very familiar with these channels. and also you need to be good at data analytics data analytics refers to the techniques to analyze data and enhance productivity in order to gain business profit so this is also a must known skill guys and you need to have certain knowledge of wordpress also say for example if you're writing a blog so you need to know which platform to go for and in what way you should put across your points So WordPress plays a major role if you want to write a blog of your own. So this will also help your organization if the company is dealing with content marketing or social media marketing. Next up you need to be good with Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is one such tool which helps analyzing the insights of your website. Now say for example if your company is dealing with online certification like Edureka So Google Analytics plays a major role in shaping the business for you guys. So uh, what this Google Analytics tool does is it gives you a proper insight of how many people are landing on your website and what is the traffic that is generated through a particular medium. It can be a blog, a video or any other factor. So it will analyze the aspects of your website. and also it will take a look at the part where you'll also see where you're losing traffic on your website so this particular tool plays a major role in shaping your career in the field of digital marketing now the next one is basic design skills so design skills is must guys in order to generate a website of your own you need to possess some design skills that will eventually help your organization So these are the top skills that you should master in order to become a successful digital marketer. All right. So I think you guys are clear with the skills that are required. So these are not just the only skills that you should master. There are so many other skills in the market right now. But these are the evergreen skills that one should master to build a career in the field of digital marketing. And also you need to know the working of Excel, 
sales skills objective thinking creative thinking and also ability to adapt to any kind of environment so these are a few notable skills that you should possess to become a successful digital marketer now talking about the job role and the scope in the field of digital marketing jobs play a major role when you want to pursue a career in a specific domain digital marketing is one such domain where you can find evergreen job roles so what exactly is the scope for job in this field? Is it easy to get a job or does it require some special skill in order to get a job? Let's have a look. So firstly, let's take a look at the roles and responsibilities of a digital marketer. So the first responsibility as a digital marketer is to be able to create a marketing campaign on your own. And also this might generate leads for your organization. So you need to be well versed with creating a marketing campaign of your own, right? The next one is assist in the formulation of strategies in order to build a long lasting digital connection with the customers. So the ultimatum is connecting with the customers, right? So you have an organization which deals with customer interaction. So the first thing you need to be focusing on is generating a good relationship between them. This plays a major role if you're wanting to build a career in digital marketing. You should also be able to plan and monitor the ongoing progress on social media platforms. Social media platforms is one such way through which you can reach your customers in just a second. So planning and monitoring the way you can handle things on social media is very important. You need to plan accordingly to get more leads from the social media platforms. Always be actively involved in SEO. This SEO is pertained to blog writing. So SEO plays a major role if you're writing a blog. So search engine optimization is something that you will be requiring if you want to write a blog on your own for your organization. So you should be actively involved in writing blogs and creating good content. So this is more important. Okay. So creating good content that will help both customers as well as the business is the main agenda for digital marketing and analyzing the insights of your website using Google Analytics. Like I mentioned, this is one of the skills that is required and also this is a responsibility of a digital marketer help maintain a good relationship with the customer. So this is what people are hired for and this is exactly why you need to be more open to your customers. All right and also have the ability to be more creative and up to date with the latest technology trends. So digital marketing is a growing platform, right? Technology changes also affect the digital marketing platform. So you need to be updated with the latest trends in the market. Currently the digital marketing job field is highly result driven and enhances your knowledge and creative skills. There are many digital marketing job roles, but I've noted down a few of them that will definitely help you out. So the first one that I have on the list is the digital marketing executive. As a digital marketing executive, it is your responsibility to look into online marketing strategies for businesses. You should also be able to plan and execute marketing campaigns and maintain and supply content for a website. Okay, so this is the responsibility or the role of a digital marketing executive in a company. Now the next one is digital marketing manager. The primary role of a digital marketing manager is to brand your product out in the digital space. You are to develop implement and manage marketing campaigns that promote the products and services of your own company. So this digital marketing manager is a key to the success of your organization. Next we have SEO executive. The primary role of an SEO executive or specialist is to rank a website page on the search engine result page. And also they are the major factor which influence the traffic in your website. SEO sector is thriving day by day and the SEO executive job roles are always in demand. So please start applying your resumes right away now. So the next one that I have on the list is a social media marketing expert. So social media marketing experts are responsible for combining marketing and social media management in order to enhance the company's social media presence interaction with target audience promoting the brand's engaging content and expanding the opportunities for increasing the revenue. So the ultimatum is to generate revenue for your organization 
and also create better content for your people or customers. So this is the role of social media marketing expert. So the next one that I have is SEM. So SEM basically stands for search engine marketing. So there is a person who's dedicated towards the search engine marketing is called as a SEM specialist. So this person helps in mainly targeting the number of leads and clicks from a given marketing budget marketing bid keyword research analysis and test ads campaign. So this person helps in following up things. So the next is content marketing manager. So this content marketing manager is responsible for creating valuable content and has the desired skills to market it. Managing blogs, video marketing, marketing campaigns, ebook publications, guest blogging, email communication, and so many other tasks are taken care by the content marketing manager. Me as a person also come under this content marketing team and also we make videos or blogs corresponding to the topics that are given. So this is the role of the digital marketing manager. So these were few notable job roles under the digital marketing umbrella. Now moving ahead to the next topic we have pay scale in India and the US. So first let's take a look at the salary acquired by a digital marketing manager. So this digital marketing salary might vary according to your work profile experience and also the major part your talent. If you have all these three combined, you'll definitely be able to barge in the opportunity. So according to pay scale digital marketing manager in the US makes up to $65,488. So this is the average salary acquired by digital marketing manager. And also in India, the average salary for a digital marketing manager is around 5,15,124 rupees. So this is the mean average salary guys. Now talking about SEO manager. So the salary is divided into the experience level that is first comes the manager. Next comes the SEO manager, content marketing manager, social media manager and so many others. All right. So the next on the list is SEO manager. So the average salary acquired by an SEO manager in the US is around $67,475. And also the salary acquired by an SEO manager in India is around 5 lakhs. So this is the average salary that I'm talking about guys. Imagine about the actual salary you'll be getting. Now the next is social media manager and uh, do note this guys the stats that I'm showing you guys is from pay scale. So this might vary according to your experience level and also the location. So we are mainly focusing on India and the US. The average salary for a social media manager in the US is around forty nine thousand eight hundred and eighty one dollars and in India it's around three point six lakhs. The next on the list is content manager in US you can make up to fifty seven thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars and in India you can make up to five point seven lakhs. So think about the better future and content marketing is actually a booming field. Make a note of this guys. Next we have SEM specialist. So the average salary for an SEM specialist is around forty seven thousand one hundred and eighty six US dollars and in India it's around three point six lakhs. So the first question that I have for you is what is digital marketing? and explain it in simple terms. Digital marketing is all about the tactics for brand marketing via online channels. It includes various techniques like SEO that is search engine optimization, SEM search engine marketing, link building, email marketing, PPC that is pay per click, affiliate marketing and so many others. Now when I say digital marketing what comes to your mind? So this digital marketing it encompasses all marketing efforts that help you in promoting your product or brand using electronic devices or the internet. It leverages online marketing tactics like search engine email marketing social media marketing mobile marketing and so on in order to connect with current and prospective customers. So this was about what is digital marketing. Now moving on. Let's take a look at the next question. So the next question that I have for you is what are the different types of digital marketing? So I've mainly listed out a few of them. So there are six of them in total. First one is search engine optimization or SEO. 
SEO is used for blogs or any articles that you want to write regarding your company or your product. So this basically helps a lot in link building or organic traffic generation. The next one is search engine marketing. SEM is used a lot in terms of optimizing or marketing your content that you create. Search engine marketing is analyzing the search engine, how it works, how Google works, and market accordingly. All right. Now, talking about content marketing, content marketing deals with creating valuable content and creating a blog and guest blogging, and all of it come under content marketing. Now the next one is email marketing. So if you want to be a professional in the field of digital marketing, you should know how email marketing work. Email is one of the oldest and the most used form of communication in the business aspect. So email marketing is another type of digital marketing. So I wouldn't say types. These are also considered as channels. Okay, so these are some mediums or channels through which you can promote your product. Now the next is social media marketing. When I say social media, you think of certain applications that would be used on a day to day life basis, right? So they're namely Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube and so on. So social media marketing plays an important role in enhancing a company's marketing efforts. So know how to promote your product on the social media and the next is e commerce marketing. You can put up your product on the e commerce website and you can get traffic from it. Okay. So these are the different types of digital marketing available. Now the next question is how can you categorize digital marketing? So this digital marketing is mainly classified into two fields that is inbound marketing and outbound marketing. Inbound marketing is also called as a magnetic marketing as it allows the organizations to attract their best prospects and those who are actively looking for something or some solutions online. So inbound marketing helps pulling the interest of the customer and it is written according to the customer needs and natural habitats or some examples to this would be the blogs, social media posts, search influencer marketing, opt in emails and so on. Now talking about outbound marketing, outbound marketing is also referred as the interruption or the push marketing which uses tactics that gets a message to a lot of people in an effort to make a sale. Okay, so this is like you're pushing your content so that people would know about it and people would get to know about your organization as well. And this pushes regardless of the user's interest. You might have come across these ads when you're watching a video online, right? So these just pop up out of nowhere when you don't want to watch it. So these are called as push marketing or outbound marketing. It is written according to the product's need and not as per the customer's need. And some natural habitat or examples to this would be display ads, telemarketer script, magazines, TV ads, and so on. So this was about the categories. Now talking about the next question. According to you, what are the most effective ways to increase traffic onto your website? So here are a few mediums or ways you can say that will help you increasing the traffic onto your website. So the first one would be paid search. So you're going to be paying to your content so that it ranks on the first page. You might have seen these uh, advertisements or uh, posts which rank on the first page of Google like the first link which has AD under it. So these are nothing but the paid ads or the paid search. Now the next would be display advertising and email marketing. Display advertising is something that like I mentioned push marketing and email marketing is also very important guys. This will also eventually help you in getting a lot of traffic onto your website. Send prospective emails to your customers or the viewers who are looking for a solution online. Okay. Now, and content marketing and content optimization. Content marketing, like I mentioned, it is going to help you in creating organic traffic onto your website. So, yeah, content marketing is a must. And you should know how to optimize your content. You should know how SEO plays a major role in optimizing your content. The content that you create must be up to date. It should have interesting facts about any of the topic that you'll be discussing. And guest blogging guest blogging is also important guys. If you want your organization to grow in large scale, you need people who are actually willing to write some interesting blogs regarding your topic or your product. Now seeking referral traffic. This is because of, if you write a blog on any of the ranking keywords, you can either link these blogs to another blog that you'll be writing or you can just promote the same blog in that content. 
you can either leave a link to your existing blog so that you can get more traffic via that channel and target long tail keywords. You should always target long tail keywords guys because these help in ranking the most and it will eventually get more uh, views also. Okay. Now the next question is what is SEO? Explain it in simple terms. SEO is actually a process of optimizing your content technical setup and reach of your website so that your pages appear on the top of the search engine result pages for a specific keyword. So this is a process of increasing the quality of your website traffic guys and uh, major search engines like Yahoo Google binge all have a primary search results right here web pages are displayed and ranked based on what search engine selects as the most relevant in accordance with the context and SEO helps websites achieve a better ranking on the search engine result pages when prospects search for a particular keyword related to your product or service. Eventually this will increase the quality and the quantity of traffic on your website through organic results. Okay, so this was about SEO. Now moving on to the next question. What are the different types of SEO that are frequently used in the market? So we have namely three types of SEO that are used widely. So let's learn about them in detail. Yeah, so the first on the list is a white hat SEO. This is the most popular SEO technique that utilizes methods and techniques to improve search engine rankings of your site, which do not run awful of search engine guidelines. So this follows the search engine guidelines guys. So it actually follows the Google guidelines as well. So white hat SEO uses techniques like high quality content link acquisition website HTML optimization and restructuring your content. With white hat SEO you can expect a long lasting growth in your ranking. So like I mentioned these white hat SEO techniques are used for high quality content. So you will be able to create high quality content using white hat SEO and it strictly follows or it is strictly abided by the guidelines of Google and search engine. Now talking about black hat SEO it exploits the various weakness in the search engine algorithms to get high rankings. The black hat is not in accordance with the SEO guidelines set by the Google search engine or the search engines itself. Some of the black hat SEO techniques are keyword stuffing, link spamming, hidden text, hidden link and so on. So using these techniques you can expect unpredictable quick but short lasting growth in rankings. So this is like white money and black money guys. White money is something which is abided by the rules of the nation or the country. And black money is something which is illegal, but here it is not illegal. It is just stuffing or adding more things so that your page will rank on the first page. Right now talking about gray hat SEO gray hat SEO is neither black nor white. It rather combines both of them. It is a transformation from black hat SEO to white hat SEO and vice versa. Okay, so this was about the sixth question moving on. The next question is explain keywords and digital marketing and how is it important for SEO a keyword is the most significant and fundamental element of the search engine optimization keywords are considered as the core of all your SEO efforts they are crucial for better rankings in the search engine result pages or SERP it is really important to make your website SEO optimized for keywords that are relevant to your business this would help your website's page to rank higher in the search engine result pages, which will eventually make customers or viewers to find your website very easily. Now moving on to the next question we have what are the different areas or key areas where you can use keyword to optimize your site ranking. Okay, this is an important question. You can use keywords to optimize your site ranking by mentioning them or linking them in your website URL website title meta tags web page context body text and headlines if these contain your keywords it is for sure that your keyword is ranking and the entire page is pertain to one keyword if you want to optimize your content SEO is must so by mentioning in all of these I think you don't have to stuff your keyword in between anywhere okay so the next question is what are on page and off page optimization on page basically refers to the factors that you can optimize on your own website to grow traffic. The main components involved in on page optimization are title of the page, meta tag description, 
optimized image with all tags url structure high quality content optimized internal links and so on whereas off page seo is all about your online reputation it includes acquiring backlinks for your page from authority sites in your niche the main components involved in the off page optimization are acquiring backlinks leveraging social interaction with your site promoting your content via social media platforms adding social bookmarking and guest blogging so these are some major differences between on page and off page optimization now moving on to the next question what are some useful tools for digital marketing we have some interesting tools for digital marketing guys so i've noted down a few of them we have so many tools in the market right now which helps in digital marketing so we have something called keyword research or keyword discovery this helps in ranking your keyword or analyzing how to make your keyword rank on the search engine result pages we have rank watch which helps in ranking moz which is also another platform that helps in analyzing the seo alexa ranking google analytics heat maps sem rush ahrefs ad expresso unbounce and so on so these are some interesting tools that help in analyzing your content and help you in promoting a product now moving on to the next question we have explain ppc or pay per click advertising pay per click is also one of the most predominantly used forms of marketing ppc is abbreviated as pay per click which is a model of internet marketing in which advertisers pay a fee each time one of their ads are clicked essentially if i say it is a way of buying visits to your site rather than attempting it to earn it from the visits organically it is also referred to as sponsored result on the search engine result pages ppc ads are visible flexible and effective for many different types of organizations with paid search you can only pay when your ad is clicked these are the ads that are present on top whenever you search for a particular keyword essentially this is also a way of buying visits to your site now search engine advertising is one of the most popular forms of ppc now you must have had this thought when i say ads what kind of ads am i going to see these are nothing but google ads which are formally called as google adwords so pay per click is commonly associated with first tier search engine like google adwords and binge ads okay so this was about ppc or pay per click now moving ahead we'll see what are google adwords and what do you know about them so google adwords is an online advertising service by google to help marketers reach their customers instantly businesses use this service to display ads on google and it is advertising network it is the most famous pay per click advertising system in the entire world adwords allow businesses to set budget for ads and the payments happen when people click on the ads so google adwords service focuses on the keywords that you select so this is about google adwords now moving on explain google adwords remarketing so google adwords remarketing is referred to as targeting marketing strategy that assists the marketers to help reach out people who visited their site previously but did not complete the purchase remarketing helps in targeting the right people at the right time with the right ad It helps increase conversion rates as the past site visitors may already be familiar with your brand and turn into prospective customers very easily. This is how Google AdWords remarketing is used or this is exactly how it plays an important role in digital marketing. Now moving on to the next question, we have named some of the Google AdWords ad extensions. Okay, some of the Google AdWords ad extensions would be call extensions, call out extensions, promote extension structured snippet extension site link affiliate location and app extension so what are these ad extensions ad extensions are extra snippets of relevant information about your business that can be added to your adwords text ads so these can include your business's location phone number business ratings and so on in these there are two categories namely ad extension that is automatic and manual ad extensions now moving on to the next question we have what can be the ideal approach for effective ppc campaign 
So how do you approach or how can you make good use of PPC campaigns? So follow these instructions to have an ideal approach for effective PPC campaigns. Add more PPC keywords to expand your reach. Split ads into smaller segments to have better click through rate. That is CTR. So you can just split some ads into smaller segments. I think people would have watched serials or some series where you'll just get ad in between when you're watching a series, right? So these are nothing but the smaller segment. You can divide it into segments and place it in a way that they can click your content. Now and also review non performing PPC keywords reviewing is important because you wouldn't know what might rank what might click refine landing pages to align with the search queries editing your landing pages at times to make it aligned with search queries is a must. So if somebody is searching for a particular keyword and it is not there in your landing page they would definitely not look for it on or they would not go further with the search right. So refining your landing pages is a must and improve marketing relevancy by adding negative keywords. So why exactly do we need negative keywords? So these negative keywords prevent advertisements from displaying for particular phrases. So this type of keyword prevents your ad from being triggered by a certain word or a phrase, right? Your ads aren't shown to anyone who's searching for that phrase and this is also known as negative match. This is also required for an ideal PPC campaign. Okay, now moving on to the next question. We have explained responsive web design with an example. Okay, responsive web design is an approach that suggests the design and the development that it should respond to the user's behavior and environment based on the screen size, platform, orientation, and so on. It makes web pages perform well on different devices like desktop, mobile, tablet, and so on, and it ensures that the user has great viewing experience no matter what device they are using to access your website. The practice of responsive design consists of a mix of flexible layouts, images, grids, and a little use of CSS media queries. So, this is how you can make a simple web design out of it. Now, talking about the example, you can consider our website that is Edureka. You get a different experience when you're viewing it from your phone or tablet, and you'll be getting a different experience if you're going to be using desktop or laptop, right? So this is something which is required, which is called this responsive web design, that it changes accordingly and the user experience is good, even if they're using different devices or different forms to reach out to your website. Now moving on to the next question. What is the difference between direct marketing and branding? Now, when I say branding, the advertiser has to expose his brand to websites and applications that have a higher audience reach. This is something which is called as praising your own brand or keeping up your brand's name high, right? Now, in case of direct marketing, the advertiser is interested mostly in establishing communication with his target audience through different mediums. And even here, there is a little bit of branding which happens, but still it is called as direct marketing because you're going to be focusing only on the communication with the prospect. So the basic difference between them is that branding is done to build awareness about your product or your company, whereas direct marketing helps companies to reach out to their customers directly. Now moving on to the next question. What is the limitations of online marketing? So internet has its own limitations, right? And also every good thing should have some limitations so that it could catch hold of it and get back on track. So what are the limitations of online marketing? Since online marketing is a platform where everybody is using and it is also so easy to use. We have intense competition in the market as it is easily accessible and cost effective. It has become a preferred method for most of the brands. Therefore it has an uphill task to get noticed amongst the intense competition. It is also overwhelming at times. There is so much information and data and an onslaught of tools that it's easy to get overwhelmed and get confused. It takes a lot of patience and practice and experience to get your head around it all the time to get your head around all of it. And also analytics is only as good as its user. I mean to say that analytics depends completely on the user. There is analytics for everything, but 
you can't do anything with plain data unless you know how to read it and make use of it. It is becoming misleading sometimes and you can get stuck in chasing vain metrics and burning cash at the wrong places. So these are some notable limitations of online marketing. Now the next question is list some of the most popular PPC tools. We have SEM rush optimizely unbounce keyword planner AdWords editor and AdWords wrapper. So these are some notable tools for PPC marketing. Now the next question is how can you use social media for marketing? Any idea guys how can you use social media? Social media marketing involves creating and sharing content on the social media channels to achieve your marketing and branding goals. It includes different activities like posting images, videos and other content that drives audience engagement. And social media marketing can also help you by increasing website traffic, building conversations, increasing brand awareness and improving communication and interaction with the target audience. So this is exactly how you can use social media for marketing. Now moving on to the next part of the session that is executive level interview questions. So here the first question is what do you know about email marketing? Email marketing is a highly effective digital marketing strategy of sending emails to target leads and customers. Effective marketing emails converts leads into customers and turn one time buyers into loyal fans to your website. Email marketing is one of the oldest and the most professional way to communicate with your clients and prospects. It is also the most direct and effective way of connecting with your leads, nurturing them and turning them into customers consistently winning out over all the other marketing channels. So the next question is what is the difference between SEO and SEM? SEO enables your website to appear in the search engine result pages while the SEM is search engine marketing which helps in purchasing a space in search engine result pages. So this is some important difference between SEO and SEM search engine result pages helps in enabling your website to appear on the result pages whereas SEM is a search engine marketing. It helps you in purchasing a search engine result page. OK, so you can buy the entire page using SEM. All right. Now moving on to the next question we have to we'll talk about content marketing. So what is content marketing? Content marketing is a strategic approach focused on creating and distributing relevant and consistent content in order to attract and retain a clearly defined audience and drive profitable customer action. The key reasons for enterprises to use content marketing are increased number of sales, the cost you have saved throughout and better customers who have more loyalty. So these are some major reasons why content marketing is still booming in the recent days. Now moving on to the next question. Why is online marketing preferred more over offline marketing? We have some major reasons over here guys. People do not use offline marketing much these days. Everything is online. You need something you need to buy food even that you can order online. If you want to buy something you have clothes accessories and so many things which you get online. Right, because you can tap a larger audience and expand geographically very easily. Information is immediately available online, so you don't have to just wait for it, wait for another person to come and inform you about the product. Interaction with the customer is also made very easy and you can get in touch very fast. And also, another added advantage of online marketing is better tracking. You can track where your product is, when it is arriving, what is the cost, all of it, you can get it online. So these are some major reasons why online marketing is preferred over offline marketing. Now moving on to the next question. What are the five D's of digital marketing? The five D's in digital marketing define the opportunities for customers or consumers to interact with brand and for business to reach out to their audience in different ways. So the first D is digital devices. Your audience experiences your brand as they interact with the websites through digital devices including mobile phones, desktop, tablet, gaming devices and so on. The next D is a digital platform. Most interaction on digital devices is through browser or applications from the major platforms like Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn and so on. The next D is the digital media. 
many different owned paid and earned communication channels try to reach and engage with your audience through the digital media. The next D is the digital data. The insights that the businesses collect about their audience and their interaction with the business is called or termed as digital data. The next D is the digital technology. Businesses used to create interactive experiences from websites and applications to in-store email campaigns and so on. Okay, so these are the five D's of digital marketing. Now the next is what is the role of digital marketing for your business? Why do you think you need digital marketing? Having a digital marketing strategy for your business lets you be a dynamic part of the unavoidable and lucrative online marketing strategy. So in order to understand what is the role of digital marketing, you need to have great exposure. Digital marketing gives you a fair chance to all businesses that prefer online branding and advertising and also it will help you in generating traffic. Digital marketing allows you to see the exact number of people who viewed your website's page in real time by using digital analytics software. Content performance and lead generation also plays an important role. With digital marketing, you can measure how many people exactly viewed your page, where it's hosted, and you can also collect some contact details of the person who downloaded it using forms. Now attribute modeling attribute modeling or attribution modeling is an effective strategy for digital marketing that allows you to trace all your sales back to a customer's first digital touch point with your business. It helps you identify the trends in which people research and buy your products which help you make informed decisions about what parts of your digital marketing strategy deserves attention. Okay. So this is exactly why digital marketing is required and moving on to the next question. What are the different types or ways to approach SEO to generate traffic to your website? Okay, so these are some techniques which are used to generate more traffic to your website. So these are sometimes also referred to as types of SEO. So it is not types. It is a different approach or techniques to generate more traffic. We have something called on page optimization or on page SEO. So it focuses only on creating content that exists on the page of the website. By researching keywords for their search volume and intent, you can answer questions for readers and rank higher on the search engine result pages to those questions produced. Now, talking about off page SEO, this focuses on all the activities that take place off the page when looking to optimize your website. What are these activities that are not on page but affect your ranking? The answer is the backlinks. The number of publishers that link to you and the relative authority of the publishers affect how you rank for specific keywords. You can earn the backlinks by networking with other publishers, writing guest posts on their websites, and generating external attention. Now, the next one is technical SEO. This focuses on the back end of your website. We have something called the image compression, CSS file optimization, structured data. These are some different forms of technical SEO that can increase your website's loading speed. That is an important ranking factor for the search engines. Now, moving on to the next question What is AMP? AMP is a web component framework which helps in creating a user first websites, emails, ad stories, and so on. It is also short for accelerated mobile pages. It is a project from Twitter and Google to make fast mobile pages. AMP is an open source library that helps create a lightweight and fast loading web page. It also enables marketers and publishers to create mobile friendly web pages, which can be supported at different platforms and is compatible with all the types of browsers. The next question is. What are the four C's of digital marketing? We have four C's like we have four D's of digital marketing. We have something called four C's of digital marketing. That is nothing but customer content context and conversion. Customer is someone who sees the message or views the message. Content is the message that the customer sees. Whereas context is something why the customer needs to see the message and conversion is the communication between you and the customer. Moving on to the next question we have. What are the three ingredients of digital marketing? 
Okay, so the three main factors why digital marketing is required is to generate traffic on your website and also know the insights about your website, how the analytics is, how many people are viewing to your web page and so on. So these come under the insights and finally the sales. How can you sell your product to a customer? So these are some three major ingredients of digital marketing. Now moving on to the next question. How can you drive a digital traffic to your website immediately? Leveraging social media with posts that link back to your site is one key way to funnel traffic to your website within shorter time frame. Also posts that include promotions giveaways contests and other engaging and time sensitive material can be more effective. In addition to this generating leads through engagement and online public relations such as answering queries where to function as a subject expert or writing a press release for online distribution. These are some strong tactics for quickly amassing traffic. Okay, now the next is what is conversion optimization? Conversion optimization is a practice of determining how a website can increase the ratio of visitors to the actual customers. A conversion is a site visitor who has taken a desired action rather than simply viewing content and leaving it. One way to optimize conversion is to conduct a B testing. This runs two web pages with altered designs or content to see which is more conversions. Now the next question is why should you use YouTube for digital marketing with YouTube? You can present a better picture of the brand by creating interesting and long videos which can help boost SEO traffic expand your social reach create brand awareness and also improve the ROI. You'll be paid more if you're getting more views on YouTube. So yeah, I think people already know that. So YouTube is also another major factor or the major revenue generation for people. Now the next question is how do I measure the ROI when I say YouTube gives you a lot of a better ROI. What do you mean or how can you measure this ROI ROI is nothing but written of investment. So to calculate the ROI of a marketing campaign integrated into the overall business line calculation. Take the sales growth from the product line and subtract the marketing cost and divide the marketing cost and there you'll have your ROI. So you'll be having a better ROI if you're going to be using YouTube as your marketing platform. Now the next question is what are the webmaster tools. Google Webmaster tool is basically a collection of web utilities that help website owners ensure that their site is Google friendly. These tools have many applications like getting data about incoming search traffic. You can also view crawling and viewing reports using these Webmaster tools. Now moving on to the next question we have differentiate AdWords and AdSense. AdWords enables businesses to advertise on Google's network and AdSense enables publishers to reserve space for AdWords placement on your website. Both these AdWords and AdSense work together to complete Google's advertising network. That is website owners to put up a space for Google's ads and businesses set budget to display ads on advertising networks that is AdWords. So this is some a major difference between AdWords and the AdSense. Now the next question is define your journey as an online shopper. Have you ever shopped online? The answer would be yes. Of course people would eventually try to shop something online, right? How should this user experience be? How should a user journey be when you're shopping online? Awareness the first considerate part or point would be awareness when consumers discover your brand. So you're there aware of your brand and the next one would be consideration. So the potential customers search to check if you offer the product that they need and the next would be the preference online shoppers establish a preference in terms of which website they want to purchase it from and based on their research they're going to be looking for that particular store or shop. Now the next one would be the purchase customer makes a decision of purchasing the product. So this is how the user journey of an online shopper is. Now the next question is do you think digital marketing will replace traditional marketing practices in the near future? This question would reveal the level of your professional knowledge guys. So hence build your answer with personal experiences. Do not just go with what you've heard. One thing that can be safely said is this that 
it is unlikely that digital marketing will completely replace traditional marketing in the near future rather marketers are integrating both the platforms to optimize their plans for optimum roi Instead of replacing each other, both traditional and digital marketing are becoming complementary to each other. So this is one safe answer which you can give. All right. And the next question is explain the process of Facebook marketing. For Facebook, sharing valuable content that connects with potential customers is your most important play. You can create a Facebook marketing plan by defining your audience, setting goals, creating a business page on Facebook posting interesting content and incorporating Facebook ads. Facebook ads also play an important role guys. Now the next question that I have on the list for executive level interview questions would be how do you set up track and analyze whether a marketing campaign you conducted was a success. Here you can discuss about the campaigns driving goals which can vary from enhancing brand awareness lead generation or boosting up social media followers. You need to know about tracking the campaigns via Google Analytics and other monitoring tools for staying updated with the campaign progress. It is also essential that you mention your visions upon which you can act on. So with this we come to the end of this executive level interview questions. Now moving ahead. We'll see what are the managerial level interview questions that we have. So what is your approach to structuring the marketing budget? So this is the first question that I have on the list for marketing level interview questions. There are critical keys to plan and implement a marketing budget. So the first thing you should do is calculate the marketing budget and align your marketing goals with your company's strategic goals and then identify the marketing budget to develop detailed marketing plan that supports your strategy. After you have identified your marketing budget allocate your marketing budget dollars and implement the marketing budget plan. So this is how you can approach your structuring of marketing budget. Now the next one is what's the strategy that you're following to rank a keyword. How do you make a keyword rank ranking for a keyword is a repeatable process and you won't get results that you want 100% of the time especially if your keyword that you're trying to rank is a popular one but content marketing and SEO practices like keyword research checking out for competition conceptualizing the content optimizing your keyword can help you with rankings. Okay, so this is a strategy that we follow. Now the next question is what are the ways to measure SEM efforts that are successful? So if your aim is to spread awareness then tracking clicks and impressions on paid and organic search listing are possible. But if the objective is to quantify the brand performance then measuring it through conversion rate is a must. So in order to generate qualified leads it is better to track emails and queries or online registrations. So this is how you can measure the SEM efforts that are successful. Now moving on to the next question we have how are you going to drag the attention of more potential buyers for the product or services that are offered by businesses via social media channels. Okay so basically how can you attract viewers using social media attention equals innovative content. If you produce good content and display it correctly to the right place at the right time it will definitely give you the proper output. A few ways to engage your customers through social media are crafting catchy headlines posting quality visual media hosting contests ensuring that your post has good content focusing on the social presence responding to comments in a timely manner. Okay so doing these you can attain or you can drag more attention to your product or your website. Now the next question is can you reduce paid media campaign cost without losing traffic when you answer this question they will get to know that you can make a big difference in the field of digital marketing. They don't expect you to answer this question in detail guys but you must be very crisp just research the organization's current objective activity and just think deeper about the three to four changes that you can bring to the company for instant success. Always outline the points that you get and mention them with more ideas in order to eat better ROI or conversion. And the next question is what are some common social media mistakes that business make? One of the worst mistakes that you could make is the inconsistency. Only posting sporadically and not responding when customers or consumers reach out to you to engage. Another biggie is using social media as a place to announce your own content and nothing more. 
without ever engaging in discussions or adding comments to your post that makes your audience want to click or like or share. So be indulged and be more open in terms of social media because it is a platform where you can gain more traffic and more attention from the users. So the next one is how do you stay updated with the latest marketing trends? Since digital marketing is a dynamic field, it is important to stay updated with the blogs, books, podcasts, webinars and so on and many more for the go. Some of the most popular resources to stay updated on the marketing platforms are websites like Mashable, Wordstream Blog, Social Media Examiner and so on. Okay, so the uh, using these you can actually keep updated with the digital marketing trends. Now moving on to the next question. How do you decrease the loading time of a website? So to decrease the loading time of your website, you can use external style sheets. You can also consider using fewer images and optimize images to reduce the file size without affecting the quality of the image. And also you can consider using uh, CSS sprites to reduce the HTTP request. So this is how you can decrease the loading time of your website. Now moving on to the next question. How much time should social media marketing take? Timing is everything in social media marketing. So the good news is using social media. You will have the opportunity to reach your specific audience in time. But even though there are many tools that you can use to schedule and automate posts to save some time. You'll also want to keep a track of the activity on your social media accounts throughout the day so that you can provide timely responses to your audience questions and comments between strategizing creating and posting content and images responding to your audience and checking analytics social media is done right and it can be a full time job and the last question would be where do you see yourself five years down the line in the field of digital marketing. So you should be very thoughtful in this case. You should know what your future is going to be and you should know how you're going to be analyzing yourself in the field of digital marketing and you should know how you can actually expertise or you can prove it to them that you will not be someone who is looking only for money. You will also want to show them that you can see yourself as a successful digital marketer and make them believe that you are totally into this job. So with this we come to the end. Thank you for watching this video. Happy learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.